Sun page, yeah. and we found both iron and brass. Mm -hmm. So, like the metallurgical uh, uh, mineralogical diversity. Is, yeah. I, I'm actually really curious to know if it's what we see as an outlier and she's breaking down uh, supplies of tin at the end, or if, uh, like in other words, supply-driven innovation, or if there's just a lot more variance in what they're making and we don't know. Yeah, I mean, like, in too, we have a dagger of the Yeah. <laughs> Can I tell you a story about that? Of course. <laughs> I, uh, about 2014, I was with a German scientist who's going to measure that. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked about it. He said, I think it's meteoric iron. So I told him, here's the cal I built the calibration form, we measured it, we got the nickel and the cobalt. And then I'm like, we need to publish Can we publish it? He's like, yeah, I'm going to do a little more work. I'm going to do it. So we keep doing it, keep doing it. And after about a year and a half of email, I'm like, we need to do this. Yeah. And then he says, just turn on CNN. Mm -hmm. And the team beat us. Oh, damn it. <laughs> broke my heart. <laughs> like, that was the first time I'm like, ooh. Yeah. And what's worse is it was a competitor, the broker, but I think I told, I, I told, I gave this example of Meteoric Iron too. I'm worried that I oh, yeah. gave away the goes. <laughs> and what happened is, is they didn't get the permit to measure it. They had an on contact instrument, so they just walked by and yeah. zipped it um, without the permit. So, this poor German scientist. They were able to get away with that. Yeah, I mean, what are they going to do? Well, like, the Egyptian government is threatening. They might be, this guy might be sanctioned from working again. He yeah. works for a company. He doesn't yeah. do it. Right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that broke my heart. Anyway, but um, let me see. What was I doing? Um, I need to open up broker instrument tools. First, I need to go to Windows. But yeah, anyway, we're just going to do this uh, by the book. Uh, what I'll do is I'm going to backtrack and discuss this principle a little bit more so we can review where we're at for the purposes of the video. Yeah. yeah. Because um, I think this point is going to be pretty crucial. So let's we're discussing fundamental parameters. We're discussing fundamental parameters. So let's Which start. Is actually, a fundamental parameter is an equation. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, I mean, it's, it's, it's marketing, right? But anyway, let's look at here. So here's heliocentric, here's geocentric. Which of these, again, is the best predictor for where the planets are moving? Both. Both. They're equally good, right? Equally good. Which one is an accurate representation of reality? This one. And then which one of these is generalizable? If I go to a new solar system in Andromeda, which one of these models can I use to predict those planets? This one, right? Exactly, so to the point. So the point here is, is that prediction is not the standard for accuracy. In other words, like physical observations. And by the way, as an aside, could I quantitatively determine which of these is the best, most accurate? Or do I need qualitative data, like observing the planets? I need qualitative. Yeah. So here's the key thing, right? We in archaeology worship quantitative a bit too much, I think, and we forget how important qualitative is. The, the, the difference, do you know what is the difference between quantitative and qualitative analysis? Like, what is the fundamental difference? Well, one you can create predictions on, and one one is just the description. One, one is just the description. That's a phenomenon. That's an excellent one. I'm thinking of it even more. So let me, let me put it this way: What is the color of this unit right here? What color is that? Right, we're going to look very closely. Did you see it turn red or orange? No. <laughs> what is the uncertainty of green? Qualitative doesn't have that. Now, if I had a colorometer, you can download an app for your phone that'll do this. Can I measure and then change the light source and see flickers of green? Yes, that would be a quantitative measure. If we break down what Lucas is saying even more simply, it's this. The difference between qualitative and quantitative is the ability to demonstrate uncertainty. The qualitative is an absolute measure. The quantitative has uncertainty. With uncertainty, I can make a prediction. I can even put a confidence band on that prediction. With qualitative, it stays a description because without that uncertainty, I don't have additional information to build a model on. With the, with the, with the universe, you had people arguing this, people arguing this. It was Galileo's ability to observe rotation around Jupiter with those three moons that demonstrated the principles of the heliocentric thing. He didn't have to quantitatively model the movement of those moons to disprove this. He could <coughs> demonstrate that the principle of a large object in the center and everything moving around it was observed. And once it was qualitatively observed, this guy won. Um, and Galileo paid a price for that, but, um, but in general, that is the crux of it, right? Um, so, and so while we celebrate Galileo as the triumph of empiricism over authoritarianism, right? And I don't mean authoritarianism in the like, you know, uh, Recep Erdogan type style <laughs> governing of Turkey. I mean authoritarianism in the so and so said this, this is the law, right? This is how it works. An example of this, I was in uh, West Virginia 
and we had a geology professor come in, one of those older guys, previous generation thing, and I'm measuring, he gives me a sample to measure, and I measure it with the tracer, and I get this, like, and it says this is 9% aluminum, and he goes, that, that can't be, and I said, why? He's like, this is granite, granite doesn't have that much aluminum, like, and I'm like, well, I mean, here's yeah. a spectrum peak right here, like, you can see that, and he's like, something's wrong with your instrument calibrations, and I said, I'm not even giving you a calibration, you can see the peak. And he said, I sent this to the most authoritative lab in geology, mm -hmm. and I've sent everything, and they've never been wrong. And they said it's only 2% aluminum. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know what to tell you. Again. Like, this is what it is. After he leaves, he's kind of angry. One of my friends comes over and says, it's a piece of feldspar. Like, that's, <laughs> that happens all the time. Um, but anyway, but, but the core point is, is I always argue from a point of empiricism. I can see, I can measure, whether it's a qualitative or a quantitative measure, I can see how much aluminum is here. And his argument was from authority, right? This is this class of material, it should not have this. That's the difference, right? What Galileo did was demonstrate empiricism. The reason I bring this up is Galileo demonstrated empiricism, not with quantitative data, but with qualitative data. So we shouldn't, so in archaeology, we conflate empiricism with quantitative research. It is not, it is a combination of the two. So, in any case, the idea behind fundamental parameters is that using precise physics, such as here, I can model what is in that sample. So if I know the entry angle of the sample, if I know the fluorescence efficiency, the relative measurement depth, if I understand the detector chip's thickness and how that can affect attenuation, if I understand every physical variable that influences the spectrum, then I can back calculate and estimate what percent is in here. Now there's multiple algorithms, and by the way, just FYI, if you see multiple algorithms, it's sometimes a cue that things are not working out as they should, and people are trying to improve it. But, that's the idea here, is everyone's trying to help you. I like how this guy calls it the fundamental fundamental parameters algorithm, but um, that is the key. They're trying to figure out that aspect. So to see what's happening on the unit itself, let's see if we can't connect here, especially now the video is rolling. Mm, oh, there it is. So I'm going to use what is actually a uh, fundamental parameters calibration of this unit. Because again, this is, uh, this is, this is originally an industrial unit. So when you said it was a piece of feldspar, it's because you happen to be no. pointing at. Well, no, we got to point it out. Feldspar is in granite all the time. It, yeah. So you've so got these. Song, yeah. yeah. So you said if you ground it and you sent a small mm -hmm. portion of your rock off to the lab to take care of, and that lab didn't have granite, and then you pulverized the whole thing, and that had feldspar, mm -hmm. that would explain, right? Like, there's a simple reason for why he would have been wrong. Because right. um, there's a lot of quartz. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The key is this is reasoning was that, you know, with, didn't account for, didn't allow for any empirical data to influence, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, what I'm going to use here is I'm going to use precious metals, which is a fundamental parameters calibration. Now, when Brooker makes one of these, it's typically a mixture of empirical and fundamental. In other words, they use real standards, but the majority of the, but those are designed to sort of discipline fundamental parameters. So I'm going to come over here. And we're going to see what's in this guy. There we go. So this thing, it is 75% copper, 24% zinc with a little bit of lead. Does that make sense? What, that, what would this object be if that's true? Just a brass. Mm -hmm. This is a perfectly normal alloy. Um, it doesn't have a match in the, in the library because it can cross-reference, but how much, do these add up to 100? Mm -hmm. Just about. This is probably an accurate result. And it's using fundamental parameters, right? It's using that geocentric model, right? So, not too bad. Where's that obsidian, by the way? We'll see. I'm actually curious if this is going to be disciplined or not. Alright, let's see. By the way, the results are here, it's just the Wi Fi that's slow. So, 25% iron, 8% zirconium, 16% ruthenium, and 15% rhodium. Is that accurate for this piece of obsidian? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So can anyone tell me what's happening? Why, why, why does the fundamental parameters algorithm identify what's in this guy? What's up? Well, what, what's most, so let's think about it this way. This guy, do you guys remember what this was made of? Mostly copper. Mostly copper, some zinc. Now, does copper fluoresce in the spectrum? Yeah. Does zinc fluoresce in the spectrum? And does lead? So everything I have to work my fundamental parameters shows up. What is most of this made of? Silica or oxygen. Oxygen. Does oxygen show up in the spectrum? No. So how, so it's missing the most common element. Mm -hmm. So then what does the fundamental parameters do? It tries to add up to 100% mm -hmm. with all the stuff it can see. Mm -hmm. And it blows up. That's dangerous. Oh yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> so the, the soils move would also be way off. And do you have something I mean, So here? here's the thing, right? Brooker can take soils. It can tell it to fill in the oxides, right? You've seen this before. Do you does this have a soils mode? I'm actually really curious. So you know, press, uh, soil. Let's try it. Let's see. I've never used this before. Still says precious metals on top. Don't worry, it's it's different on my it's just, it's the Wi-Fi refresh rate. <clears throat> Let's see. I'm actually curious if this is gonna do multi-phase. Can you already run that holding that thing in the nose of the hand? I've got my fingers on either side of it, not directly behind it. This is just trace elements, so the results actually <coughs> That Rubidium is probably pretty close, right? 140? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. it's like 148. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, in any case, um, although the soils is an empirical, it's just material. 147. Chromium is supposed to be 108. And it's 128. Mm -hmm. What's your chromium? Chromium is supposed to be 222. Two, two. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah, not terrible. But the soil is empirical, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. so, they have two, so they have a soil mode and a soil cow. The soil cow is soils. So it wouldn't surprise me if the empirical soil works. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've got the fundamental parameter soil. But geochem, oh yeah, there we are. That's good stuff. All right, let's try that. This one is a mixture of fundamental parameters and, uh, and it should switch between light and heavy. With filtering? Yeah, well it'll move the filter midway through. This is one of those, I, I think this is a dual phase, we'll see. Can you hear it switching out? Yeah, we will hear it. You should see the spectrum change too, so that's the trace spectrum there. I hope this has it. There it is, you hear that? Mm -hmm. That's it switching to the uh, light, up, light up on the filter to depopulate. So is that the green and the yellow, or another filter? It'll be a no filter. Oh, it's not yellow. There's only two phases, yeah. There. All right, so. 79.9% silicon dioxide, aluminum, 16%, potassium, 4.1%, calcium oxide, 1.2%. I don't know, do those match up? Let's see. The oxides. Let's give it a fair shake. What's the aluminum in this guy? Do you have the oxides on there? Aluminum is 7.1 and 7.31 weight percent. Is that elemental or oxide? It's elemental. It's elemental. Do you have oxide. the oxide? Here's the oxide. 14. 14. 14. All right. So it's the calcium oxide. Uh, Dead on. That's pretty good. What's the potassium? Potassium is good. 4.35. 4.35. And our iron? 1.86. Iron. And then the silicon. What's the SiO2? 73.4. Uh, yeah. All right. 79. Mm -hmm. So, not terrible. But what's it doing? How's it figuring this out? How's it beating the oxygen problem? It's attaching its other elements. Exactly right. So it knows, all right, the aluminum is probably this, the silicon is probably this, the potassium is probably this. That's what it's doing. Can it measure that oxygen directly? No. But it can guess if this is that oxidization stage, and this has to measure up to 100, this is what it should be. What probably happened is our silicon dioxide skewed up um, because of that 100, it, it forcing it to measure up to 100%. Now, if I have calcium carbonate, in my sample, what will happen? 
What's the formula for calcium carbonate? <coughs> CaCO3. So if I have CaCO3, will this be accurate? Does it know that that's calcium? Can it tell the difference between calcium carbonate and calcium oxide? No. Uh, can it tell the difference between Fe2O3 and FeO? If I have a kaolinite clay, uh, will it be able to tell the difference between Al2O3 and Al connected to potassium and a whole bunch of other elements? So it has to make a molecular assumption to force it to fit. And that's where things start to go awry. Um, that's the key. So it can get kind of close when you've got a pure form. By the way, the reason why it can work for obsidian is what is the chance that there's hey, morning. What is the chance that there's calcium carbonate in this guy? Zero, because it's firing temperature when it outgassed all that CO2 anyway. So because it was high, high pressure fire, you're okay. So anyway, but that's the key. Let's take a look here at the results. So lead. Yeah. Do you know why there's not lead in the burn? I have no idea. There should it should be there. They, yeah, it's, like, they have it in the spectrum too. Jeff, Jeff said we just don't find it visible. Yeah, I disagree. I disagree. I think it's I, I think it's I, I think it's bad to exclude things because like <coughs> who is the judge of whether or not it's useful to a scientist, right? Yeah. yeah. No, that frustrates me to no end. I mean, it's not useful if you can't see it. <laughs> like, well, we it's can't. Self, it's no way I'm saying it's like a self fulfilling prophecy. Yes, exactly right. Never, exactly right. You can never become that's useful if you're never measuring. That's an excellent point. point. Yeah, but any case, um, but yeah, that's the kicker. It's kind of unsettling how good the fundamental parameters can do when it makes these oxide assumptions. Yeah. So let's try a new sample. I just go to a Washington Post, and every time I see that happen, I'm like, what now? Oh, RNC says it was hacked. Yeah. So we're going to try this on the iPhone. I'm actually curious how this is going to work on that weird sample. I think. And this is still the soil. This is the geocamp, so this is designed for miners. Oh, okay. And the, the geocamp is the calibration. Yes. Something that looks a lot like obsidian. Do you see the potassium? What was the potassium in the uh, obsidian? Mm -hmm. oh, 3.61%. What's in my iPhone? It's somewhat obsidian. Mm -hmm. Gorilla Glass uh, yeah. is reinventing obsidian, by the way. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that, but um, that was the core idea. So this adds up to 26%, 71%. Looks like it's going to be close to 100%. But I can tell you there's a huge problem here. This is also a soda glass. It's got about 6% sodium. Can this guy see sodium without a vacuum? Does it include sodium when it tries to add it to 100%? Nope. So then I can guarantee you this is terribly off. Because when they scale to fit 100%, they make these results look great, right? If I don't know what I'm doing, if I don't know anything about the sample, I will get 100%. But here, because I can't measure a key element, NaO, it's gone. It's just excluded. We just expand silicon to fill that gap, because that's a safe bet. Mm -hmm. That's also what happened with the obsidian, too, by the way, right? Remember how the silicon was at 71? Does this have NaO? Uh, the obsidian, do they report the sodium oxide content? Two four percent So let's go back, actually. So let's pop back one measurement to the obsidian. So this was the obsidian measurement, right? Do we see NaO on this list? But silicon is how much above? Uh, it was like 5%, 4%. So what's the real value of silicon dioxide? 73.4. So all it's doing is it's using silicon to fill the gap. Because silicon will always be close enough. 
That's the trick. Yeah. That's how you convince someone that it's working. That's fundamental parameters in a nutshell. It has to add up to 100%. Otherwise, the entire premise is gone. And that's why, with geologic samples, it can cause all these problems. Because you can actually delete the possibility that that element is present. This is what happened to mining companies. Broker would be able to do good enough, or not even Broker, Niton, everyone using fundamental parameters, would do good enough to make a couple cycles, and people would be happy. And then the mining company would find out, oh, that, how much did we really have in that? Wait, we overinvested in this mine because we didn't know we had this element? Wait, there's sodium in there, and the sodium makes it more expensive to digest to get the gold out? All of those factors start to factor in, and that's where things start to go haywire. And the problem is, is because we have an idea that everything should add up to 100%. It, yeah? So this is maybe a very basic question, so I don't want to ask to yeah. everyone else, but what's the difference, with, so I'm still kind of, I'm starting to get what's happening here. Yeah, what's yeah, the yeah. difference between a filter, a calibration, and the fundamental parameters? Like, what do each of them do? How do each of them work? So, a filter uh -huh. is a manipulation of the light beam. So it's Show it's me some filter right in front of the beam. Exactly. So I can optimize for this or that element. Mm -hmm. Fundamental parameters is a type of calibration. Okay. A calibration is an algorithm mm -hmm. that converts spectral intensities mm -hmm. to something else. Most typically, that something else is weight percent, PPM, something along those lines. The goal of a calibration for a company is to sell units, right? So if I make my geochem mode and I can sell it to miners, that's money in the bank. Done and done, point of sale. If I can sell it to an archeologist, that's money in the bank, right? That's the goal of a calibration for a company. What is the goal of a calibration for a researcher? That's key. Re what, what reproducible, right? What does reproducible mean in science? I can do an analysis that replicates what he is. Exactly. Yeah. If you guys are two separate people, not working together at all, and he comes up with findings, you can replicate those findings, right? That's the crux of it. Can I replicate this algorithm? You can replicate the algorithm, sure. Well, so let me put it this way. Yeah. Who, made the, who made the algorithm? Did I make the algorithm? Brooker did. Brooker did. Yeah. Does Brooker have a proprietary interest in publishing how its algorithm works? Probably not. Why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't it? What would be the reason Brooker would want to publish how its algorithms work? Because it will show the flaw of the system. Well, if I said that, and yeah. more importantly, competitors will yeah. know what they're doing and up against. They can, the competitor can figure out what sample will trick their algorithm and go send it over. Mm -hmm. Now, if Brooker goes bankrupt, let's say 20 years later, people try to reproduce results from this algorithm, can they? No, it's not open. So this actually gets to the heart. Even if you decide fundamental parameters is good enough for what I'm doing, mm -hmm. the core problem you still run into is your work isn't reproducible. So let's talk about the Fram Shackley debate. So the, I mean, it's, it seems like it has its utility in, when you don't, when you know nothing about. Like a, so like a so sort of a first pass. Yeah, you know, it can certainly be useful for that. If you don't know what you're looking at, you can make it a first pass to see what's what what is here roughly. But the problem is the spectrum can do the exact same thing. You know how to read the spectrum. If you don't know how to read the spectrum, though, that can be a nice entry point for a lot of people. No, no debating that. Um, uh, yeah, I, the only worry I have is you might miss things, um, right? That could be important. Right. So, for example, my germanium chert. My germanium might not show up because the algorithm might not know to look for it. But that's just as true as the calibration for obsidian. If I turn my obsidian calibration on shirt and just publish those results, will my germanium ever show up? Mm -hmm. No. The problem is, is any model made by a human being has a chance, not a guarantee, but a chance of missing what could be the most important thing in that object, right? So let's. So, tell me the name. So, Daniel, when I was. Talking about those sediments earlier this morning, when I when I looked at those, rather than defaulting to running things through a weight percent calibration or a part mm -hmm. calibration, I used that RTAC program that they had up yesterday mm -hmm. and was operating through, and just threw all the spectrum in together mm -hmm. and see how well things overlapped or did to mm -hmm. see where spikes were or were not. So that I'm sorry, that was so you weren't using any calibration, not yet. Yeah, yeah, just looking yeah. at yeah. the spectrum. Okay. To see how they even, how each sample behaves. Yeah, exactly. Before any kind of computing went into mm -hmm. it. 
Just and so if you, in that instance, when you use the filter, you're essentially highlighting parts of the spectrum and getting more specific right. information. Right. So there were there were three different analyses done on that same sample. Mm -hmm. So there were three different groups of spectra. Yeah. And then you can see where things maybe overlap and go, okay, there's that, this, and that. And then mm -hmm. you can run the calibrations mm -hmm. to figure out how those elements actually go into a standardized unit. Okay. And then you can compare the standardized units together mm -hmm. of weight percent, this and that. But, okay. but always defaulting to looking at that line first, mm -hmm. rather than just what's being spit out of the calibration. Because mm -hmm. it's being selective on what it's doing, because it's made by us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Exactly. So when you start, like, you work for a mining company, what is the, forgive me if you already said this, but what is your input in your algorithm? Like, are you looking, you start with, like, a sort of family of rock or things that you would expect to find, or what? So, first, uh, I've got to say, full disclosure, I'm under NDA with one particular mining company, and the video is rolling, so I can't give you okay. all the stuff I know. What I can tell you is, is from the perspective of a company, they make the calibrations so that it can kind of cover the most general use cases, and they try their darndest to sell it on point and walk away. Because then it's their responsibility to get the results that they need. Um, that's typically how all companies do it. And that's a lot of times how a lot of people start to run into problems too, because they can't trust those results. Big mining companies might use it as a first pass for if something looks weird, what could be here. But that's about it. They still have to send their stuff up for lab analysis. Um, in theory, if I have a specific mining site, I could, you know, hyper-focus on that using Lucas, Lucas tooth equations or whatever. Um, but, um, you know, most mining companies just don't do that because that would be too much work per mine. And they don't have the sort of human resources to do that. So a lot of times, they have not been able to take full advantage of the handheld XRF revolution um, because of this problem where I can get results that kind of look good initially, but when I'm starting to produce things, let's say, well, let's go back to this algorithm. Let's say I've got an egregiously bad algorithm. Uh, this was the one, right? So I measured obsidian with a bad calibration. I knew it was bad going in. And I got 16% ruthenium. If I'm a mining company, is that good news? It's great news, right? So I can pile in money, focus on this, pull out a couple tons of this magical ruthenium rock. Ruthenium costs maybe $700 per pound, and I can sell it for profit, right? But what happens if the calibration's wrong? Not only do I lose a lot of money and all the investment of getting it back, my reputation is hurt too when I try and pass it off to something, right? Like, that's, that's pretty <coughs> interesting. Um, by the way, can anyone tell me the technical reason why ruthenium and rudium are coming up here in this calibration? If I look at the spectrum, What's a rhodium? What's, what's this? That's rhodium. That's rhodium. So the calibration is saying rhodium and estimating just fine, right? But what's the problem? It's, it's, it's in that. Even more to the point, what's most of this rock made of? Oxygen. 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 What's the oxygen doing to the rhodium? Blowing it up. It's causing it to reflect more and more. So if the calibration doesn't account for that, I misread it as rhodium. The Compton is where ruthenium will be. It thinks the Compton is ruthenium. That's what's happening. Mm -hmm. So what the calibration is doing is its, val its, its assumption of 100% blows up in its face mm -hmm. when there's a variable to not include, which is oxygen. How could it not know about its own rhodium too? It's not good though. But, I mean, Brooker... If Brooker programmed the rhodium correction, they might have programmed the rhodium correction for, um, for uh, uh, things that don't have oxygen. Mm -hmm. Because who would use a precious metals calibration on something with oxygen, mm -hmm. right? So it didn't include that in its assumption. The problem is, is when we, we, we could go back to the, to the drawing board, correct this for rhodium, but I would still have problems out here too. There's a lot of other elements it's picking up that aren't there, um, and that's causing the problem. So, but I want to focus on a really, really important thing. What I've just given you is not hypothetical. What I've given you is the basis of a massive scandal in the extra industry with wet toys back in 2013. What happened is someone did this with a toy that came from China. An x ray company that will go unnamed had a unit that they gave to a customer and they, they, and they made the basic fundamental parameters calibration. They measured a toy from China and it came up as 30% lead. And so they published an indictment of the company saying they have lead in their toys that they're selling to children 
Company name in bold letters. Company scrambles to handle the scandal, actually goes bankrupt because stockholders move out. And then they find out <sighs> there was no lead in it at all. It was just this background radiation from carbon, right? Carbon is the same thing oxygen does. Company went out of business because someone didn't use a calibration appropriately. People lost their jobs, yada, 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 lost their savings because of the bad calibration. So this rhodium example I just gave you, substitute rhodium with lead, same physical mechanism, light elements that weren't incorporated in calibration, drove a company out of business unfairly. But if you looked at the spectra, you'd see the lead Oh yeah, there. you'd be fine. You'd, you'd know there wasn't lead, exactly right. I mean, I so what's the lead? did that. <laughs> I, yeah. I had some, uh, had some Mexican uh, mor mor moroccas. Oh yeah? Very nice, colorful paint on them. Uh -huh. And I used our x on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did you look at the spectrum? Did it have the have the spectrum? Uh, I believe. Well, that was our Nikon. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't uh, put it in the meters. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> I no. Didn't give away the toys to our friends. Always check the spectrum. By the way, so this is the answer to why I'm a little hesitant. Like, so if you say geocat, could we just use it as a first pass, take a quick look? You can. But if there's anything in there that's going to break the algorithm. I mean, that's the problem, right? The only guarantee you have is the spectrum. Now, I brought up Plato's allegory of the cave earlier, because we're all chained to this cave. I don't know if you were here for this. We're chained to this. Plato's allegory of the cave is we're all chained together, and our backs are facing the center of the cave, and we're looking at a cave wall. There's a fire burning behind us. And there's something moving in the background. We can only see the shadow on the cave wall. And, um, and so we try to deduce what the true forms are. And that's Plato's allegory of the cave. The calibrations are methods of turning those shadows into something we understand. If we look in detail at the fundamental parameters algorithms, which are here, these are the fundamental parameters algorithms, each of them try to relate the weight percent, so the concentration of the analyte, into something we understand. Right? CI is the universal in external and material science for concentration of that analyte. This can be, so for example, in the, in the calibration that backfired, where the XRF thinks there's, what, 16% rhodium in the subsidian? Rhodium is here, and it's looking for the intensity, I, where rhodium is, and it sees that it's super high. And it says, oh, yeah, we definitely got a signal for rhodium. Now, why would a precious metals calibration have to include rhodium at all? Because rhodium can show up in precious metals, right? So that's what's happening here. And then all these physical parameters, if I didn't have oxygen present, would have worked probably just fine. They worked great for this right here. But what's the difference between this and this for the fundamental parameters algorithm? Oxygen. Oxygen, right? Can it measure oxygen? No. But it could measure every element in this. If this had, for whatever reason, rhodium in it, in these concentrations, this precious metals algorithm probably would have gotten close to what's actually there because it would have recognized it's outside the bounds for what the normal <coughs> performance is on a metal. Um, it's the oxygen that throws it off. It's the other variable. So that's the reason why I would recommend it's always better to look at the spectrum and learn to read the spectrum if you're going to be working to that level. Because a quick pass, you might miss something. Um, and especially if you're working in a research context, that's something, you know, typically speaking, when you have something important that's unusual, it's not going to show up in the actual fundamental parameters, right? Um, because, it, because the algorithm, it won't even show up in your empirical calibration because it's not showing up. So my best recommendation is learn to read the spectrum, above all. Going back to here, though, going back to Plato's allegory of the cave, is this algorithm finding a true form? Is CI, the concentration of the analyte, something that actually exists in this? Yeah. No. We have disagreement here. <laughs> What's your case that it exists, that it's a true form? Uh, I mean, it has concentrations of... Uh, of elements, it has concentrations. What's your case that it's not? I thought we were talking about rhodium. Uh, we can say it's a concentration of rhodium. Doesn't the, the algorithm is basically telling you the platonic ideal for that form, right? What like what your ideal yeah. city should look like, and doesn't it count for the fact that it, it's not always going to hit on the uh, the ideal form? So like it's not. I don't know. I'm just guessing. What it is is let, 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 let's uh, let, let, let's elaborate a little further. The concentration of the alloy. And weight percent. Is weight percent an absolute or a relative measure? Relative. 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 Can relative be a true form? Sure. In what context? How would relative be? If you know what you have is 100%, like 
if there is... A oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. So if I'm at 100%, then I've converged on the absolute, right? But here's the thing. It's a preconception of what 100% is, though. But in the object, let's say humans were never, never, never... Let's say we're back in the age of dinosaurs, and a piece of obsidian is produced. And all the intellectual ideas we have about terminology, percent, science, don't exist. What is in the obsidian in a raw natural state? Is percent something that exists in the obsidian as a product of nature? What is the product of nature? What is it made of? Oxygen, silica. It's made of all these. It's atoms. It's, atoms. it's just bunches of atoms, right? Yeah. So atoms, in this case, would be the true form. Atoms are what exist in nature. Percent is a human construction for understanding that reality. PPMs, they're great understandings of it. But my core point here is that the goal of the fundamental parameters is to take information about the atoms to create what we call a synthetic unit. So Anne Ravenovsky and uh, uh, Anna Stefan wrote this article a while back in one of those like tombs that no one reads. But it had this really important unit, distinction. Unit issues in archaeology? Huh? Unit issues in archaeology? Yes, you know the ones. <laughs> yeah, so in that in that volume, we want to meet nobody. It's, it's, it's fantastic to read. I, I'm actually thrilled that someone read this. So to me, it's like, you know, it, I always hate those edited volumes because I feel like they just disappear, especially when they hit like the 20, 30 year mark. Richard um, Hughes has a chapter. Does he? He does. He's got the, he's got the, he's got the great obsidian you know, chapter. Really, yeah, yeah, yeah the, where he distinguishes between geochemical chemical and, ge and uh, geospatial sources. That's right. But the argument of Anna Stefan and, uh, uh, and Anne Romanovsky in this is, I feel bad because I just dissed their work and said no one read it, but <laughs> <laughs> I guess technically I didn't about this, excuse me, Gold, but my apologies. But the key behind their idea in that volume was that there's a difference between analytical and synthetic units. Synthetic units are the product, analytical units are the raw output from any instrument. It could be XRF, it could be FTIR, it could be GPR. And it's this raw and filtered data. The synthetic unit incorporates assumptions about reality, right? So like, in this case, what would the raw unit for, let's say, zirconium in the subsidian B from the animal transportation? Photons. Photons, a spectrum. What is the synthetic unit that incorporates some of my assumptions? Parts per million. Parts per million. That's the key. So my core point here is where fundamental parameters most often fail is in the assumption that CI, they don't recognize that CI is a synthetic. They're incorporating that assumption. So the reason the there's nothing wrong with using physics to predict properties of the atoms of the spectrum. There's something wrong with trying to predict the concentrations in the spectrum. Because the atoms are something that exists. It's a real, true form that exists in the object. Always has, always will. Our idea of percent and PPM incorporates assumptions about its composition. In the case of this object, the assumption that this is a metal and everything adds up to 100% is correct. Everything in that spectrum, the copper, the zinc, the lead, adds up to 100% for your key. Does not factor in for here because we can't measure the oxygen. So we're missing that variable so the assumption goes awry. And thus the synthetic unit does not properly reflect the analytical product in this. Does that make sense? So, so we're missing the oxygen just because we can't measure it. Exactly. So in fundamental parameters, in theory, could I make a fundamental parameters algorithm just for obsidian? Yeah. Yes. Could it be good enough to do most of my work? Yes. But there will always be the chance I get surprised by something and that throws things off. Um, and that's, that's the key thing to understand about the fundamental parameters. So, and, and, and for me, having worked in the industry and having been a published scientist, so I've been on both sides of this, the problem we run into is that in science, when I put my name on that paper, I'm accountable for those results. The company, once it sells the unit, is no longer accountable for those results because you bought it. <laughs> right? Their incentive is not the same as yours. And it doesn't mean that they're evil or bad. It just means that they're not, they don't have the same incentive structure as you do. Which is why empirical calibrations work better, because that way the interests align, um, and you end up with something that works out very well. Now, let's, with that in mind, let's hop over here to what am I looking at? The Lucas Tooth algorithm. The Lucas Tooth algorithm. This is what is going on. So, it's another fundamental parameter. Hmm? Is it the, this is the opposite. This is the empirical. Oh, okay. So, this would be empirical. So, the difference in empirical and, and fundamental parameters isn't in what they're trying to do. They're trying to predict CI. Mm -hmm. The difference is, fundamental parameters, 
is trying to use the physics within the instrument and its parameters to hard calculate what those CIs should be. Mm -hmm. Empirical gives up on that and says, we're just going to use some standards and figure out whatever works best. So empirical is just, it's been criticized for being just brute force statistics. I'm going to use the slope, the intercept, I'm going to basically model it out statistically and figure out what it is. And my answer is only as good as the standards that I put into it. So this would be empirical. So this would be y equals mx plus b right here, and then I add in the, inter inter uh, the influence of other elements. And that's basically the idea behind empirical. So an empirical, my assumption is that my standards are good. And if I let parameters, my assumption is that you know, all these physical parameters can correctly estimate any unknown sample that comes up to it. And, and in the case of the Obsidian standards, they're analyzed using ICPMS and neutron activation, mm -hmm. and then XRF, so the XRF was calibrated to match those okay. other results. Exactly, exactly. Whereas fundamental parameters, you don't know, you don't have the same okay. basis of knowledge. So, uh, uh, but one thing I often like to, to comment on is there's this, this, this quote from Winston Churchill that I've always loved. I, I'm a, I, I, ever since I started working for Brooker, I got really into World War II. Because everywhere I went in the world, I saw its effects. I remember being on this small island in Tarawa, uh, in, in, in the Gilbert Islands in the Pacific, seeing Japanese soldiers being unearthed after the... Like, it was so crazy. Like, they, like we, were trying, we were there trying to recover American skeletons. And I remember they found this one bunker, and there were three Japanese soldiers still fully dressed, you know, bullets on their chest, lying as they had died from the initial bombardment. And it was crazy to see, like, you know, like that 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 finding. But this was on a small island. I then went to Poland, where of course you can see lots of effects of World War II. I went to China, where I saw other effects of World War II. Like it was such a major. It's sort of like World War II was Lord of the Rings, and we're just kind of after that, <laughs> not realizing how profound the world has transformed after that. And so I really got into Winston Churchill because he strikes me as such a heroic leader during that, though he made mistakes, you know, as you saw with the Bengal famine and all that. But he had this quote about the rise of fascism that's always resonated with me. He said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. And that was his defense of it. And his point was, is that it has all these failings, it's terrible. But when you compare it to all the alternatives, it works out pretty good. Like, it tends to get the better result every time. Um, the same can be said of empirical calibrations. Empirical calibrations are the worst kind of calibration, right? I'm only as good as my standards. Can I find a piece of obsidian that doesn't comply with that reference set? Yeah. It's absolutely possible. I'm, I'm, I'm very wedded to those standards. Is it a pain to measure and build a calibration for every instrument every time? Absolutely. It's the worst way to calibrate XRF instruments, except for all the other ways. <laughs> because they have all these crazy problems that can really come back to bite you. The lead example is only one of them. Let's take a look at, and I don't know if you, this is actually very important. If you're going to use XRF in your work, this, is very, this debate is very important to understand. Because this debate comes to the epistemology of these of scientific instrumentation and archaeology. And that is, um, Nico and Lucas have probably heard this to death. But that is the debate between Ellery Fram, and now, uh, where does he get? Is it Yale now? Um, Ellery Fram, and then uh, Robert Speakman, uh, Robert Speakman and Steve Shepard. Steve Shepard. I forgot Steve's first name. Um, so it's about these guys. So Ellery Fram, uh, uh, the background of this is he had a Nikon unit. And the Nikon unit is basically designed to do fundamental parameters and figure out what's quick and easy. And Ellery Fram is really attracted by it because A, it's cheap. So in other words, it removes an, uh, an economic hurdle for people to do research. Because mm -hmm. oh, a Nikon's like, what, half the cost of one of the broker systems, typically? Um, so it's half the cost. I mean, it's half the cost because they're not going through all the time to calibrate individually. They, right off the belt, have all these basic fundamental parameters algorithms. And by the way, the fundamental parameters algorithms are just written, and they're just pasted on each unit separately. They'll usually do a little bit of standardization to customize in case the tube's a little off, but by and large, the algorithm exists independent of whatever hardware it's on. Kind of like how the Mac OS operating system is on all these different computers, or your, or your, or your phone system is. So anyway, what, 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 what Ellery liked about it was that I can just point shoot and I can get a result quickly. And this is great for developing countries where they don't have an unlimited amount of money to spend on these things. It also means I can do everything out in the field as quickly as possible. So I can start to get giant sets of data. Like his, his viewpoint is very understandable. But what he wanted to do 
which assesses validity. If we go back to that same obscure volume that was published, what was that, like the 1980s or something? But that, oh no, 1998. Yeah, yeah okay. 1998. The University of Chile. I remember that because that's when Third Eye Blind's album came out. That was <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, uh, uh, I remember on Twitter, someone asked, like, what's the thing from your childhood that you were looking forward to but don't look forward to anymore? And I was like, Third Eye Blind's next album. <laughs> but, um, but in any case, in that volume, Richard Hughes' article was that there's validity and reliability in understanding these systems. Um, reliability kind of comes down to precision. But validity is, does it correspond to what's actually there at the heart of it? Am I actually valid for understanding what I'm looking at? And Bram wanted to say, do these off-the-shelf calibrations work? And so he tested the uh, fundamental parameters algorithm, and he tested it versus merged results for the same obsidian standards. So he as you can see, he measured a ton of samples here. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a lot of samples. It is, it is. He, he did a lot of work. And then he compared, so we're going to look at titanium here, he uh, uh, used a laboratory system at MER, and then compared it to what he called the HHPXRF, or the handheld portable XRF. Is it, so is it a Micron 3 gold? It's a gold or whatever, yeah. Um, by the way, you can tell what market they were going for with that name, right? Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, so this is the lab result, and then this is the result from his handheld factory calibration. What do you think? Is that good or bad? It's not great. Not great. What, 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 would we, what would we use, what, which of these numbers would we use to assess the performance of his handheld versus the lab? The R, right? R squared. Actually, what does the R squared mean? It's a residual between known and the Yes. Yeah. So the idea here is, so this is, this is the known on the x-axis here. It should be flipped, I think. I went to pretty safe flip. But um, this would be our authoritative stance, so to speak, from the lab, because it's got this reputation, it's destructive. And by the way, they destructively pulverize these things, right? So one of the ways labs give accurate results is they take this, grind it to a fine powder, press it to a pellet, put it in the machine, and the machine is precisely calibrated for exactly that matrix. So it gives a much more reliable result. Whereas handheld, we just kind of measure it as it is, you know, warts and all. So anyway, the, so we, the R squared here would mean, if we flip it around, the R squared stays the same, but the other parameters change. The R squared mean 83% of what the lab saw was predicted by the handheld. So that's pretty good. I would actually argue the R squared is not the best measure for this instrument. The best measure is the slope. What is, how do we interpret the slope? The, so slope, to me, if I'm going to compare two different instruments, the slope is more important. And like the R squared value, it should be as close to one as possible. A slope of one means for every PPM that the lab saw, the XRF saw that PPM. So it should be at a three five degree angle. Yeah. What's the what's the slope here? Less than that. You know, like not. <laughs> so how do I interpret that slope? That means for every one PPM the lab saw, how many PPM did the unit see? <clears throat> Half a PPM. So it's fifty percent off its true value. It's so in other words the R squared measures precision, reliability. The slope measures accuracy. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around it, but when you're working with a known and you do know what it is, the R squared is only telling us how close the line of the points are to a given line. The line itself, this is the core problem, the line itself is a product of the data, not a product of the known. That's, by the way, a shameless plug, lying cloud cal is cloud cal. You see this dotted line? That dotted line is the slope of what? So that way I can see, does my regression line have the same slope as the dotted line? In the case here, it does. If I use a bad cal, let's do total counts, I'm trying to shake it off that line. So one of the problems when I coded off, when I coded my calibration algorithm, I actually forced it to come up with the closest answer that they want every time. So it's really hard for me to break it. Um, uh, let's see. Let's do one and two. Yeah, I, I don't think I can break it here. But in any case, the idea here is in this algorithm, even though this calibration is terrible, 
it's going to ask you to find 2, the slope is still 1. In other words, it's still according to those basic predictions. Let's do the rainforest again. When I do my rainforest algorithm, which will take a second here, I might break. So in, in, your, in your web um, cloud cal, yeah. in every case you have the counts on the left and the estimate for sound. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, people like to like to like to do it the opposite way, um, but I far 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 prefer to see the 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 known on the y because that's what it's supposed to be. Um, XRF material scientist calibration terminology is exactly backwards how the rest of statistics does it. Mm -hmm. um, they typically want to see the the counts as they know. Yeah, like the independent versus the dependent. Exactly, exactly. That's that's exactly right. It drives me nuts every time. But yeah, um, I like to see. I like to be as strict as, pos uh, as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but everyone's got their preferences. I find if I get too much blowback, I might switch cloud gels axes <laughs> around. Um, I think technically, Hillary Fran is is doing it right in the material science sense, but not necessarily in the statistical sense. But in any case, I designed this so that you can compare the actual line from the regression to what it should be, which is the slope of 1. If, on Ellery Fram's paper, I plot the 1 to 1, it's going to course up here, right? So that would tell me immediately, visually, what I know from reading the slope, which is he's systematically off. Every one of those predictions from the handheld is going to be 50% off. Because it's not getting oxygen? or. I don't know why on the instrument it's not. It could, I think for titanium, it could be the oxidization state. Um, it could be it's not factoring in the influence of iron on titanium. There's all kinds of reasons why it could be so far off. And the, old, the point is, what I learned from here, is that it's always going to be off, right? Now what Fram argues is that he can post-process this, right? He says, look, I can add in and correct the lab to that. But then what he's basically doing is, is he's making it here for calibration anyway. <laughs> Just instead of using the photons, he's using a derived measure from someone else and then fixing it. It's what we call type standardization in the extra field, which is I'm matrix correcting whatever the calibration is doing wrong. Um, but like, if you have to do that anyway, right? Just do a variable from the beginning. Because then you get the results. So that's titanium. And it's not a black box. Yeah, exactly. Right. So let's look here. Manganese. This is a neutron activation analysis versus his extra handheld XRF. How does this calibration look? Better. Better. Yeah. better. Why is it better? The R is 94 and the slope. This it looks like it's close to 45 at least. The line fits. What's, 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 the, what, what's the slope value? 1.38. So it's still 38% off. It's still gonna it's actually gonna overestimate the manganese, right? So if my manganese is here. It's going to systematically overestimate by forty percent. His units are different, on the, or his range is different. <coughs> uh huh. It tricks you into thinking it's a forty-five degree angle. Uh -huh. That this drives me nuts. <laughs> like I, I'm Why curious. You that? Have, I don't know. Um, I, like so. Sometimes I like to call, pass review that way. I, I like this. I like to say <laughs> Journal of Archaeological Science is like the Daily Mail of archaeology. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like you get some really good articles in there, and some you get are just terrible. But yeah, no, like that, that right there, he 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 forces it there, uh, basically with the axes. I don't think he intentionally did this. I know the software he's using; it's Mac Numbers. He just plopped it in, and Mac Numbers does that. Um, but I think it fooled him as well as the reviewers. But in any case, yeah, it's still thirty percent off. So let me put it this way, just to highlight why fundamental parameters causes a problem in mining. If I'm a mining company, let's say I'm, I've got manganese mine, and I need to have one weight percent of manganese in the rock to make a profit extracting it, right? Because it costs money to pulverize it, digest an acid, and extract the manganese. Could I use this calibration to make money? Because the problem is it's 38% over. If, it, if the calibration tells me I have one weight percent manganese, I might actually have 0.6 weight percent, and I'm in the red. You can see why mining companies got bitten pretty hard by these fundamental parameters algorithms, right? Because systematically, if they measure the NIST standard, the NIST standard comes up great, that's wonderful. They probably use the NIST standard to guide the model. But when it actually comes time to make money, and I make a bet of a million dollars on this, and I've got that kind of an error, I'm, I'm, I'm out. So I won't last long.
So anyway, um, that's the key there. How about this one, zinc? Good or bad? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's closer. It's only 22% off now. It's going to underestimate 22% of the time. Yeah. You can kind of see here where the core problem, where I think the core problem is anyway, which is your systematic adopt. Now, I'm doing obsidian sourcing. So this is rubidium, right? Rubidium is a core. Right? How accurate do I need to be with rubidium to be able to accurately source? What would you say your acceptable error is in obsidian rubidium? To source. You want like what, 95%? 90, well, let's say, what, what about absolute terms, right? Each source has an absolute definition of how much rubidium is in it. Right. How much how much error is acceptable in ppm? 5%? Yeah. So 5 or 10 ppm? 5 or 10 Does that sound reasonable? It depends on the region. It depends on the region, this is true. But like, yeah. but what region would, 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 would rubidium be essential? In the, Andes. If, 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 in the Andes, how many ppm off from a value do you have to be to say this isn't from that source to do a negative test? Yeah. What would you guess for alpha? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the ratio. Yeah, it's like yeah, that's fair. That's fair. You know the ratio. Like for northeastern California, where there's a lot of variability, <clears throat> we wouldn't want it more than 15 ppm off. 15, 15 ppm off. If it was, I mean, it would. Like if everything was off the same way, mm -hmm. that would be workable. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want just rubidium off. So if I've got, let's say I've got this calibration, which is 0.66, so not great, but uh, this, would, this wouldn't work. No, <laughs> right? That, that, that wouldn't work. But let's say it was in 0.9. Let's say I have 250, 250 ppm from the hand pump. What's the actual concentration of rubidium in that rock? If my estimate is is, is, is under. Well, 85, that'd be 30 ppm off, right, roughly? Mm -hmm. In addition to the inaccuracy, that's the crux of it. Mm -hmm. That's the crux of it. So that's, that to me is where this has a failing instrumentally, right there. Speakman, but here's the thing, Fran makes an argument where he says, look, these still cluster. I still know, even though these results are inaccurate, that this is a cluster, and this is a separate source. I can still make my source assignments this way. So what he uses, and this drives me nuts, he quotes what I told Adam Nazaroff back in 2007. He, qu he quotes us and he says, even though the calibration is off, the instrument itself is still internally consistent. Um, and I remember the bar that I said that to Adam. <laughs> and we put that in our paper. Internally consistent, so I can still make the source attribution as long as the instrument is internally consistent. So his argument from this data. Personal communication, Albuquerque bar. No, we published it about. We, yeah, right? We did publish it in, uh, uh, in JAPS in 2010, actually. Um, so he's using our research in this case, um, which still drives me nuts. But, um, but I remember talking to Adam, taking through the results. Because we, because what we did back in 2010 is we used Steve Shapley's machine here as the control for the Brooker tracer. We did the test. I remember it because I'd worked on the Obama campaign. I got done. I was like, I really need to start doing something archaeological or I'm to graduate. <laughs> so I jumped on that project, um, which is so funny. All my dissertations at like Bronze Age never got me a job. But this like, you know, third author position on this project <laughs> yeah. launched my career. But anyway, um, it's funny how the world works. But I remember when I looked at that data. Let me see if I can bring up our paper. Let's see. It's just fun because I'm like where that lab is. Oh, by the way, my favorite part of this is we document. I, I shouldn't have used the shadow in the figure. Um, again, Jess reviewers. But this is the diagram of Hughes' 1998 paper mm -hmm. and a demogram. So that way you can see what he means by validity. Mm -hmm. um, so in any case, if we use this, um, if we use this, precision would be the replicability of the measurement. Accuracy would be comparison to the known sources. Validity is the ability to distinguish the geochemical source. And then validity is the ability to address archaeological inquiry. That's Hughes 1998. So in this case, let's judge the nighttime unit. Is the nighttime unit making replicable me measurements? With with, with by, data? By another nighttime? Right? Let's let's give it a no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Comparison to known sources. Does it work? No. No. Does it accurately distinguish geochemical sources? 
It distinguishes them. Yeah. yeah. So, well, that's a yes. We're going to get it. accurately, it is the problem. You yeah. Said We'll, we'll put it aside. We're gonna take these. We're gonna, we're, we're gonna take these in isolation. I'm gonna give this as a yes to Fran. And then, does it address archaeological incorrectly? Yes. 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 So that's, by the way, why Fran called it validity. Yeah. Validity, because it meets Hugh's definition. He is totally sidestepping reliability uh, and precision and accuracy. He's saying, is it valid? And so, in that case, that's what he's thinking. So yeah, but anyway, what we did um, is we used K-means cluster analysis to compare Berkeley's unit with our tracer. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm really proud of this. I came up with the bullseye idea because I didn't know how to visualize how two instruments perform. So I used K-means cluster analysis, which means I tell it how many clusters there are in the data and it automatically draws the bullseye. Or, I, the bullseye I had to calculate via drive measure, but the core of it is, is it tries to find the center of the data and I did that for the tracer and the Berkeley unit, and you can see the offset. This is the Stepeke, it's a miss, it's systematically off. Here, El Shael, I can see the, uh, 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 this is El Shael, this is the Stepeke, I can see the systematic drift of one unit to the other by about 10 ppm. So the, the sorry, the bullseye is the neutron equation analysis? The bullseye, so the bullseye right here that is drawn, that is Steve Schaffer's history. So these are the, the we took the oh, same obsidian okay. standards, <coughs> measured them on the tracer we had in Albuquerque that we just got uh, sent to us by Bruce. Yeah. And then we measured the same same obsidian pieces here at Berkeley as Steve Shackley's unit. So the dots are from the tracer. The bullseye here is from the lab unit here. Because again, visualizing the two is really hard. Yeah. So the bullseye is designed so you can see, if you just eyeball it, you can see the drift. Between the two, right? I can see that I am coming in about what 20 ppm two low in zirconium and 10 ppm two low in rubidium. I can quantify the difference between the two instruments. Is that like a standard deviation or something? The outer and inner circle? Exactly right. This is standard deviation number one, standard deviation number two. On a, on a single measurement? Huh? Oh. On all these measurements. So these are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight samples of Vishtapeke. This is the deviation of the k-means cluster. Okay. So the deviation Plus. here, by the way, is not based on the data. It's based on the k-means clustering algorithm. Uh, um, it gets a little complicated. That's why it's not in the lips. That's exactly right, not in the lips. Because exactly. the idea of k-means cluster is I measure the center point of the data, and then I have the, rate of the variation in that center point as, vari as varying standard deviations. So this, so that's why it is an ellipse. Although I would argue the, if I did draw an ellipse of this, it would actually look pretty close to what the circles are right here anyway. <laughs> but the idea here is, is that they were systematically off. But when I told Adam in the bar, he was like, well, what do we do? I don't want to publish this paper and tell Bruce he's wrong. And I'm like, we absolutely do that. <laughs> <laughs> What's more, what we will point out, we'll give, we'll give, we'll give this bone to everyone that the device itself is internally consistent. Right? Once I understand my offset, then I can I can think I can correctly calibrate it. So our point in this paper was it's a solvable problem. Brooker just isn't there yet. Um, I got so many angry emails from Brooker when we published this, and then they hired me when I got my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this was the crux of what that was. Um, yeah. So anyway, but that's the key, right? So we argued this, and the point of the paper that we wrote was that this is solvable if we correctly calibrate these instruments. Then we're good. What we found out later, by the way, um, is that, so I argued, this is my mistake, I argued that the Berkeley instrument here by Steve Shackley was accurate. The authority of Steve Shackley meant this is a known value, and the instrument is off. I was wrong. That was right. Uh -huh. So, the calibrations, and I'm talking, this is from a conversation with Bruce, I'm being videotaped, if I'm misrepresenting the Bruce or Steve Shackley, I apologize. But what was explained to me was that we had sort of these two big centers of obsidian, of uh, quantitative obsidian work. That was Murr and Steve Shack. I don't want to name any names. One group put obsidian on, on epoxy, right? Oh. That we talked about that yesterday. So their backscatter was influenced by epoxy. Mm -hmm. Another group normalized to all the background radius. So instead of normalizing the Compton, they normalized to everything from 20 to 40 KDB. So the normalizations, Either of those two things, either having the obsidian on the epoxy or that, would cause 
this type of error, that type of systematic error. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing here is not that the Berkeley instrument is correct and that the tracer is off. Okay. What we're that say there's about five ppm error on each. Mm -hmm. I would say we're seeing a difference in how the data, the spectrum, is processed. Mm -hmm. Because if we mount the obsidian on that epoxy, we're violating the assumption in the, in the synthetic unit, right? That's the crux of it. So this kind of, this is actually what the state of the art was back then. This was as good as any archaeologist was going to get with any study. So what is the, um, are these calibrated then, these points? Yep. And yep. what we, kind of calibration was it? It was the MER version 1 obsidian okay. calibration. Um, but, like I said, I'm not going to name names because I don't want to be mean, but there are two problems with the existing calibrations back then. One was that they were mounted to epoxy, so this backscattering was inaccurate, and two, they were using that normalization protocols. Mm -hmm. And so as a consequence, with those two in place, by the way, if you normalize from 20 to 40 keV, can you tell me what the biggest thing that's going to predict the value of rubidium? How thick the obsidian is. Because if I'm normalizing to all that back, <coughs> I'm exposed to how thick the obsidian blade is. So blades will show up over here, and this happened to some, uh, well, well back, not in the night, I think it was like in the 80s or 90s, someone actually did something like that, and they ended up completely misapplying all the obsidian sources. They made an argument that all the blades were from here, but all the cores were from here. So obviously they were importing obsidian from one place, and then exporting to another. That was the economic relationship. Nope, the backscatter was causing them to underestimate rubidium and straw team and misassociate it to another source. <laughs> you can totally see how that could happen though, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, but that's, so, so here I was being unfairly critical, of, I, I think, of, of, of Brooker, and that's just the critical of, of Steve. But either way, if you measure two, and later I think Kurt Redemaker did something similar in Alka, and he actually found the differences between neutron location analysis, wavelength dispersive, and handheld XRF actually come out to about 10 ppm. They did ICP, they didn't well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and then they saw that kind of little variation. Right, and so then, then there was that report that from Mike Glass Cox to yeah. Chris Kaiser, mm -hmm. where they did all three methods. Exactly, and, and then they came up with, this is sort of the... 19, 19, 2012. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. What frustrates me is they never published that officially. Mm -hmm. It should have been, that should have been a JAS article, I think. Yeah. Um, low hanging fruit for citations too. I'm surprised no one, no one did that. But anyway, um, but anyway, so this is the case with Fram's article. Um, he used our argument, what, our, what I thought we were arguing for good calibrations. He took it as as long as the instrument is internally consistent, it is valid in Richard Hughes' sense, and we don't have to worry about reliability. We don't have to worry about accuracy or precision. So in other words, this right here is beside the point. We don't need to worry about that. Enter Steepman and Shackley, um, who write a very, take a very different case. Um, they come coin this term, uh, that's going to be hard to read. Uh, they coin this term that uh, it's side of the science. And what they mean is this, I'm going to quote them. If, as promulgated by Fram and others, I think I'm the others, uh, that it is perfectly fine to provide results that are only internally consistent and do not conform to established international standards and data, then we are entering a time of silo science, where each researcher's data is self-contained, independent, and cannot be verified externally. We find this to not only be unacceptable, but another aspect of the social science that is subjecting the science aspect of our discipline to play scientists with portable XRF technology. Burn. <laughs> <laughs> Mic drop, right? <laughs> so the core point they have here is that Fram arguing that internal consistency is the only metric for the performance of these XRFs, means that each XRF is its own self-contained world. This XRF, could I get it to try, could I get it to tell me this is Alka, this is, what's another South American city source? Chivaya, et cetera. Yeah, if I can do all that, that's good enough for archaeology. These guys are like, who can test you? Who can come in and test your results and find a problem with them? If it's fundamental parameters and it's a locked box, that it's not reproducible, and then every individual worker is working independently. We just have to take their arguments on authority. We can empirically test them. That is the argument of Speakman and Shackley. And they point out the reason we use the weight percent in standards and empirical calibrations is to make everything reproducible. So that way the work you guys can do can be picked up by someone else, and it's reproducible, it's valid, and it's, and it's reliable in the full sense of Richard Hughes meant back in 98. That's the idea behind this whole debate. Um, 
uh, about that. And that's really what the fundamental parameters of empirical calibration is about. It's not about whether physics is better than standards in terms of estimating concentration. It's about whether or not you're doing science or not. Because <laughs> if you can't reproduce it, it's not science, right? It's just authority. <laughs> We're, we haven't moved that much far past Galileo, if that's the case. <laughs> that's the crux of the argument. Um, yeah? So in the report, just to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the, this is the report from Glasscock to Kaiser. Oh, okay. I think I've got a copy. I can bring that up, too. Um, so in the conclusion, he says, he, he basically like used this method for the best results with... Yeah. With, um, so NA, the best elements for NAA analysis are sodium, aluminum, chlorine, potassium, SC, yeah. manganese, iron, Scandium, yeah. Vidium, SP, CS, sodium, selenium. Wait, the double is sodium. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, and then, I, and then that's, um, what is that? Uh, microwave. Uh, and not to, uh, so I, 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 I don't know what the MA is. ICP, MS is, and definitely coupled plasma mass spectrometry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So then, anyway, the, the ones we care about are uh, strontium, yttrium, zirconium, yeah, sure. niobium, yeah. are yeah. better from ICP, MS. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then what they, what, they, what they did with their calibration is they did this. They used the values we use for strontium from ICP, MS, the values we use from rubidium come from NAX. And that's the calibration that goes on the rubidium. Exactly. Yeah. So to understand the difference between these two techniques, uh, neutron activation, this is really important for you to understand actually, because you're going to have to decide a lot of this stuff. Neutron activation analysis is I take my sample, mm -hmm. I put it in the nuclear reactor, I close the door, I close another lid door, <laughs> I close another lid door, I go over to the next building, <laughs> and I put turn it on, and the nuclear reactor activates everything in this guy. Like, in other words, we're irradiating every single element here. And those elements start decaying. We're just filling them up with neutrons. And now they start breaking down. And they produce a spectrum, a spectrum that shows the decay of those elements. And elements like rubidium decay into other elements and produce a spectral signal. And so they can measure by the atom what is being produced. And they can use that to infer how much rubidium is there based on how much rubidium is activated decay. When they're done, they, they, they have a machine that takes the sample, puts it in a nuclear containment thing, because huh. that sample is now radioactive for the next 400 years minimum, and now it's radioactive waste. But we now know a lot about what was in that sample. What makes neutron activation analysis good is we can do part per billion, and we can do a lot of elements. So there's an argument by Patty Crown from 1983 um, she's, the, she's the wife of my dissertation advisor, and she argued for ceramic sourcing. This is the best method. XRF can't compete. Even though XRF is attractive, it doesn't give you the range of elements you need to actually truly source. You'll need to know that because you'll have to cite that if you find good results with this. Or cite it if you find bad results with this. So that's key. Can so you explain what is the difference between long and short irradiation in your? You know, I don't think I sometimes my yeah, boss talks I'm not familiar with that term. Long radiation, long something. I think it costs more, so he only does it when it's like when it's super important. Day. Is he talking about uh, the wavelength in that context, or is he talking about the duration? Do you know? I think it's duration. If, it was, if it's duration, it should be the same basic energy. Because typically speaking, the longer you run it for, the more expensive it's going to be because it's a nuclear reactor. <laughs> but the chance of getting smaller quantities of exotic elements, I think, is what's key there. So that will change the detection limit, I think. That's probably what he's referring to, but I don't know for sure. Um, but if I had to guess, that was what it would be. But that's neutron irrigation analysis. Now the thing is, not all elements break down the same way. They make it, there might be a time difference. So that's why we see that some elements are great, but not all. For MA, ICP, MS, uh, that's where we're using inductively coupled mass spectrometry. What we do there, is we fire a laser. To, to, the, by the way, the ICP, this determines on whether they digested an acid into their own solution, or you do it on the physical sample. In this case, they put it in a fourfold acid dilution, which is crazy dangerous, right? They're using stuff like hydrofluoric acid. That is just messy stuff. But it dissolves everything. Every element is decoupled from every other element. And they take that solution, and they fire lasers at it. And the lasers break down the outer electron shells, and that creates characteristic spectra. And that can be used to quantify things.
things. I think an MA is a typo, because down there it's called MD, I was thinking, uh, because microwave digestion. Uh, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, that must be a typo then. So one thing I want to highlight here, FE is better studied by nutrient information analysis. FE is not better studied by ICPMS. I can tell you why, because I ran into this. Brooker has made a handheld ICP system. It's using a laser, and it physically works. A laser ablation. It actually works great with ceramics, by the way. Um, let me show you what that is. It's, it is. It's, it's, it's it not, yeah. It's like, like a little pinhole. Exactly. On a ceramic, you usually don't notice it, but <coughs> it is absolutely destructive. This is what it looks like here. And I wrote a fingerprinting, this is what its spectrum looks like, by the way. This is the same, similar spectrum you get from ICPMS. So here's Vera. Kind of looks like XRF, right? With two different lines. Uh, this is what it would look like. So here I've got oxygen, calcium, silicon, phosphorus, but there's multiple. Sodium is actually super easy to measure with this technique. It shoots a laser on the sample, it basically creates a ball of plasma, and the ball of plasma spits out photons from the outer electron shell of what was just in it elementally. And that produced, or it would still be the same thing, but you're, you're basically creating this cloud of electrons, and then you're able to measure from that light what you're seeing. In any case, when you produce that, the fluorescences change. So how many peaks does iron have in XRF? Two. Two, right? Two. Yeah, okay, yeah. Can you guess how many uh, peaks iron has in uh, an ICP MS? Or a laser ablation, induced ablation? 18,000. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why they use the new activation analysis for iron. <laughs> Because it's just impossible to do with ICPMS. It's a, me a hot mess. They typically take one of those peaks and hope it works. So anyway, your your spectral interpretation issues, you can do qualitative XRF spectrum work. It's really almost impossible to do qualitative ice uh, limbs work because there's just too much, too much. But anyway, but that's the key there. So that's that's just one example of why one ML could be better than another, because they have different properties under each method. But they combine both of these and they produce that. And the point here is using this approach with this set of obsidian, if Nico does work and if Lucas and Kathy do work, it's equivalent. We can they can compare each other's results. If Nico goes, Lucas is crazy, this is wrong, jumps in with his unit, he can test Lucas directly and get the same result. And that's reproducible. And now it's science, right? It's what the arguments you make are substantiated by that data set. Um, in any case, but that's the core of what they do here. Fran, unhelpfully, comes in with a new argument. Wherever his paper is. Oh, it's okay. going to the left. Huh? Yeah, it's going to the left. This is 20. Here. Oh. Fran responds to Chief Shackley. So this is where Fran responds to Steve Shackley. Stay, uh, or, or Robert's big point is Steve Shackley. He, and I'm just going to read you the title Is Obsidian Sourcing About Geochemistry? Or archaeology. <laughs> what would your answer be? Both. Oh, yeah. It's both, right? Why would it be both? Well, because you can't do one without the other. Exactly. So, our, so Fran is trying to divorce the idea that archaeological questions require good geochemical data. Whereas I think the argument from Steve Shackley, uh, Steve Shackley and Robert Speakman would probably like, think of Jeff. Um, I, 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 he does prefer Jeff. Yeah, I know. It's just the publisher. <laughs> um, it's sort of like, I, like when I was a kid, I, I pronounced items, items. Because <laughs> like, I'd say free inside, right? The box of cereal. Um, and there was also like 19 Oz's. So, um, in any case, um, uh, uh, the argument that that's the fundamental debate, right? Can we divorce archaeological inquiry from the basic geochemistry? The group who uses empirical data, standards and data, says no, you can't. Um, the group who likes to buy cheap XRF instruments and point and shoot says it's good enough for government work. Approach. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that we're staying on point with ceramics. <laughs> yeah. Because we obsidian has kind of been monopolizing some of this conversation. So it's really easy to, to source obsidian. Yes. We we can do that. Now ceramics, when you have a site that somebody worked out ten years ago and they had a tracer, yep. and they created chemical groups based on their analysis. Have you been you seen people going back to those same ceramic um, assemblages and analyze them again, the same way we would do with obsidian? Like, are people doing that? Are there issues? 
Um, let's let's hold that thought right now. Um, the answer is yes, there are people looking at it, but there's a lot of mixed Because you're not necessarily sourcing the ceramics, you're just creating geochemical groups yeah. of yes, pottery types. Exactly. exactly. And that, exactly. That, that, that is even more complex than doing it in much cities. You don't have sources, you just yeah. have chemical groups. Of course, the pottery types are clay, well, clay sources. Well, okay. that that's, that's, that's the thing. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Ceramics are complicated, really complicated. I think a lot of the work in ceramic, so like obsidian sourcing is fundamentally predictive, right? Ceramic, ceramic analysis is mostly descriptive. We're describing the different groups we have as yeah. best as we can. I don't, I think in most cases, true sourcing is geochemically impossible, whether regardless if it's XRF or NAN. Because the reality is if I have a volcano, I have, you know, like, let's like, like take Mount Rainier as an example. There's a dot on the landscape that produces rhyolite every once in a while. Boom. Right there. That's my source. There's this defined region in space and time that produces that. A geologic formation can extend across half a continent and have outcrops in different areas. And geochemically, I might be able to find that the scandium uranium ratio pinpoints this formation. That formation is huge. Right? The nature of its variation is fundamentally different than it is with, uh, by the way, I cut myself the obsidian. <laughs> good job, thank you. Uh, well, I'm good for now, yeah. I mean, the thing, sort of what we were talking about earlier, you can't really necessarily source ceramics because you have different ingredients and different recipes. Exactly, exactly, like, exactly. And we're, like, we're talking about how, yeah. you know, how cookware in the Mycenaean world gets tempered with you know, sand, with basalt, and other various things. Yep. Obviously, you can't source each of those now, to one location. In argument, some people use microprobe. So they'll use an SEM. And what the SEM does is it fires electrons, which gives you a nice surface topology. But I can target a clay species in that ceramic. I can shoot electrons at it. And I can get a spectrum just like XRF. It's a little different because I'm using electrons. I'm also doing it in a pure vacuum, so I can see things like carbon, too. Um, but it's also all going to be the same thickness. You so, just got one. Huh? No. You guys have one? No, you just got the SEM ES. Nice. Hitachi, TM, you will want to use that for some of your work, <laughs> absolutely. The negative, by the way, of that is that spectrum is typically confined by about 25, 30 kV. So mm -hmm. elements like rubidium, strontium just uh, don't show up well at all. Mm -hmm. um, uh, XRF is way better for those. But for light elements, compositionally, it can be very, very useful for your work, too. Um, but it is necessarily, is this, a, it, how big is the change? <coughs> um, it's like seven, uh, seven, you think, seven centimeters? We've got, we got an older model because yeah, yeah, the yeah. chamber size is larger. Oh, We've got awesome. some now. Yeah, they have, they, they have. Because they're, like well, they're miniaturizing the same way everyone's miniaturizing. Yeah, and people are using like a circuit board yeah. or something. Like yeah. That. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. 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 you can see the carbon, yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so that's the deal. So. In any case, um, yeah, so if you have a shirt that's small enough, you can spit it, throw it in that, you will get the EDS spectrum. And by the way, the rules of EDS are a lot different than XRF. So in XRF, we talk about the resonance, right, where titanium fluoresces and activates another thing. Not quite as true in energy dispersed uh, in electrons, because the electrons don't do that. Now, the product light can still do that, but it's not working with the same depth of mm -hmm. penetration, so those effects are much reduced. So you can use that for some of your work if the shirts are small enough. You just have to bring it back to the US. That looks like you do. So you'll just need to bring the EDS with you. Put it in your backpack, right? Maybe there's a little bit in the horse tomorrow. Maybe, yeah. Just no. But anyway, but that's the that's the key thing. But it works with similar properties. So on the note of ceramics, I want to segue. Actually, I need to use the restroom first. <laughs> when I come back, I'd like to segue in. What I'd like to do, since we've got a very qualified crowd here, I'm going to do a really deep dive into ceramics. And not just ceramics, but the environments that form them. So when you see elements, you know how to interpret them. This will also be relevant because if you do chemostratigraphy and archaeology, these same rules apply, like and just on a different scale of time. Um, but all the chemical interactions can be very similar. So anyway, hold that thought back okay. in like ten seconds, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll continue. Oh, is that so in your, have you started doing analysis with No, 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 no. This okay. is just, this for is me, this is very... This is ground floor. Yeah, it's just like, is this, you know, because obviously XRF is, you know, I, the, the things I knew about XRF before coming in are that it's non-destructive and it's portable. Right. So for someone who works in Greece where you're not really allowed to do anything, yeah, it's portable is, is incredibly important. And, right. You know, wow, so this is like... 
straight in. This is like out of the front of the Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's why, that's why everyone's wearing like, so tell me what a filter is. Because like, yeah. <laughs> I don't quite get that. Because I mean, even for yeah. me, I'm like, if I go to the bathroom and come back, I'm going to be lost. I know, I know. It's just like, I have to go and I have to make it like as fast as humanly possible. Yeah. So this is all really good because I'm starting to understand. It. Yeah. Right. <laughs> just, well, you, know, you can make a lot of different, you know, yeah. just keep going back. And yeah. I mean, for a lot of what I would, I'm not, this is not something I'm even be working on <laughs> for my dissertation, but like, you know, sort of the research I want to do after that, you know, this type of, like, basically having something like this, and I can go to, to you know, Greece, and I can point the next RF at, you know, mm -hmm. another artifact, and, and be able to say it's just not Greek, is, is, sure. is, is helpful. Yeah, it's yeah, helpful yeah. because there's yeah. debates on that. Like, I mean, you may be, um, are you okay with the, the at uh, no, I haven't been to my CD yet. Um, yeah. But yeah, because that's, that's one of the sites that I work at. And, yeah, yeah. Um, at my CD, you have sort of a series of these uh, finance blacks. Yeah. But there still is some debate about whether they're even made in Greece or Egypt. And, you know, I, I knew that they're probably made in Egypt, but there's a lot of But you want to source that, 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 you know, the plaque itself to see what it might be. Yeah, potentially, like, so, you know, and that's one of the things, like, it'd be nice because. My excavation that I work on with my advisor, who's requested the RxRF that she'd like to bring to do other stuff, I would really like to be like, can I borrow this for a day and shoot the one that you have? Because there's only one that's been found outside the palace, and it's in yeah. her site. Yeah. Uh, and sort of shoot that and then potentially compare that with other finance and sort of get it, you know, be able to prove either it's like, is it's Egyptian or not. Gotcha. What, and uh, what is finance exactly? Can you bring me on that? <laughs> Yeah, I can, I can Google it later, but like yeah. I've heard the term thrown around, I haven't really looked into it, but yeah. it's, how so it's formed and all that. It's, um, it's, it's a silicate, essentially. Like I think, um, I, I, I don't know a lot of the science of it, I'm used to looking at it. Let's just Google it. Yeah, it's, but I think it's essentially, it's, it's ceramic adjacent and um, it had, like the glaze on it is not actually a glaze. Like oh, a, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, it's a style. Yeah. So what I would say, so it's not a geologic mineral, it's a style. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say is this. And we're going to go into this a little bit. I think this, this is like the funnest lecture I've ever given to. <laughs> I love paleoclimatic reconstruction uh, on deep time. But, uh, in fact, I really shouldn't have done archaeology. I should have been a geologist. But um, <laughs> the thing is, is you want to know how Egypt, Egypt's geologic history and Greece's geologic history. And I'll make it simple. Greece is the product of the uplift of coastal sediments from the movement of Africa north. So in other words, those the Europe, the Europe and Africa are squeezing together. That's confined the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean used to be the biggest sea on Earth. Mm -hmm. It used to be bigger than the Pacific during Pangaea. Mm -hmm. It's the Tethys Sea, and it's shrunk down to nothing. Mm -hmm. Both Egypt and Greece are the product of that uplift. Mm -hmm. So they're covering the, the geology of the Tethys Sea, which is good because different different marine basins have different complex geochemistries that happen because that salt and water yeah. makes things possible that aren't possible in freshwater and terrestrial areas. So you end up with, uh, 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 let's see, so what you end up with is these geochemical histories and that can be how you answer questions related to place. Um, is that kind of, that kind of a deep time look. So in any case, um, but that's the idea. So, so I would argue that the most important thing you need to look at is geology, yeah. um, which is not a welcome news, I think, because you're much more interested in archaeological <laughs> Yeah. But the more you understand about the geology, you will understand how to interpret molybdenum and clay, and what that means about the environment it formed in, and then the probability that it formed in the Greece or Egypt, or something along those lines. No one in archaeology looks at it to that depth, um, typically speaking. It's almost always geologists who ask themselves these questions. But to me, understanding that formation process is going to be the absolute clue okay. to what's going on there. Okay. So, which means there's a calibration you must get if you get the 5i. And that is the mud rock calibration. Because it is calibrated for exactly that. Um, I get a lot of flack from this from archaeologists. Because archaeologists, and I'm going to talk about that when Kathy comes back here too. Cap, uh, but like, uh, 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 Brooker didn't like it either. Brooker's like, this is not this calibration, it's still a core. But you have to understand where these things come from, um, uh, and we'll kind of go into that in a little bit. So, so mud rock, we can't create it ourselves. We have to 
You, 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 need, you need these standards. And the reason why you have SAR 69. That, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that, that's, that, that, yeah, that's fine. You can certainly add them to the calibration if you'd like to, too, after the fact. The, um, the calibration that Worker has now is an updated version of Mugrock um, that's based on 40 standard, 42 standards, I think, not, not, not the original 26. Um, but I'll talk about that <laughs> why I think it's crucial to these kinds of ceramic sourcing questions. Um, it's not because ceramics uh, and clays from the earth are two different things, because they're not really. Like, obviously we had temper and salts and it starts to change the, the map. But remember, the, the XRF is measuring everything. To the XRF, a compressed clay from the geologic formation and a ceramic are the same thing. Clouds of oxygen with other things mixed in, like silicon, aluminum, and all that. So, quantitatively, you get close to the same weight percent. What's important about the Mudrock set is it's trained on the elements that can key you into paleo environments. And it's the paleo environments that can help you source within a geologic formation, let alone an entire one. And that's why I think it's essential to identify clays um, from different areas. Mm. It also helps you understand the verbs, not just the nouns, right? Because like obsidian, we don't need to consider the fact that obsidian forms from different environments. Because by definition, it's always from the same thing. A rhyolite producing volcanic eruption, right? Unless it's a tectate. Unless it's a tectate. Or I've got the salt, or let's say it's compressed ash, or something like that. Once I start talking about those different kinds, the elements aren't just passive descriptors of source, they're active descriptors about what happened to produce that rock, right? And that's the key. The more you understand about those formation processes, the better rock you're going to be in conferring from them. So with that, let's take a look at the mud rock calibration. So this is the mud rock calibration. They did what I think uh, Max Glasgow should have done, which is publish the cow in a uh, journal. So this is in chemical geology. Now what they did, yeah, I can send you this paper too if you want, because it's, 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 I think this is my favorite empirical calibration paper. Because they publish, by the way, which element, which line, their slope corrections, their background corrections, and the standards they omit. So it's the most open calibration I've ever seen. And let me tell you something even more. The people who funded this, so this to me is the most open science approach to extra analysis. They publish everything about their calibration. Everything. It's like and a they, model for exactly. And they did it at the behest of evil oil companies. <laughs> so the background of this is this calibration was not built for archaeologists. It was not even built for scientific research. It was built because oil companies made lots of money. So this the background of this is the fracking revolution. So in the United States, fracking as a technology has completely transformed our economy, right? America, back in the Bush years, we talked about energy independence all the time. How do we get independent from countries like Saudi Arabia uh, and all that? Because the, the things they do. Now, we don't talk about energy independence anymore because we are energy independent. Most of the oil used in America is produced by oil America. Like we are, we outproduce Saudi Arabia by volume now. Which is crazy, right? It's all because of fracking. Now we said with Saudi Arabia, not because we need their oil, but just because we're okay with killing journalists. Mm. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, the key thing here is, is what transformed that? Well, it has to do with the horizontal movement of pipes. So an oil company, do you guys remember, that? you guys remember watch the Simpsons episodes, Who Killed Mr. Burns? Yeah. Do you remember how like the school found oil underneath? Yeah. And then Mr. Burns built a uh, well, and it tilted sideways? <laughs> That's what fracking is. What fracking does, is the oil, they drill the pipe here, and then it goes here. Not for a few meters, but for a few kilometers. And then they can just go through the entire geologic uh, uh, deposit all along its side and yank everything out. Before, if these weren't economically to extract, because a geologic formation, if I just drill down, and I've got oil, the oil is kind of captured under the salt dome, so it's just this big pool, and I can suck it out. The fracking exists across the entire geological formation. And what they do is they drill the pipe in, they go this way, and then they pump water in. And they just break that geologic formation apart, and then the gap shakes loose and floats to the top. And then the longer they can break it apart, the more gas they can get. This was not possible 20 years ago. It's possible 10 years ago. And that led to a resurgence of the oil industry in the United States. The oil industry, though, has to know those geologic formations. They have to be able to predict where it is. Because if you drive your pipe into the wrong formation, you can break it. There's an even bigger danger. So a while back, Harry wrote, he's the lead author on this paper. He was with Bruce Kaiser, and they had a grad student measuring a core like this every 10 centimeters. And he's talking to Bruce, they're talking about, oh yeah, go ahead. 
Oh yeah, it's, it is a little chilly, isn't it? Oh, there's a heater in here. What? We were sat yesterday. See, by the way, I gotta make a comment. We all, like, so like, I, I used to be super activisty when I was in, in, in college, Greenpeace and all that. Um, we always demonize production, but we never demonize consumption. <laughs> but like what what we just did there is why we have to draw all that stuff, right? We could have just put a sweater on, guys. But um, uh, but key thing is here is that um, is that that's the process behind it all. So what drove all this change was that horizontal hor fracking. But you open yourself to vulnerability. So an example is Harry Rowe had a student. He was talking to Bruce, and the student is scanning every 10 centimeters like this with a tracer. It was the old tracer, the same tracer you guys have right now. And then the student takes, takes Harry Rowe aside and says, the, uh, there's gypsum from about one meter to one and a half meters. So Harry Rowe interrupts the conversation, gets on the phone, calls him and says, you need to add a cement cap from one meter to 1.5 meters. And the guy says, okay. Harry Rowe hangs the phone, goes over to Bruce and says, I just saved them $100 billion. <laughs> what happens is, what's gypsum made of? Does anyone know? Calcium sulfate, CaSO4. The sulfur, if the, if the gypsum, if you drill a hole, the gypsum is crumbling. If it falls in to the deposit of oil or natural gas, that sulfur will dissolve in and contaminate it. And that sulfur is now prohibited by regulation from being used because sulfur is a main pollutant for acid rain, clean air. Out. So then that entire deposit is worth zero dollars. So $100 million worth of oil is now zero because of that contamination. That's why they built this calibration. From one pipe like, going through? Like if, you, if, you, if, if I get a rock of gypsum this big to drop into a pot of oil, like that's 30 weight percent sulfur. All those sulfur atoms percolate out, and if that sulfur goes from 0.003 to 0.1, yeah, that's a pollutant hazard. That's going to create acid rain to damage environments. Yeah. So what does the cement cap do? It just blocks the gypsum. You just coat it, right? I put like a little blocker in, so that way it cannot fall in. Um, it's just like a retaining wall. So as the core, as they drill, they're pulling it out. And exactly, then the gypsum out. can't come in. So you can see, so the oil companies funded open science. Yeah. No oil company stepped in and said, we want to be the only ones who know how to do this. <laughs> they do now, though. They pay Harry a lot of money. Now that they know how important this work is. Um, but they made this open for everyone to use because everyone had the same problem. No one is invested in someone else burning a natural resource. It's like the oil fields in Iraq fighting a fire. All it does is add pollution with no economic benefit. So that's why they made this an open calibration. So they, what they did was, is when they drill these cores in, they drill in through every geologic formation on Earth, almost, right? Like the entire set of history of life on Earth is captured in one of these cores. And what they did, in each of these cores, you can guess there are a lot of money. A lot of money goes into drilling these. They take slices of each core horizon and they turn them into standards. Because each geologic event tells me something about the history of the Earth. And if I've got built the calibration for mud rock, I've built an Earth calibration for all the sediments. Now, the reasons of an archaeologist is what are our ceramics made of? These same clays. But what the point is, is they're exposed to more variation than we are. So their calibration covers a bigger element of range. And this is a free calibration, essentially, because it's been published? I mean, you still have to get the standards somehow. You can talk to Bruce, by the way. If, if you talk to Bruce, and you ask and beg, and actually what you can do is, is you get your tracer, you fly up to Bruce, and he will meet you and then you calibrate on at his house. <laughs> you'll have to, he'll talk to you for a while, but like, he will, but like that's something he does as a favor to scientists, because he yeah. likes people who are young yeah. researchers. Yeah. Incidentally, yeah. we have yes. access to a copper, yeah. to a copper standard set as well. That's great. Some yeah. of the thermal fisher guys. Oh, excellent. Green Watson. Yeah, that's wonderful. Great. Yeah. So yeah, you guys have this calibration in your units. Yeah. Right, that's what was just saying. This is used to validate. This is, you can use this for ceramics. I, I use it for geochemistry of uh, we have the price of the price. Green, yellow, and no filter with helium. Did you do it for Bruce? Yeah, good call. Bruce will help you out if you ask very nicely. I'd certainly put in a good word for you because I, I love nice and Greeks. Um, but yeah, um, but that's the key thing is, is that calibration gives you the ability to do that. So the um, that I can share with you are how we scan this. So if you have a sample, you can treat it the same way and then run it through okay, three exactly. different calibrations. But, so to, but to get the calibrations, it's not just like you enter the data from here. You have to actually visit the calibrations with actual objects. Because you're training your tube to okay. see that much. That's okay. Yep. Oh, yeah. it's a train. Okay, that makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. these are like cores then that were yeah. actually being... So these are, each of these dot points 
is a, a, sta is a standard from a geologic horizon from one core. That's what they are. So if I have my core, and I, I have a geologic horizon that's this big, it's a light gray, something like that. Have you seen pictures of these cores? Do you know what they look like? I've seen mining cores. Like they're... Here, let me see if I can do this right. Um... And so do they just take a whole bunch of them from an area? Like... Yes. And kind of average them out kind of thing? Let's see if this works, guys. I can show you an elemental map of one of these cores from data that Harry has donated before he was bought up by Pine Oil. We really have to lose this video, I'm talking too much, but, um, <laughs> but, but I have not this talked is, to Harry. This is still recording, right? Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I, I haven't talked to Harry in a couple of years because he's gotten really crazy with the contract, uh, but it's got a very strong confidentiality requirement. So I'm going to upload a spreadsheet, Dropbox, or no, it's on desktop, projects. So what, sorry, so what you're doing is just as a clarification yeah. for me, basically there are different types of calibration we've been talking about. The one that is the, the parameters is essentially, it's not uh, an object like elemental cal calibrations. So you basically are uploading sort of a formula that you're telling them how to interpret the data. Whereas these calibrations are your, your sort of training your XR, you're shooting at things and teaching it to recognize it yes. in the future. Yes, you've got it. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, that's that's, <laughs> that's, that's good. Good. So yeah, you got it. Um, <laughs> so, so like NAA and ICPNS, those are destructive methods. Yeah. And so yeah, by really dialing it in, then we can use XRF non-destructively on, yeah. on lots and lots of things. So like if you were, for example, looking for like a source of gold, like mm -hmm. you can, without the calibration, you can <clears throat> you can shoot the gold or or a diamond or a city, and you can get all of the information about it, but. Um, you can't source it because you haven't sort of taught the XR how to look for that. Whereas you can then go and be like, oh, here is the gold mine in, say, like California, here's one in Mexico, and then because the, the difference is you're not training the XRF. The XRF is only telling you what's in it. Yeah. You are training yourself in that case. This okay. is what this is characteristic. This, the, uh, the silver gold ratio in this mine yeah. matches this object. Mm -hmm. Ergo, I can make an argument. The problem with gold is that they remelt it because it's valuable, and yeah, so you end up with those yeah. problems. But yeah, in that case, you've got it. This is an example of a core, by the way. Um, this is a map from a tracer, by the way. They took a tracer and they measured every 100 microns and just moved it back and forth. So this is an <laughs> elemental map of the core. So this is what the x ray would kind of see, right? So you can imagine, pretend, for example, this is a gypsum layer. Well, you can see why capping right there can save you all that money. Maybe this is the clay I don't want. Maybe this is the formation that has the oil and I can target it that way. So that's how they use this for that. Um, it, it's basically that idea. That's why this calibration was made. It was made to interpret the history of the Earth. And then I can grab a different element. Let's grab iron. Plot. There, and then I can see with iron, I've got these flecks of iron. That's iron pyrite. Maybe the iron pyrite can hurt my equipment, so I need to change my process and chop up the core so I don't damage my pipe, right? There's all kinds of ways to get this information. And then I made it so you can plug your mouse over and see what it is. You can also add one of my cloudkill dot plot files, and it'll calibrate this so I can see the weight percent of each pixel um, as well. Um, this, is, this is my favorite app, but no one uses it. It's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, so what does the data look like? Is it a, is it a raster? Is it like this is a, no, this is vector. It's like points? Well, sorry, this is a raster, yeah. It's a, I, 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 I raster the <coughs> elemental data. So it's coming in with like X Y with a value. Exactly, you've got it, you've got it. Exactly, exactly. So I also, yeah, you've got it. So yeah, anyway. Um, and I've written this for the tracer, so that way you can upload data from the tracer. If you measure the grid, you name it a specific way, it can infer from the file name the, the coordinates of that. So for example, if you want to do a whole palace, a Mycenaean palace, you could do that. Go over to Mycenae and measure every quarter meter or whatever increment you want. You create a map of that floor. We did this at Shadow Hoyo for Eden Potter. Um, worked really well because we could actually measure. We did it there so we could measure contamination that was damaging things. But you can also do it for living surfaces for phosphorus, for example. Yeah. So um, we had the opportunity to meet with Bruce for that underground calibration, mm -hmm. but Bruce provides one that's mm -hmm. apart from that one, or it's the same thing. It's so the one you did with Brooke, with, with Bruce has the forty standards full. Um, the one Brooker had at the time you purchased the unit was the was the one that's in this paper, which is twenty six standards. 
That said, Brooker has bought the same one Bruce has. It's the, we call it Mudrock 2. And so it doubles the number. And it actually vastly improves. Let me show you the calibration curves from it real quick, actually. And then there's another paper, 2015, Hunt and Speakman, yeah. where they provide a critique yes. of Brooker's Mudrock. Yes, they do. Um, yeah, they absolutely do. I've got strong opinions about that paper and their argument, but uh, that's okay. People can disagree. So this is another one that you will probably want to look at just as background. And you can just type in Speakman Mudrock in Google, and this will be your first yeah. they're, 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 These These kind of papers aren't really hidden. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are available. You're going to have to have a lot of very sign in. What is Mudrock? Exactly what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. It's like a it's like a compressed wet mud uh, that's in a geologic formation. Okay. Um, they they dehydrate it before they measure before they make the pucks, so it's still a dry yeah, pup. They, and they're still in those little discs, those like those compressed pellet discs, but it's compressed mud rock. Yeah, and and, and the tan mud rock is is how geologists refer to it. There's sand, there's siltstone, there's it refers to some of the mineralogical properties okay. of, of the stuff. So the ones that first had are in these big pucks that all stick together in these big long things and we just took them out of the time yeah. and scanned them. And they're brown, red, yellow, they're all different types of colors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let me go to desktop projects, tracers. So is it like siltstone or different? Um, like what would a geologist call it? Mud, mud rock. Thing. Yeah, that's, that's that is they a actually call that, it But that's like the slang term. It's not like mm -hmm. It's sort of like when you're talking about something, it's, oh, it's a mud rock. That's, okay. that's what it's named after. Um, but they're really fine. Right. But here's the calibration curve from that mud rock set. So here's iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, gallium, selenium, arsenic, selenium. So the reason why I like it for ceramics is it cap these are these are elements you can source with, with ceramics. Selenium and gallium. So it captures those better than a soil cal does. Because the soil cal doesn't have enough of these to make a calibration curve. So because the mud rocks have all this, they're selected for aerolithic variability, it makes a good general calibration for silicates, in my opinion. If I take a soil, compress it, and then measure it with a mud rock, I still get very, very good results. And they're reproducible empirical results. As long as your sample is a compressed silicate that's made of mostly oxygen, mud rock will do a good job of capturing its elemental variability. That's 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 the rationale behind it. So that's why I like it the best. Um, people disagree with me, but if you're trying to capture a lot of exotic elements that show up in these that can be sourceable, this to me gives you the best platform. You can pay Brooker to do this, or you can ask Bruce very nicely. Um, it'll cost you, I think, four thousand for the two phase. Um, whereas I think the plane ticket to Salt Lake City in a couple days <laughs> can also work too. But that could be a way to save it. If I had a choice between really begging Bruce to measure his standards and getting the five G. Or getting the 5i with the Brooker supplied mud rock, I would probably go with the 5G plus asking Bruce really nicely. Um, that said, if you ever need to get your, your machine repaired, Brooker will recalibrate it for you. Whereas uh, if you've bought the calibration for the first time, whereas you have to ask Bruce nicely again. Well, I the salt during the season. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Two birds with one stone. Well, like, I don't know if I would be able to buy one of these anytime soon. But. <laughs> the mud rock, look at its calculator for minute. It's actually hitting that obsidian level of good, too. That's really nice. Yeah, that's the strontium. By the way, you'll notice here, look how high the strontium goes. It goes up to 3%. That's important because I've actually seen this in ceramics. In the sourcing project I'm working with, the University of Chicago, Acamid Persian tablets from Susa have up to 1% strontium in them. So you actually have to have that much variation in these. Whereas a normal ceramics cow would miss that. But that right there is super sourceable, right? Like it's geologically weird. That's the problem. When you do find something sourceable, the problem I see people have is that their calibration is too narrowly defined. For the normal case, they miss the exceptional ones that are sourceable. So that's why you want to make sure you do it this way. Uh, zirconium. It's like predictive model. Yeah, yeah. Can I show you something too, by the way? I learned this. When I build my calibration curves, do you see how these two are weird? That's because the standards got switched. This one goes here, that one goes there. So in my calibration plots, you can actually see when someone gets confused and puts one standard on before the other. Um, because they always create this T-shape with the calculation with the, with the validation slope. Um, yeah, anyway, because you can draw a little square around it, right? Whenever you can do that between points, 
the most likely explanation is that the standards got swapped. And you'll see it on multiple calibration curves. So I can see it there too. Huh? What's with the wavy line? That's the calibration curve. Uh, so that I wrote the, I wrote the algorithm to not do a linear regression, but to do a loss curve. If the loss curve is straight, I know I've done very good slope and intercept corrections. If it gets wavy, I know I need a lot more work. That's the reason. I did it as a visual cue to I need to work on the calibration more. Mm -hmm. Although in this case, I think it's because ICPMS is not great for Niobe, which is one of the reasons why they use NEA for that. The problem with Mudrock is they didn't do NEA, they only did ICPMS. So any elements that are bad with ICPMS, like Niobe, aren't going to be as strong. Elements like rubidium that it does work on are going to be solved. It's the inter it's it's it's, it's uh, on the on the itrium K beta too, and we use the yellow filter. Yeah, and we, and this is with the yellow filter, so that Brumstrom is contributing a lot more too. Right. It's huge right there. If you use the green filter, it looks a lot better. Um, the, the gray and our shiny is that the, uh, like a two standard deviation? It's a uh, this is a ninety five percent confidence band uh, based on the regression model. This is based on loss. This is based on linear regression. But yeah, it's a ninety five percent confidence. It, I'm using GD plot step smooth method LM here. And then here I just default to loss. So, yeah. But anyway, the reason I do that is because what I learned quickly in building cows <coughs> is when you look at the cow, if the calibration curve is straight, you've got a really good cow. If it's slopey like this, that means I need to take my spectrum with a different parameter or do something else. <laughs> um, so I did that as a visual cue for me to know what I'm looking at. But in any case, the key point here is that Menorah 2 is really good. You should use it. For these kinds of things. Um, and uh, the, uh, Harry Rowe did a phenomenal job of validating it. So what they did to validate it is they took cores and they measured the cores using Whitman dispersive x rock destructively and then they ran it with the tracer. So in this case, the Rooker tracer is the black line and the WDXRF is the red line. And look at that agreement with the handheld in the laboratory. And so they did this because then they can scan it pretty quickly as they come out. So anyway, long story short, the mud rock is very well validated for clay horizons. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'd like to do is, well, we might do a late lunch today. Is that okay? Yeah, we got I'd like to, snacks. oh, perfect, <laughs> great. What I'd like to do is I'd like to do a deep dive into what the elements mean. Because I think this will be useful to any of you who do anything other than obsidian. Do you guys anticipate using Cure Tracer for more than just obsidian? I don't know if it's a... Hey, what settlement? Yeah, I came on stratigraphy. Let me give you an example of how that can work. I think it is Nutritious Improvements. I have too many things open, so I'm paying that critical mass. <laughs> uh, I lose everything. You may, you may use it um, in Mexico on um, anthropogenic surface layers as opposed to just geological surface layers. Awesome. Cool. This is from Chocolate Canyon in New Mexico, unpublished. I really need to get out of this. But here we took a profile of the Arroyo Bank. And this, by the way, this right here is what we think is the drought at, uh, during the end of the Middle War period that led to the abandonment of Chocolate Canyon. Because we find the, the classic phase ceramics right down here. And they disappear here. And then can you see the kind of flow lines here? You can see where the Arroyo was. So where's the drought then? You see where the lines drop there? So nothing, there's no lines. Yeah, so what we what we looked at was cal strontium calcium ratio. This is a proxy for evaporation. So in other words, what happens is calcium and strontium behave similarly, right? They both have two valence electrons because calcium is right above strontium in the periodic table. So two outer valence electrons for binding, so they behave similarly. And they have similar ionic radiuses, which in other words means they're about the same size chemically. Which is why we take up so much strontium in our bones. You've heard of strontium isotope sourcing uh, in your ecological work? That's because our bones take up strontium. Because when our body digests something, it doesn't say, I want calcium. It says, I want an atom of two outer valence electrons and an ionic radius of one. And you grab that. That's strontium as well as calcium. T typically speaking, if I'm doing ocean studies, the ratio of calcium and strontium, and also of magnesium and calcium, is a proxy for temperature. The warmer the temperature, the less costly it is to incorporate strontium. When I, so have you heard of C2, C3, and C4 plant? Or you know about carbon? Let's do carbon-14, right? Carbon-14 dating is central in archaeology. We all know how it works, right? Why does the plant take up carbon-14? 
Well, it's just carbon, right? It reacts all the same way. But does it take up carbon-14 as easily as it takes up carbon-12? No. Which one weighs more? 14. 14. Which one costs more metabolically to move through the system? 14. 14. So there's a kinetic cost to incorporating carbon-14. We can actually mathematically model this. For every atom of carbon-12 you take in, you will take in, or for every, let me get this right, the carbon-14 so what it is, is if you take up 10 atoms of carbon-12, you, you will take up only 8 of carbon-14, because there's a cost to taking in the carbon-14. The same is true for strontium isotopes relative to calcium. The strontium weighs more, so it costs more to move in. It's like, you know how salmon go up a river, up a waterfall? Skinny salmon do better than fat salmon, because they have less mass to move. In other words, gravity forces kinetic fractionation. It's kind of it's complicated, but the reason we have isotopic ratios at heart is because not all isotopes behave equally. There's a difference in abundance, there's also a difference in how we take them up. And that's called fractionation, when you start losing it. Well, which one weighs more, calcium or strontium? Sure. So if I have water evaporating, is calcium or strontium more likely to go into the air? Strontium. No, into the air, calcium. Exactly right, because yeah. calcium is lighter. <laughs> so, Atom for atom, whatever my starting ratio is, it will start to tilt when I have evaporation. And that's why you see these that happen with the lines. As I have a water event, there's more evaporation of calcium relative to strontium. So strontium increases relative to calcium the more water is exiting the system. You can use this to calculate the water that had to be there if you know what the parent calcium-strontium ratio is, by the way. What happens here, we call this the strontium bowl, is that evaporation stops. And that's the drought. If there's no water, the calcium strontium ratio is what it was originally. When water is added, you start losing that calcium relative to it. So that's an example of geochemistry. We can calculate if we have a, if, if I can prove that all these sediments have the same background chemistry, which fortunately in a place like Chaco it's pretty easy because we know the geologic formations. We can actually model what is being lost from the system over the pro with the process of evaporation. This is what we call a proxy, a climatic proxy. We can kind of estimate the movement in the system based on the effect it has. How about like erosion of stuff into the system? Like You'd use rubidium. Rubidium strontium is what people typically use because the rubidium is highly variable in rocks and the strontium seems to be confined, be, produced, be, be kind of maintained by benthic systems, in other words, plankton. In a water system, you can measure it that way. If it's a regular system, let's say it's a terrestrial, sands are mixing in, you would use different proxies for that. But let's go over these systematically um, and talk about what it is that happens in this process. So let's see, I want to open up Salt Lake City Talk. There it is. This is my favorite presentation I've ever given, by the way. <laughs> this topic is so fun to talk, to talk about. All right, so we're gonna talk about the analysis. I call it core analysis, but it's really geochemical analysis. And it all begins with physics and then chemistry. So we want to put on our physics hats on first and then think about what chemistry does with those physics. So here's the periodic table, right? The key to understanding how to interpret data from either sedimentological sequences, cores, or ceramics is understanding why the periodic table is the way it is. So if you look at the periodic table and I ask you, why is strontium taken up by bones? And why do we incorporate strontium in our bones? Looking at it, can you tell me, based on the periodic table, why that happens? Where's strontium? It's very full of calcium. So it behaves the same way. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you another question. Why is arsenic poisonous? It's simple as AS. Yes. So it's, what's it below? Yeah. Phosphorus. Does our body need phosphorus? What happens when arsenic enters our body? What does it try to do? It <laughs> like phosphorus. So, do you know where your energy in your body comes from? It's adenium triphosphate. What happens is the way your body makes energy is you got adenium triphosphate. So, you, when you eat food, one of the products of all that food is adenium triphosphate. That goes into your mitochondria, and then your mitochondria split a phosphorus off. So, it becomes adenium diphosphate. That process releases energy, and that's the energy that power your muscle movements, your thoughts, all that. If you put arsenic in your body, 
Guess what starts to happen? Guess what system starts to break down? It's not a system you want to break down. It's sort of the equivalent of pouring water into your gasoline tank. <laughs> like, it's a liquid. Your car is going to use it like it was gasoline, but it's not going to behave like gasoline, and your car won't work great. Um, and that's the reason why it can kill you. Why is lead bad for us? Where is PB on the periodic table? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. What's at the top of that column? Carbon. Carbon. So what does lead do? Well, it can start making similar binds. Your body needs carbon, right? So, no, it's not like it's any triphosphate. It doesn't go into a critical part of your body that's specialized the way phosphorus does. It just kind of ends up in random places. The problem is your body can't get rid of lead. It just stays there. It it's sort of like I, I have a well-oiled machine and I put in a gear that's way too heavy, so it doesn't move at the same speed. So then things start by breaking up. And that's one of the things you see with lead poisoning, legionnaire's disease. You typically see people start to have poor cognitive functions. They tend to commit more crimes. Um, there's an argument. Have you heard about the, the, the argument for why crime dropped in the 1990s? Unlike that, yes. Yeah, it, before in the 19, like before, about what was it, 1976? Gasoline had lots of lead in it. They unleaded it by legislation, and so there's a generation of children who weren't sprayed in the face by lead every time a car passed by. And when those kids got to be in their 20s, they committed far fewer crimes. And so the crime, the crime rate dropped and plummeted. They, in New York, they were like, oh, this is the success of stop and frisk policies. But it isn't. It happened in every city. <laughs> Not all cities have the same policies. You know, uh, Freakonomics, they, had a, they talked about this, and they, they attributed to Roe v. Wade. Yeah, I, I disagree with them I, I disagree with them entirely because you don't actually see that big. There was a lot of abortions happening before Roe v. Wade. They just weren't happening legally. Um, I don't like their argument because it's a direct, it's a correlation argument. Uh, the lead argument is causative. We know what lead does to the brain. We know that people who eat lead paint are more likely to commit crimes. Um, there's a there's an established causative relationship to it. Um, so I, I'm much more persuaded by that data. And it's systematic. Everyone is affected. Well, we can't go and prove that every person who robbed a store in 1993 did it because their mother didn't want to have them in 1973. We do know that a kid who was born in 1973 was exposed to magnitudes of order more lead, so and that the lead <coughs> causes, causes changes in risk perception. They're, they're still using loaded gas in the year 2000 when I was there. <laughs> So you can actually test that. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, you can. Countries. Well, yeah. It, 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 does all Latin America? Uh, is that the only? Yeah, Libya had it. I mean, it, it caused problems for uh, for what's yeah. that called the like, fuel injection. Oh yeah, I like, see. Like, modify your car. Yeah, that's true. There's a reason people didn't want to do it because um, mm -hmm. it did. It, 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 it is not a cost-free change. So yeah, what was it? it was like lead try and methylate or something? I can't remember. But, but it's yeah. stupid, right? It just goose the performance. Yeah, you didn't need to do it. Yeah. There was there was an argument that I think I this is you can look this up. There's a scientist who worked for the oil industry who developed trimethyl lead. Um, he also did something else that was super dangerous. Like he's he's argued to be the worst scientist in history, <laughs> or the most harmful scientist in history. Because everything he worked on led to public health crises in his career. And I think he died because his blanket caught fire and he burned alive um, because of a regulatory failure. There's something funny about that. Look it up. I, I don't want to misrepresent it. It's a, but it's a funny, it's, it's an apocryphal story, but that's the core of it. Is, yeah, like one, one, one industry scientist caused so much damage. Because, um, like, lead is, yeah, like, lead is bad stuff because it comes to what? Basically, arsenic takes over a key body process and kills you. Lead builds up your body processes and turns you into Donald Trump. Um, it just, it, it has these longer term effects on your cognition and your impulsiveness and all that because it doesn't hit a critical body function. Not just cheeseburgers. No, it's not just cheeseburgers. Oh, like, depends on what the cheeseburgers are made, I guess, but yeah. But in any case, but what we're talking about here is the core of understanding the periodic table. Do you remember the story about how Dmitry of Mendeleev predicted the properties of an element that didn't exist yet at this time. You could predict how much it weighed, what its chemical properties were. That was germanium. It's between silicon, tin, lead, carbon. He understood how it could bind and all these properties before it was discovered because he knew how to organize all these elements. And the way they're organized is one valence electron, two valence electrons, three valence electrons, four valence electrons. These guys get heavy and form a new geometry of those. 
And actually, do you see how it drops in here like this by two? It's actually the same here. The true periodic table, was, yeah, so let's, if we come over here, the true periodic table, I forgot the order of all this, because I worked really hard to do this. So you see how this drops in by two? Exclude these, because these are a separate branch. But these two, and then these guys form one table. This forms a subtable. And then you only see this broken out. This is what happens. This is what it really looks like. It's another drop that's the same way. And if we find a new row, it's going to drop again if we keep creating synthetic elements. That's the periodicity of it. Um, but that's what's happening in the background. That's what the table looks like. So what you do is, is each of these blocks you can compare. Then within this block, there's a set of behaviors. And then within this block, there's a set of behaviors. I hope that makes sense, but that's kind of the big picture. But anyway, let's focus in on each class to understand what's going on. Class 1 elements. By the way, what I want to do is I want to make a horoscope, and instead of giving you like Aries or Leo, I'm going to give you what element class you're in. You're <laughs> super volatile, reactive, <laughs> but you're ready to form permanent bonds. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, but that's what happens. These all behave with each other, by the way. Typically speaking, when I run my machine learning stuff, I'll find that rubidium can be predicted by potassium if I don't have 40 kPb. I find that sodium can be predicted by potassium plus rubidium if I don't have light elements. You can actually predict the relationships here because of long-term geologic processes, where you find one, you typically find others. So that's class one elements. They've got one element for binding. That's, by the way, like sodium. Do you want to throw a brick of sodium in, a, in, in your water glass to cool it down? What happens? It explodes. It explodes violently because that sodium wants to combine with every oxygen molecule in there, and it wants to push up the hydrogen. So that's class one elements, super reactive. And what was the magic number they tried to get to? Does anyone remember from chemistry? Eight. eight. So they're trying to get to eight. So <coughs> class two elements. These have two valence electrons. They're also tend they tend to be basic. Why are they basic? Well, because they don't have one valence electron, like hydrogen. By the way, what is pH? What does pH mean? It's acidic. Well, it's acidic. What does acidic mean? I, I'm going to give you a simple mnemonic yes. device. pH, percent, hydrogen. How much mm -hmm. hydrogen that's free and available for binding determines how acidic it is. Acidic is very reactive because hydrogen is very reactive. Basic has a different number of electrons, and so it behaves a little differently. Um, but yeah, but that's what we have here. These all behave each other. When you have one, you have all. So for example, if I have a lot of barium, I will often have a lot of strontium. If I have a lot of strontium, I will certainly have calcium. If I have calcium, I certainly have mag magnesium, and on and on and on. That's why these guys form the compounds that they do, and they tend to form in groups. And you can use the ratios of these with each other to understand kinetic events. The same that you can do with the class one elements, because if these all start off, now what happens is, is calcium is the most common, followed by magnesium, followed by strontium, followed by barium. If I know that there are, ten, there are 100 atoms of calcium for every one of strontium, and that's my starting system, deviations from that tell me if something happened to take away calcium or add calcium. And that's how I can infer heat or water or some other property of that material. So that's what these guys are doing. So, you can, so it's accurate to say that they occur together just yeah. because they behave similarly. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's fit. right. They fit. Especially calcium and strontium. They have similar ionic radiuses. Barium has a bigger ionic radius, or I think it's got, it's got a smaller ionic radius. Don't quote me on that. I need to look it up. But um, because it's heavier. And the heavier, the more protons you have, the more the electrons cluster in closer. So when that ionic radius shrinks down, it behaves a little differently. Magnesium behaves a little differently, too, because it's bigger. Um, but yeah, um, but that's the idea behind it all. So, in any case, they behave, oh, oh, the other one that behaves kind of similar is beryllium. Do you remember what your XRF uh, detector window is made of in the Tracer 5i on this guy? Beryllium. Beryllium, it's a beryllium window. So you have an idea of some of, you know some of beryllium's properties from that information, right? Um, by the way, um, beryllium is fatally toxic to 15% of humans and fine for the other 85%, and no one knows why. <laughs> So if your beryllium window vaporizes for some reason, <laughs> like nine out of ten of you are probably going to be fine. Um, but anyway, um, so that's the class two elements. Where's graphene? That would be carbon. Class four. Now four 
has four bonds, right? So if I have four bonds, I can put a carbon in each of those bonds. And if I can cap it out, that forms a perfect crystal. That's one out of fit. And that's why carbon behaves the way it does. All right. Transition metals. These guys, as they gain mass, they tend to lose reactivity. But the properties tend to be shared down the columns. So typically speaking, even the, the rules we have out for classes follow the same rules here. So I'm going to give you an example. What is the most valuable element on this list? Traditionally. Nickel? No. If I'm, if I'm a Mycenaean Greek, which one of these is oh, most valuable? It's going to be gold. It's going to be gold, right? Yeah. What's, what's the next most valuable? And then after that, what, what do you notice? Uh, they're all in they're all end up. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that before? They all behave similarly to each other. What is the property gold has that is so attractive to people? It doesn't um, degrade. Uh, doesn't degrade. Well, but why is silver attractive? There's some, there's some, silver degrades very readily, yeah. right? What is it that gold and silver have in common that make people value them? They're valuable. Yeah, they're valuable, but, you know, they're other things are valuable. <laughs> what can't... So, Sorry, let, that was my original no, test, but no, that's not no, right. no, you're absolutely, you are absolutely <laughs> right. They're shiny. <laughs> Let's go back to, we talked, remember yesterday with primates when we talked about our cone cells? How all of our perception of art ultimately boils down to seeing red fruits and green trees? What would, why would shiny be important to human ancestors? Well, look, we have to see a lot of other things too. But I mean, it stands out. It stands out. But why? What about it stands out to something else that would be a stressor for our? So we needed to find fruit and trees. That's why we were grabbing the red. Why would we? Why would we be attracted to shiny? Water. What does water look like on the horizon when you're thirsty? That glimmer, right? So, I, like, this is pure speculation. But like. That's why all those elements in that column, that's the property they have with visible light. The visible light that we shine down from the sun reflects off them in a very specific glimmer. So then what's growing genium? This is invented as of two years ago in a laboratory. Okay. But can you guess some of its properties? Is Before it came, it's radioactively. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and by the way, do you know who this is named after? Rookin. He's like the what did he discover? Uh, X-rays? X-rays. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, so they named the type of gold you can only see with X-rays after him. So anyway, yeah, um, but yeah, but that's the core of that column. Um, some of them have more economic ability. Copper is, at least to an ancient society, more economically useful than gold. Um, but it's still kind of a precious metal because it still has that glimmer. To visible light, if we lived on a different planet, where infrared substituted for visible light, we might find that zinc and cadmium are more valuable because they shine just right. Right? There's, these properties are based on our perceptions of nature, um, but they're not unique to them. They're not special. It's just that configuration of atoms has that configured reaction with light. By the way, the other thing, there's one other way that gold differs and copper differ from every other element on here. What is it? What color are they? What color are they to visible light? Is copper. So, what color is titanium? It's silvery. White. What color is rhodium? Silver. It's kind of a metallic. Yeah. Right. What color is iron? It's like silvery, yeah. What color is pure cobalt? Blue. No. The, the oxide is blue. Yeah, it's the same. <laughs> but the metal mm -hmm. is that. They're all grays. They're yeah. all boring grays. All of them, without exception. They're all boring grays. Except because they react with visible light, especially. So that's the key behind it. Now there's another spectrum, ultraviolet. Maybe uh, maybe uh, iridium goes crazy and looks beautiful, like a beautiful purple or something. I don't know. But the point is, is our eyes were evolved for this range of light, and that range of light interacts with those guys in a special way. And that's it. That's the basis of our economy. <laughs> for, 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 for the entirety of written history, that is our economy, is the shiny stuff and visible light. But the core point that I want you to understand here is not necessarily that, but for example, this right here is probably more insightful. Do our bodies need zinc? Yes. So what becomes poisonous? <laughs> so tell me, do our bodies need iron? Yeah. Yes. Is this good for you? Yeah, I'm guessing not. There you go, very good. Because, what would it mimic? 
iron. Is niobium in that for you? Do you need this new guy? Do you need a vitamin with vanadium in it? No, you don't. So niobium doesn't affect your body because your body can't use it. The key point here is the toxic elements did nothing wrong. It's not their fault. It's our fault. We're the ones who are so sensitive to zinc that we confuse cadmium with zinc and create that pathway of ionic. So that's the key. But the core thing to remember is the columns are essential. Next column. Class three elements. These elements have low reactivity and they're very stable. So that's the key thing to remember about these. In geochemistry, by the way, when you do ratios, this should guide your ratios. These stable elements are good things to ratio to. The only two here you will be able to ratio to, at least with current XRF technology, are these guys, aluminum and gallium. In paleoclimatic studies, aluminum is the most frequent denominator for elemental ratios. Aluminum. So if I want to understand, so for example, let's go back to your hypothetical of, do I have a new sediment coming in? Well, my sediment is going to have aluminum and silicon. The ratio of silicon to aluminum could tell me changes in sedimentation source. Because the chance that the ratio of the aluminum and silicon in two different geologic horizons is not very good. So that ratio can tell me that difference. But I would do that because I know aluminum is stable. It's not going to react with anything locally. There's no chemical process in temperature or climate that's going to change the aluminum that I have. So it's inert. It's like gold, basically, uh, in terms of metallurgy. So aluminum is a good denominator for that. By the way, can you predict which one of these elements is in all of your pop cans and beer cans? If you don't believe me, we can try it out later. We can try it out now. What am I saying? What am I saying? <laughs> here, let's come over here. Let's open up our taps. Device connect. Does anyone have an aluminum back iPhone? I guess it'd be my computer, but maybe. Let me. I'll just, I'll just use my computer. I know this is aluminum. I haven't measured it yet though, so I'm going to do 40 kph, I'm going to do 10 microamps, I'm going to do the titanium filter. I'm going to do this for only 10 seconds. Measurement method. It'll automatically turn the extra beam off. We can disable that. Purpose of gallium in here? It's just a filler it's to a make up to the aluminum. No, apple never meant for it to be there in the first place. It came with what? Just comes out and whip. Okay. So the ratio of gallium to aluminum could be a sourcer. And by the way, just to highlight this, you don't read about gallium at all in the archaeological literature, but. The mud rock two set. It's in the obsidian calibration too. It is, but it's not a good curve. Yeah, right? it's terrible. It's right. terrible. It's the worst one. Yeah, this one is a much better gallium curve. That's it still has some problems, but yeah. They're L lines, right? K lines. L lines? It fluoresces right by zinc. Oh, okay. And the, yeah, uh, but anyway, uh, by the way, the other thing you need to do a correction for gallium is lead, because one of the one of the lead lines overlaps a little bit with it, so um, that can cause problems too. But anyway, that's gallium. So it comes along for the ride with aluminum, always, almost without exception. I don't think we have an aluminum production that's capable of eliminating all the gallium in a little bit of alloy. Would you want to? I mean, uh, it depends on the, what purity you need. If I'm curing a silicon chip on an aluminum plate to make a computer chip, that gallium can be important because it has different thermal thermal rate. So if I have more gallium, its thermal properties might cause a little ripple. Um, that causes the, the crystal to crack. So it actually can become important to have these things pure, um, especially the level at which we produce things. So coming back here, let's come to the class four elements. This is the important stuff, right? 
So with four valence electrons, these guys are the most flexible in forming chemical bonds. They're sort of happy with any circumstance. They're like that person who doesn't get, get stressed out in life, everything works out great, <laughs> fine with all these other things. So, and by the way, notice, for example, on Earth, what is the basis? What is the element that unites all life on Earth? What is the most common? What is the element here that unites almost all geology? What is the element here that unites almost all Bronze Age metallurgy? <laughs> Do you notice the thing? These form the basis for that. By the way, now you understand why tin is so important in the Bronze Age, right? Because it forms such stable connections that it hardens the metal to make it usable. And lead is used as a flux to help make things work too. So each of these is super important. What, can, what does that tell you about germanium? Do you think germanium is valuable? So here's the thing. Germanium is one of the most valuable elements on the planet you can get right now for two reasons. The first, it behaves like silicon in computer chips, it makes a semiconductor, but it operates at different temperature thresholds. So if I'm making a flying robot that goes in space and kills people, it will operate more stably if I have germanium in that chip. For satellites, it can be super important too. Second, it's strategic metal. Um, so in other words, it's important to national security. And third, almost all of it is in China. <laughs> so if you can find germanium in the US, buy that land. Like I said, I know of one lithic source that has a lot of germanium in it that's economically viable. But I also know where it comes from, and I won't publish it or buy it or anything because I don't want to hurt the stuff there. But um, but yeah, but it can, it is super valuable. Um, it is useful stuff. But Dmitry Mendeleev knew that when he made his periodic table. This was the element that was missing. This is the one he could predict almost all of its properties before it was discovered. All right. Interesting that arsenic is right next to it because yeah. arsenic is the other bronze ingredient in East and South America. Yeah. Absolutely, and in, 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 in Peru too, arsenic yeah, bronze. You actually see a lot of it in the old world, but I think the new world understood why arsenic was important. I don't think the old world understood why it was important because they had tin and they could get cut right to the chase. But yeah, um, good insight, good insight. Um, Antimony can do something similar too in modern metals, and that's why they use that in the alloys. Mm -hmm. But yeah, class 5 elements. These guys really change their reactivity based on their weight. But, same deal, um, uh, they, react, they readily react in the biosphere. Do you guys remember the paper from 2010 that if people were convinced that arsenic could substitute for phosphorus in life? But, like, NASA had a press release, everyone thought it was going to be aliens, but it was like, we got a life that's dependent on arsenic. And what they found was that life wasn't they thought it was replacing phosphorus, so it could make DNA with arsenic, for example. Turned out to not be the case. It could just handle a lot of arsenic in its system and not die. But the reason is because its chemistry changed how it treats phosphorus. Um, ours can't do that, so we don't do so well if there's a lot of arsenic in our system. Um, by the way, arsenic, I have eaten so much arsenic, it's not even funny. Um, before I did archaeology, I used to eat dinosaurs. And do you know how you find a dinosaur bone? What do you do? You lick it. You lick it. It's 16 times, right? So I found like 40 dinosaurs in my hometown of Thermopolis, Wyoming. I licked a lot of rocks. One of the sites is actually called LLT, or we lick this. Mm -hmm. um, after I did all this work and measuring and finding all these dinosaurs, I grew up, learned how to use x-ray fluorescence, and I thought, well, hey, what's in all those dinosaur bones I was looking for during my childhood? Yeah. There's lead, there's arsenic, there's uranium, and there's thorium. Great. So <laughs> lots of nasty stuff. Yeah, but anyway, um, arsenic, your body can accommodate a little bit of it if you're exposed to too much of it. Uh, Mithridates famously did that. Um, uh, uh, can you that mm -hmm. can we sit in for a bit? Yeah. So, in any case, these guys have those properties. Yeah. Alright, and then the last group of elements, class six elements. These guys, again, become more and more reactive. Oxygen, as you know, is super reactive. Sulfur is reactive. By the way, for ceramic sourcing, these two are super important. In geochemical environments, I'll talk about it a little more later, but in certain geochemistries, well, let's just jump to it right now. If I have oxygen, so there's lots of oxygen in ocean waters, right? One of the big chemical transformations that happens in ocean basins is that oxygen leaves, oh, by the way, sand machine. Um, where's my backpack? Over here. Is there another pen? Great. Just supposed to keep track 
of all this. Anyway, um, so with these guys, I have oxygen in the system, and oxygen leaves the system. Metals that are soluble in water with oxygen bonds become insoluble with sulfur bonds. Why would sulfur replace oxygen? Same reason everything else, right? It has a similar number of valence electrons, six, and binds in a similar way. So what happens is, is let's, have you heard the statistic that there's more, that there's a ton of uranium in the ocean to get to almost mine it? Um, because uranium is soluble in water if it has oxygen. If uranium combines with sulfur, it precipitates out. And so if I see a sudden spike in uranium in my ocean waters, that tells me there's no oxygen. So that, so for example, if you have an anoxic basin that formed in Egypt 200 million years ago, when it was in the, in the, in the, in the Panthalassic Ocean, um, and then you had a uh, anoxic event, then you would see a spike in uranium. If Greece didn't have that anoxic event, you would just see limestone. And so that would tell you, aha, I know what I'm looking at. You can open up a geologic map and see where are people looking for oil. Because that will be, tend to fall where the uranium is. By the way, you hear about how fracking is radioactive, you might have read this in the news. It's because of uranium precipitating out when you have these events. So, in any case, but that's all these guys here. It's also one of the reasons why polonium is so nasty, because our body can start to incorporate it in our tissues if we ingest it. Um, so it's not just radioactive that hurts you, but you'll, it'll get stuck in your tissues, and then uh, you're, you're, you're not in a good way. So... That's what the, the poison is the, the Yeah. The Russian agent, 2007. That's how you know that that was meant to send a message. They wanted it to be in the news because they used that specific poison. If you really want to take someone out, what you use is you use potassium chloride and you inject it in their bloodstream, and that equalizes the nerve ending cha sodium potassium channels, and they just die silently without pain. And then it's very hard to trace. Anyway, um, <laughs> <not anybody. laughs> so point is that Putin wanted that to be quiet, but it made it quiet. But anything you read in the news, Putin killed so and so, they want you to know. Well, there were thallium sort of that. Yeah, thallium can be real nasty too. Um, the other, the, uh, but then the nerve agent they use, right? You notice how they always use something different to get it in the news? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for that. New poisoning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, so class seven elements, the halogens. These guys are super, super, super reactive, right? They're just like the, they're like the bizarre versions of the class one elements. By the way, fluorine can catch anything on fire, anything. If you spray liquid hot fluorine onto ice, the ice will catch fire, because fluorine will outcompete the oxygen for the hydrogen. Um, it's nuts what it can do. Chlorine, but uh, by the way, as you move down, reactivity slows a ton, because reactivity is, weight, is relative to the atomic weight of the material as well. So chlorine, it's still very reactive, very explosive, but not nearly as bad as fluorine. Bromine, same deal. Iodine, it actually can be beneficial for our bodies. I read somewhere, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the more iodine you have in your diet when you're a child, your IQ can actually increase um, because of changes in the sodium potassium channels in your body. Um, there's actually a proposal to intentionally put iodine in, in water like fluorine. Um, that upsets a lot of people when you start doing that to water, but... Um, That's in but, salt. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's an essential salt that your body needs. They put but, it in salt because of... Iodine deficient areas like um, Afghanistan. Yeah. They, were, yeah. they really noticed that. But use, using salt as a vehicle to introduce just a tiny bit of that. Exactly. Another interesting finding is that uh, this is actually relevant to the western states. There's more lithium that occurs naturally in the waters on the east coast than the west coast based on geology. And lithium is an antidepressant. When you actually look at suicide rates, suicide rates per capita are higher in the, in, in the west of the United States than the east and they attribute that to lithium. And so there's a proposal to add lithium to water in California and Colorado and all that. It's interesting, right? Um, but anyway, um, but long story short, the reasons for why those elements are useful is because of the reactive properties, um, right? Iodine readily binds, and that's one of the core things our, our ancestors, for whatever reason, logged onto it, as opposed to, say, bromine, which is probably just a little too reactive. By the way, bromine, if you look closely at your extra rough spectrum, you almost always see this element. Is it's not in the calibration, is it? No, I don't think they picked it up at all. But I think this could be used in sourcing of obsidian too. Um, you see it in volcanic uh, ashes as well quite frequently. If you measure next time you go to a restaurant, bring the extra rough. Measure a 
I'm not even kidding, I've done this. I get lots of questions from the waiter. Measure the shells. You will find bromine on the outside of shrimp and clams, but not on the inside. Mm -hmm. Because they use the bromine to prevent uh, barnacles from lodging on. Mm -hmm. So let's say I'm a shrimp. Can a barnacle form on my back? Yeah. Is that bad for me? Yeah, it's going to weigh me down. It costs me more to move. So they've evolved resistance by depositing bromine. Mm -hmm. and, and why is there bromine in the ocean? Same reason there's chlorine in the ocean, because they behave similarly and they, they dissolve out into the water. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the other thing you can use is a bromine-chlorine ratio. Well, because salts can be added as tempered as ceramics, I don't think it's as useful. If you have a, a true clay source, though, this ratio can be very useful. By the way, the Tracer 5G can measure chlorine. Um, so like we, we can jump down one level. It's of absolutely no use to you as an archaeologist. But if you're a medical device maker or you're a silicon manufacturer, the fluorine becomes important. Mm -hmm. Finally, the noble gases. Do you know why they're called noble gases? Because they, they don't interact with all those proletariat uh, elements. Um, because these guys, their outer shell is filled. So from a geochemical perspective, you can almost ignore them. Almost. There's only one exception. The nuclear weapons, the, the, the insight that led to the development of the first nuclear weapons is based on krypton. So krypton doesn't do anything. It's just a noble gas. Um, it's very rare to find it. But um, there was a couple, uh, an, an aunt and her nephew, and they were refugees from Germany, both were Jewish, and they were in the United States, and they were taking a hike in upstate New York. And the younger nephew was interested in uranium. Now, at the time, the only isotope of uranium that they knew of was uranium-238. Do you know what the half-life of uranium-238 is? 4.4 billion years. It's not reactive enough to sustain any kind of, of uncontrolled nuclear reaction. A different isotope might have a different reactivity. Anyway, the nephew was interested in finding uranium for experiments in chemistry, and he found what he thought was sure would have uranium, but when he opened it up, there was only barium inside. And it didn't make any sense, because there was no strontium, there was no calcium, it was just barium. And so he said, I didn't understand what was going on at all. And his aunt, who was a nuclear physicist, or was like a physicist, was thinking about it, and she says, you have to have strontium and calcium with barium, you have to. But then it occurred to her, when they opened the rock, there could have been something else there. If you add krypton to barium, you get to 92, which is uranium. And so she deduced that there was a different form of uranium that had decayed into barium and krypton. And she said, you know what this means? There is a reactive form of uranium that can be used to produce a nuclear weapon. She knew that Niels Bohr was working with the German government to look into this. So she wrote to Einstein and said, I think there's a possibility Einstein wrote to FDIR, and the rest is history. Um, but krypton, the absence, the presence of krypton is what clued in people that there was a different form of uranium that could form a nuclear weapon. And the reason they didn't find it is because what happens? If I open the rock where the uranium became the barium and krypton, where does the krypton go? <laughs> it's gone immediately, right? I've only measured krypton once if it was a bag in a government facility, because it's just, it's any noble gas is going to be gone. Which of these will you see? all the time with the tracer, by the way. One of these is argon. Argon. It's 0.98% of the air you breathe. You can actually use argon sometimes in ceramics as a proxy for porosity. If I turn on the vacuum in here and I measure my ceramic, if I get argon, it's coming from the sample. So if you have little air pockets in the surface of the sample, you can get argon too if you're using a vacuum. So in that case, you can actually use it to kind of get a porosity. Not a lot of people do that because it's tough to set it up just right, but it is a possibility. So anyway, that's the periodic table. The last thing to talk about are the lanthanides, the rare earth elements. These guys, they're actually not that rare. I don't know if you knew this. They're just really hard to extract. If, in this obsidian, we have all of these guys present in my hand right now, but they're in the part per million or part per billion range and they're evenly spread everywhere. You rarely find a solid deposit of them. But they always, always correlate with yttrium. So the more yttrium you have, the more rare births you tend to have. And then the last group of elements are the actinites. These are the radioactive ones. And they're, uh, uh, you can always tell that because uranium 
is the, the, dead, the, the really nasty radioactive one is early on in the list. These guys are all lethal in even at small doses. So that's a rough tale of it. By the way, a fun little other thing, the, the guy who writes XKCD, uh, uh, I can't remember his name, he wrote a book on it called What If, and it was, it was scientifically accurate answers to ridiculous questions. <laughs> and one of the questions he got was, if I had a building block about the size of a laptop computer of every element, and I stacked the periodic table the way it is portrayed here, what would happen? <laughs> His answer, the top row would just float away, right? Hydrogen and helium are just gases, and they'll float away. The second row is gonna sit down but this one's going to cause a small localized fire. If I add this row underneath this row, the whole room blows up and I die. <coughs> if I add this row, the whole building blows up. If I add this row, the whole building still blows up, but now it's finally radioactive. <laughs> if I add this row, half of the city is annihilated in a radioactive nuclear blast that pulverizes everything. And don't add the last row. <laughs> but in any case, that's the basic pattern of the periodic table. It's, what happens is, is these guys get cross-reacted. Get cross um, and that's basically the properties. So, that's our lovely periodic table. And as I mentioned earlier, it really looks like this. We just can't get a piece of paper long enough in a book to show it this way. So we snap these guys out. By the way, we could do the same for the transition mounts. Take them out and then unify across them. It's however you want to display it. One of the most creative things I've ever seen is a radial display in the periodic table. There's a lot of ways to do it. So, now let's talk about what do these elements mean. If you're measuring a ceramic, or you're looking at an archaeological site, geochemically, what does it do? And so what I tried to do is use musical groups that people know of to illustrate how this works. So Booty and the Blowfish, is going to form your most common elements. Iron, calcium, silicon, let me do that again. So, these are the most common elements. They're annoying, they always sound good, but they're always just kind of on the radio and kind of blase. These you'll see everywhere. They crowd out all the useful signals. Um, and, but, and actually, what I usually try to do is I try to ignore these as much as I can when I actually look at the data. So here's an example of, uh, a, 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 of analysis in that context. So, this is calcium counts per second, and here I can see um, calcium changing. And actually, I don't think I can show you all that data, so we'll just stick to these. All right, so these are your normalizing elements, right? These are the ones you can use as a denominator. So if I'm making elemental ratios to source where sediments come from, these are what I want to use as the denominator. Rubidium. So first off, aluminum, bono, is the absolute best. Mm. It's the most blasé, normal, predictable, always sounds the same element you can find. It, it is not reactive in any way in any geologic context. As a consequence, it is the best thing to ratio to see changes in reactivity. So if I normalize phosphorus to aluminum, iron to aluminum, potassium to aluminum, I get a standard common denominator. I recommend using aluminum when you can't use any in all cases. That's your best preference. And if you want to look at any sediment change or anything, that is the best. And by the way, for ceramic sourcing, it's not going to be the abundance of given elements that tells you the most. It's going to be the ratios to each other that can tell you discrete groups. Aluminum is your absolute best denominator for ceramics. Absolute, no questions asked. But what's the problem with aluminum? If I'm measuring uh, with a filter, can I see aluminum? It goes away. So if I'm measuring with a filter, the next best substitute for aluminum is rubidium. While rubidium is a very reactive element, it is also a very stable oxide. Nothing happens to rubidium oxide once it's made. So provided you have rubidium oxide, it is going to be highly stable, and it will behave like aluminum as a denominator. So the second safest denominator is rubidium. So if you do a light scan, Aluminum is what you should use as your as, as your denominator. If you're doing a trace scan, normalize to rubidium. That will be best. By the way, there's no coincidence. Remember Bruce's rule for identifying obsidian and all that? There's a reason he's using rubidium and not zirconium. 
right? Rubidium is something that is produced reliably by volcanoes, and it tends to dilute down because there's no other source of rubidium. So that is rubidium. Does he like to ratio his He does. Well, so, he, so let me clarify. For determining what type of rock it is, he uses rubidium. For determining what source of volcano it is, he uses zirconium. Zirconium is highly resistant to chemical changes, but it also varies randomly by a large degree, right? If I look at variation on Earth and zirconium, it's not that much by type of rock. Uh, chert has a lot of zirconium. I can even find zirconium in calcium carbonate limestones. It's common in just about everything, in granites and feldspars, everywhere. Rubidium, specifically, is higher in igneous rocks relative to all the other kinds. So rubidium is a good tracer for broad, big picture planetary geology. Zirconium is better for fingerprinting a source. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if I'm trying to understand process, rubidium. If I'm trying to understand location, zirconium. This is a complicated lecture, but it's really important to understand, I think, these properties. If you have any questions or anything is not clear, please let me know. Um, especially if you just happen to do this. Yeah. Can you show us who you know both your skin? Yeah. Always, man. Always. <laughs> Thunder Road. <laughs> I just want to write those elements down. Yeah. So I, I bring these elements up because they're so big in the spectrum, they distract us sometimes. Um, that's the only reason I bring these up. It's not that they're not ever important. They definitely are. I only use this to highlight that they crowd out the signals. When you take your spectrum, sometimes you want to take your spectrum to minimize. So for example, an example application of this, though it's not in geology, it's in metals. I had someone come up to me and they wanted to study the phosphorus and iron alloys from medieval England. And they're like, what do I do? The iron, every time I take the spectrum, the iron is the only thing I see. So I told them, measure at 6 kPb, because then I can't excite iron. And then the only thing I see are small elements on the surface. So you can use, so I can manipulate the X-ray beam to isolate these elements out, and that's why I bring them up here. Geologically, they do all kinds of different things, um, but they just kind of crowd out the signal. And then we have Udi in the book, or, or U2 here, and this I bring up because they're so stable. So these are your denominators. This is what you can ratio to. Uh, I should not have run that fast. So again, so zirconium is good for location. The last one in here that is useful is titanium. Titanium is actually potentially really useful in archaeology, especially in Greece, but not for ceramics, for marbles. So if I have an ocean, what type of geologic formation does an ocean, a shallow ocean, leave behind? Yeah, exactly. So limestone. Really, marble is just limestone. Yeah. What happened is, the chemically, all the elements are the same. It just got some deep enough that heat and pressure um, made it amorphous, whereas it's not amorphous as a limestone. But here's the thing. If I see titanium in limestone, where did the titanium come from? It's not from the plankton. The shells? Not from the seashells. So if I'm in the mid-Atlantic Ocean, and I have a deposit of limestone that has titanium. Let's say it's today. Let's say we get in our marine diver and we go to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean and we pull out our tracer and shortly before we die due to nitrogen, <laughs> we analyze the bottom of the ocean to see titanium. Where would that titanium have come from? The Sahara Desert. What does the Sahara Desert do? It produces lots of sand that blows in the wind. Where does that sand get blown? It gets taken by the westerlies and blows over to the Amazon. If you get a chance, watch the new Planet Earth documentaries, and they have a whole section on how the Sahara is the fertilization source of the Amazonian rainforest. Sand from the Sahara Desert gets blown by prevailing global winds and moves across the Atlantic Ocean and is deposited in the rain shadow of the Andes. And that produces a spike of potassium, iron, and all of these nutrients that plants need to grow. Because the rainforest destroys its own nutrient base, right? In a rainforest, 90% of the nutrients are in the biosphere. Very little is in the soil. Its only source of recharge 
is the Saharan winds blowing over the Atlantic Ocean. But a lot of that goes into the Atlantic Ocean. If I look in the Atlantic Ocean and I see more titanium, that tells me prevailing winds were over here. Does that make sense? If I'm a marble and I see titanium, that tells me something about the climate. It tells me about the wind over that ocean. Different marbles from different places that are going to have titanium based on where they were when that marble was formed. So that's how we can use titanium to source if this left arm matches this right arm from a statue that we don't have the torso. So we can use that. I was at the Acropolis Museum and we were using this to piece together marble statues. It's a super elegant thing. We can also use it for paleoclimatic work. So for example, here's an example where they can use these stable elements like titanium and zirconium to tell the same story. By the way, does titanium look like zirconium here? Notice how it does the same thing? Do you know why it does that? Where's zirconium on the periodic table? What's above it? Titanium. Boom. <laughs> so that tells you a proxy ratio, right? By the way, in your sedimentological sequences, titanium and zirconium will vary with each other, but each different geologic zone may have a different starting ratio. So if you use a ratio of zirconium to titanium, that can tell you different sedimentation in an archaeological site. By the way, what other element would you predict would, would occur if you have lots of zirconium? Hafnium. This hafnium is only found with zirconium in nature. Exclusively. We've never found it outside of zirconium. So the more zirconium you have, the more hafnium you have. And if you can see the hafnium in the extra signature, which you can if there's enough zirconium, that can also be used as a tracer. By the way, do you know why they call it a tracer? <laughs> this is exactly why. We're teasing out these signals. Alright, so that is titanium. Sorry, I've got some plots in here that are like uh, that are confined, so I can't do it. So, heavy metal. These are our diagenetic elements. These are the elements that take a sound and distort it after the fact. So whenever you see these elements in a geologic context, this tells you about diagenesis. Does anyone here know what diagenesis means? Diagenesis in Greek is second birth. It's chemical processes that happen after deposition. So once I've deposited all my stuff, if these elements come up, they're the evidence of secondary chemical processes after the initial formation. So a fossil is produced by diagenesis, right? All these new things come and permineralize the bone after the fact. It's the second birth of the bone, diagenesis. Diagenesis chemically can be a huge pain for archaeologists, right? If I talk about carbon, secondary carbon uh, contamination, that is a kind of diagenesis or second birth of that material because I've changed its elemental construction. Dolomite, which is also mined with marble, is calcium carbonate limestone that has had magnesium replace the calcium. You know why that happens now because they have those two electrons. That would be a diagenetic event. So diagenesis is whenever we have secondary transfer. The re now, we often say ceramics are permanently unalterable, right? Because the act of vitrifying the clays prevents diagenesis. So the equivalent of ceramics is putting a content filter on your kid's smartphone so they can't listen to heavy metal. Um, would be basically the analogy. Um, that's what makes ceramics so nice because they're frozen in time by the vitrification process. Um, but yeah, but that's diagenesis. So copper is, by the way, we don't understand everything about copper. It's now a <coughs> uh, question. But when we have chemical things happen after a geologic deposit happens, copper tends to come in. So when we see a copper ore in Cyprus for the that the Mycenaeans are using, they're exploiting a diagenetically altered geologic area. Another element that is diagenetic is iron. Iron is often in clays, but we see it diagenetically formed, most often in the form of pyrite, iron pyrite, which is actually surprisingly common. We often see it as gold's gold when it's in our hands, but if I'm just looking at a ceramic, there's actually a surprising amount of iron pyrite can, that can exist there. So one of the ways you can tease out the pyrite is to do iron by sulfur, because it's iron sulfide, right? So you'll see changes in the iron, the iron over sulfur can tell you the pyritic composition of that material. And the last one is arsenic. A lot of arsenic shows up diagenetically. Can you guess specifically what, is, what arsenic is replacing? <laughs> phosphorus, P. Phosphorus. P. Yeah, phosphorus. 
So whenever you have a lot of cost for some material, arsenic comes. Why was there so much arsenic in the dinosaur bones I lived when I was a kid? Sorry, you missed the story. <laughs> There's a whole thing behind it. Um, because what's in a bone? What is a bone chemically? Phosphate. Calcium, calcium phosphate, right? So arsenic comes up and replaces the phosphorus. And thus, my arsenic exposure as a child. <laughs> so, anyway, um, backstory is when I was a kid, I grew up with a window where a lot of dinosaurs were. So I'd go outside and I'd lick all these rocks that they stuck to my tongue. That's a dinosaur. So, I found a lot of dinosaurs that way. Anyway, but that's arsenic's role in diagenetics. So anytime we see that replacement happening, it's a diagenetic process. Petrified wood would be a diagenetic process. By the way, while we're on the topic, let me show you this research using instrument 1878, which Lucas now has. And it is, oh, where was it? Uh, I have 15 minutes. Here it is. So here's an example of diagenesis. We found there's a site in Sweden where they have a Mesolithic occupation and then a medieval occupation right on top. And we found the bones are all commingled, so there's no stratigraphic separation. And they radiocarbon date the bones then to tell which animals were in which habitat. And so I did a pretty good grasp of this. And then I XRF one of the bones. And I noticed it had a lot of uranium and yttrium. And when we look, compared the radiocarbon dates to the yttrium and the uranium, we found they split almost perfectly. The more yttrium you have, the older the bone is. And then we did a micro XRF map of the bones. And you can see the uranium on the inside of these bones. Do you notice that the bones that are smaller from the Mesolithic and the big bones don't have the yttrium? Those are cow bones, domesticated cows, and the Mesolithic didn't have those yet. So here we can see, at this archaeological site, they can use the extra ref. The bone has yttrium, Mesolithic. If it doesn't, uh, medieval. This rate appears to be a constant in nature, by the way, and the cave deposits, yttrium corresponds to age too. So you can use, for bones, you can use the rare earth content of the bones via diagenesis, second birth. It's basically what you're seeing here, by the way, that's uranium. These ones are radioactive. The, the, the age of the bone increases the likelihood that it's gone through diagenesis. And thus, I can predict its age then. So, you can use, this is a cheap way to do some sorting if you've got commingled deposits. Alright. So anyway, that is diagenesis. Copper, iron, and arsenic. There are other diagenetic elements, like uranium and yttrium, um, but it's a big field of diagenesis. Typically speaking, diagenesis is any replacement of elemental content in the material. I'm showing the common indicators because these are rare, um, but you will find others uh, more often. An example of how we can use that is here. So, in the uh, Mediterranean, uh, in the Mediterranean, at one point, its salt content is hyper-specific. I should wait for her, uh, our friend who studies Mediterranean archaeology, so I'll hold on for just a second. Any questions about this so far? Does any of this seem more useful than other parts? Yeah, there's a ton of stuff, and I know it's not your specialty. No, it's all good, because... Yeah. No, we're going to um, look at the sediment again that Craig got with right. some, some of these ratios, because I didn't do any ratios. We were, I was mm -hmm. just doing clustering based on raw, oh, okay. raw, raw, raw ratio. numbers. Yeah. I mean, we do get ceramic in the Great Basin, you know, right. kind of. So, yeah, there's no reason why we wouldn't want to analyze it next time Typically, we see it. yeah, we tell it apart visually. I don't know, it's just, it's all good to have on the back burner. Yeah, especially if it's non-destructive. Right. Yeah, you got it. And we have our, we have our towels on both the machines, so, yeah, there's nothing stopping us other than our own learning. Yep, okay, perfect. So, I want to show you here a plot from the Mediterranean. About five million years ago, the Mediterranean dries up completely. It's actually, Europe and Africa are the same continent for a short period of time because there's no Mediterranean Ocean. It's called the Messinian Salinity Crisis, which is like the most, in, like, I don't know why they chose that name, it's so weird. But you basically have a vast salt plate separating Europe and Africa. And animals migrated across it. We actually have footprints of hominids, one of those human ancestors on the island of Crete that were discovered last year. There were hippopotamuses that had migrated up to Greece via these pathways. But the Nile would have extended as far as Cyprus. Um, because it would have been land. It's a super yes. weird period of time. Sorry, can you say the date again? About 5.9 to 5.1 million years ago. Okay. Messinian salinity crisis. Do not ask me to spell that. But um, it's, it's super interesting, super bizarre, and it leads to a lot of transfer of animals and wildlife. 
Um, there's, uh, uh, the fact that there's hominid footprints on Crete suggests that the practical area of human evolution might extend uncomfortably into the Mediterranean. Um, but diagenetically, we can tell this with elements. Because when it happens, that's, by the way, we call it a sapropel when you see these events, these hypersalinity events. But here you see it, the copper goes off the charts. Because diagenetically, the chemistry is weird, you start seeing replacement. What do you notice they're normalizing to? Why would you do that in an ocean environment? Because it can't be there. The only source of titanium, if I'm in an ocean, is sand blowing in. The only way. There's no other way for it to get in there. Calcium, now, organisms do not take titanium to form bones or shells. So if I've got a limestone, titanium is my key, and then copper tells me something funky happened, and this whole stem from a second source. And that's diagenesis in a nutshell. Now here's another example of it, where you can see individual diagenetic events. And basically, if you're trying to study a site via diagenesis, what the copper tells you is don't read too much into it, because something has happened after deposition, right? So like, if I'm looking at this sediment, and I say, ooh, something really interesting has happened here, and then I look and I go, oh shoot, my copper turbidium is skyrocketing here. That tells me something's happened after the fact, so I might not be reading anything about the formation of this environment. That's why it's important. So it tells you not to read in too much. Now some geologists who have different questions might be more interested in that. But typically speaking, a spike in copper or arsenic will tell you something else has happened here after the fact. We don't actually know much about its formation because there's too much alteration, right? It's the same reason why we can't just, so you know how we do C3, C4 isotope ratios in uh, mammals, like humans to see diet? You don't never hear about that doing that with fossils. And the reason is because diagenesis changes the carbon. Right? If I see diagenesis, I can't infer. I don't know if I'm measuring the diet <coughs> or something that's happened after the fact. By the way, the other reason why that happens, and it's super interesting, is it's absolutely useless for dinosaurs. There were no C4 plants in the dinosaurs. C4 plants evolved the same time humans evolved. They're very recently, 7 million years old. The two are connected. They think the opening of C4 grasslands. Once grasses learn to do C4, uh, 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 C4 photosynthesis, they begin to outcompete forests in certain climates, and that created grassy expanses between trees, and that incentivized bipedalism between forest patches. Is it that, fern, ferns before? Yeah, yeah. So when you do the C3, C4 ratio, there's actually a deep link between why the C4 plants exist and why humans evolved to exploit those habitats. Anyway, uh, which kind of puts uh, uh, agriculture made in context, doesn't it, in the big picture? Anyway, oh, can't look at that. So, uh, oh, can't look at that either. <laughs> there we go. All right, so, common elements. Rubidium and zirconium. These guys can be a useful ratio for grain size, which can, in, which can identify past kinetic activity. So in other words, if you, what sedimentologists use is they ratio zirconium to rubidium to see how big the grains are. The idea is the bigger the grain, the more zirconium you tend to see. So here's an example of that, where they use, um, where is it? This is the zirconium rubidium ratio, and they're using this, uh, let's see. Let me make sure I understand this graph. If I remember correctly, blue is the grain size measured by a particle uh, uh, sorter, and red is the ratio of, rubidium, uh, of zirconium over rubidium. So this corresponds very closely with grain size in these seven columns. So if you have a chemostratigraphic section and you run down it, that will tell you grain size. Why is grain size important? It takes a faster flow of flowing water, more, uh, let me get this right, faster the water flows, the bigger the part of the size that is transported. So it tells you something about changes in the flow rate if you're looking at a river system. Again, these are very specific things, but this is the kind of thing you can use. Um, by the way, this would not be useful in ceramics, because what's happened in ceramics? They're vitrified. So if it's a high temperature, we've changed the structure completely. So you get what the grain size used to be, but it wouldn't tell you right now what it is. Hey, hang on one second. I want to write down the title notes up there. Yeah, go ahead. This relates directly, I think, to this grain. Less, I mean, oh, you're right. absolutely right. Yeah, zirconium and rubidium. And you're that, absolutely that was right. one of the questions that our 
the fee I asked me was, you know, how can we get that grain size yeah. without sending it in? Yep. To get sorted. You've got it. You've got it. I didn't know the answer to it. This is this is a good cue. I think though this is typically used relative. See, so are you measuring them as little packets of samples, or you're measuring them in situ to see the change? Packets of samples. Can you measure in situ? Sure. Uh, in situ is going to be the most useful because then you <coughs> see the trend, and that would be much more insightful than measuring each piece isolated. I mean, if they if they're doing the stratigraphic control, and each one's coming from a different layer, you can still infer. How about I'm grinding them up though? Don't grind them. Don't grind them. Well, I have the, I have unground samples Good. too. Do, do you know why you don't want to grind them? Do you know what happens? If I agitate the sample, the smaller particle sizes fall to the bottom. The bigger stays up, so it starts to sort. So if I measure an XRF on the bottom of a sample cup, I over-represent the small particles um. relative to the big ones. That's why in situ is better, because you're in the original context, there's no sorting, so you get a representative measure of the original system. The less you do, the better it is for this particular proxy. So I would strongly recommend, try to get, if you can, try to measure in situ for this. Like see how much, it, like, ask, like tell them, hey, can you pay for us to come out? Pay the, pay, pay the bill, don't do it for free. But this analysis will always be better when done in situ than with fair samples. So, my strong recommendations. We ran into this problem all the time at Brooker. Because people would take a sample, they'd mill it, and they'd put it in. And when you mill it, you agitate it, and the small stuff falls to the bottom. And so you over-represent the clays relative to the quartz. Because the quartz doesn't mill as well. Now, can you get a milling system that will stop that? Possibly, but it's really expensive. Um, and I haven't seen it if it exists. It might be. I'm, it's not my field of specialty. But this was a problem we had all the time. People would mill and then complain to us that the aluminum numbers were too high. Why? Because the aluminum was in the clay and the clay filtered to the bottom and then we see that spike shoot up. So, in any case, less destructive is better for this, for gen typically speaking, if you can't do it. It's not homo they're homogenizing it properly. Well, I mean, they're homogenizing properly by the book, but relative to the minerals they're looking at, they're causing sorting. And once you're sorting, you're changing what the unaltered measurement would be. So in other words, if I went to the field and measured, I would have a representative distribution of where the, where the lowest is in the sand. Whereas if I agitate it, that lowest is going to filter so between the pore spaces to the bottom. So it would help you to, it would help you to, to subsample your lust based on grain size? Could, yeah. Right, so if you had a stratigraphic unit and you did this, and you had, you know, three peaks, mm -hmm. And you yep. can figure out stratigraphically, you can say, I want this one, this one, and this one. Yeah, exactly. And then you can target size. those. Exactly right. And then you can do your elemental ratios to see where could that lowest be coming from. Even though visually it all looks like one pattern. Exactly. So what you're talking about there is chemostratigraphy. So in other words, we're doing stratigraph. So regular stratigraphic analysis, I use visible light to see differences in the layers, right? Chemostratigraphy, I use x-ray light to do the exact same thing. And I might get a different result. There might be differences in the x-rays that are invisible to you. Especially when it comes to particle size. Absolutely, absolutely. So would this, would you have to have a, a volcanic-based rock or soil to do this? Nope. Because it has? This can be set up in logical. And it will have enough circulating or radium in it uh -huh. to? Yeah. yeah. If you don't believe me, take your trace. No, that's fine. Yeah. I just didn't, you know, I associate those elements with the volcanoes. volcanic rock. Yeah. They, and, and like, you will notice them. Like, you know that obsidian seesaw pattern? That is characteristic of volcanics. If you measure ceramic and you see that seesaw, you've got ash. It should be tall. Um, if it's shorter and it's sort of like strontium is bigger and zirconium is bigger, that's a regular clay. So you can actually, once you do this enough, you'll be able to eyeball what you have in the volcanic ash. Because their relationship to each other is unique. But each element, with the exception of yttrium, is almost always in every spectrum of a ceramic or a clay or a soil. Yeah, they're, they're in, they're in, those elements are in what great view. Yeah. There. Exactly. So yeah, no, this is this is a good, I would strongly recommend clean, this is why you keep your bulk walls clean, people. You have your straight, clean bulk wall and just zip up it with the XRF. Take some time, takes, you know, you get tired, flies come out at noon, it's, you know, try to get some shade. But this data is the best. It's so much better than collecting a small sample. And that way you can choose your increment. If you want to be really fine about it, you can move 0.1 or 1 millimeter. Uh, of, of the call. Um, you have to do it by hand, which sucks. But how do you tell me how will you see where you are? Like, what I usually do is I mark on the nose of the tracer and then I move up by those increments. We'll have a measuring tape also so we can validate. Um, oh, you just press it flush. You press oh, okay. it flush against the wall, so I would 
go here, go here, gotcha. go here. Yeah, and it's very, yeah. You finally have a camera in there, right? This one doesn't have a camera, but the Tracer Fi Light does, yes. And so that way you can visibly look. You can even put a scale bar in the camera on the window and mm -hmm. use that too if you want it to be super exact. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, but in any case, but that's the volume of video. It's super useful for grain size. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty well substantiated in sedimentological studies. It's a pretty reliable ratio. All right, let me make sure I'm not going to crack them like that. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I'm telling you, that, that's kind of really yeah. Yeah. Right. <coughs> Next ratio is Mike. So that is this Craig Skinner? No, no, Craig Brown. Yeah. Craig Brown. Okay, is it one of our GORs? Gotcha. Anyway, so that's Craig's favorite. This is my favorite. And I actually don't like to do back that much, but my, this album is pretty good. Uh, it's not as good as what was the guy Pete Greenwood or, or Pete Sessions? Is that the early early Fleetwood Mac? That was a little more cooler. But anyway, calcium and strontium. <laughs> Long story short, these two occur with each other. Strontium is heavier. Calcium is lighter. Calcium tends to evaporate out, strontium does not. So this is a pretty direct signature for water in terrestrial systems. Actually, in marine too, you'll see the same effect. If you don't have, if it's more of a clay base than a limestone base, you'll see the same effect. More strontium invariably means hotter, uh, 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 or uh, more strontium. Let me, let me clarify this, because there's actually two different ways to use this. If I have a clay system where there's water, Calcium strontium ratio tells me evaporation. If I have seashells, so it's just seashells, raw biotic life that hasn't been changed, that tells me water temperature. The hotter it is, the more strontium. If I have a seashell from Norway and a seashell from the same species or a similar one from Colombia, and you put both on a table, I can tell you which one comes from cold water with the XRF based on the strontium. It's, and it's not a small difference, it's a gigantic difference in the spectrum. It's like a 10 times difference. So calcium and strontium in a terrestrial system tells you evaporation. In a biotic system, tells you temperature. It can sometimes tell you diet in bones. The more that someone eats fruits, the lower the strontium is in their bones, or their nail. The more that they eat leaves, the more strontium because fruit has less strontium than leaves relative to the calcium. So this can tell you frugivore versus pollutivore if you're trying to do ecological reconstruction. Sometimes it can be used for the human diet, but it's not quite that exact yet. But that is that ratio. And here's an example of these guys being used. Strontium, calcium, and then this is uh, oxygen isotopes. And they say the same story, which is amazing to me. So you can almost use strontium calcium as from the tracer as a cheap proxy for delta 18O if you have a, a, a clear condition where evaporation is the dominant feature. Can you describe what one can have? So this right here is strontium calcium ratio, that's the blue line. Mm -hmm. The green line is delta 18O. The oxygen isotope we use as a temperature as a proxy for temperature. So you see how it changes? Uh, that strontium calcium behaves identically to oxygen isotopes. Now, here's the kicker. The same blue line for strontium calcium with temperature in black. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. So strontium calcium is a very good paleoclimatic, paleoclimatic signature. And so in this case, they're using this for a, a, a climatic reconstruction over millions of years but it's a very solid one. If you've got a biotic system, it's a temperature proxy. If you have a terrestrial system, it's an evaporation proxy. So you guys, the, the, the evaporation aspect of this is the most important to you. But if you do isolate out your shells, your gastropod shells, you could potentially, and you, and you can control them chronologically, they could potentially tell you temperature in the system for the same reason that this does. And it's as good as oxygen isotopes are. So if you need to do oxygen isotope analysis, but you're on a budget, this can work too. All right. Next, titanium and iron. I clicked too fast. Let's go back. Titanium, iron. So these guys in marine systems. Now, I say marine systems. This is still important to you if you're looking at ceramics. Because where do those clays come from? Marine systems, right? Marine, marine geology 
is important in understanding surroundings. These guys can indicate terrigenous, in other words, from Earth, sediments. So like I said, when the Sahara Desert blows its dust over the Atlantic Ocean, that is primarily a signature of titanium and iron. And let me show you one of the most famous paleoclimatic studies that uses this. This is from the Cariaco Basin, in, uh, uh, in the, uh, just off the coast of, uh, in Venezuela. Here they've got barbed sediments. What barbed means is that they've got annual deposition of calcium carbonate shells from living organisms. They used an XRF, ran it up and down, and they looked at iron and titanium, and they see this wavy pattern. And what they found was that the titanium and iron increase when the ITCZ, in other words, the intertropical convergence zone, that's the storm, that's the band of storms across the equator that generates hurricanes. When it moves south, they end up with more rainfall in the uh, in, in Venezuela, and so there's more erosion of dirt, and that dirt washes in and adds more titanium and iron into the system. And that signature right there could tell them climate, because if the ITCZ is north, then there's less rainfall and less in so the more titanium I find in the ocean, the more rainfall is happening on land. That's the relationship they see. By the way, do you see this divot right here? Mm -hmm. That is associated with the Late Bronze Age collapse in uh, the Mediterranean. <clears throat> this would be the Late Bronze Age hot period right there. You also see the same thing happen in the Little Ice Age where it drops. And you can see the Holocene. You can actually see the Younger Dryas too. And the Younger Dryas, you guys all know what the Younger Dryas is, right? Uh, the Younger Dryas is this like, so basically the Earth was recovering from the Ice Age, and then it's like the, the, the Earth, while it was warming, had a midlife crisis and goes, man, things are so much better in the Ice Age. And it just freezes all of a sudden. <laughs> and you end up with this 1,000 year cold, sharp spat. Um, by the way, interestingly enough, the Younger Dryas. 12,000 to 11,000, <coughs> right around 10, there. BC. Yeah. And then it stabilizes <laughs> right about 10,000 years ago. But that's the Younger Dryas, and, it, and that sharp drop in temperature basically led to a drought. Anytime you see this line drop, that is a drought in South America, because there's less rainfall happening. So anyway, but that's the system there. And then we can see that this period, the Holocene, this is the Ulta Thermal that we refer to when things were hot and dry. Oh, this is cool. You guys heard of the Ulta Thermal in, your, in, in the Holocene, right? What was it like in the Ulta Thermal in, in California? Was it good or bad? Bad. It was bad. Why was it bad? Uh, all these water sources dried up. All these water sources dried up. You know why they dried up? Because the storm system moved south. So South America had a bounty. Mm. But then all those storms weren't making it up to California. And then it recovers down over here. So here, think about how humbling this is. Changes in the part per million of titanium in a bay in Venezuela tell us why life was miserable in California for 4,000 years, <laughs> right? That's how powerful these elemental proxies are. And if I'm studying, now that's cool for environmental reconstruction. If I'm looking at ceramics, the titanium in something that has a lot of calcium might be something relevant, right? So that's why these things are important. The more we understand about how these plays form, the more we can recognize when you look at the spectrum from this clay from a Mycenaean, you can look past the Mycenaeans. Is it Mycenaeans or Mycenaeans? Mycenaeans. You know it was Mycenaeans. It, it, well, I mean, in modern, so in, in studying Mycenaeans, you say Mycenaeans, but like the, the modern village today is Mycenaeans. So. Okay, Mycenaeans. Okay, that's why I'm confused. Yeah, yeah. I talk to Greeks about it, so yeah, yeah. that's my problem. Yeah. So the Mycenaeans, <laughs> um, when you look at them, um, uh, when you look at their ceramic, look past their culture and look right to what formed it, and that will give you a clue as to what's going on. But yeah, anyway, there's your ultra thermal right there. What year was this? This is 2001. I can send you the publication if you'd like. I think this is like one of the most essential publications. Cause, I would love to see this because, yeah. you know, people on the Great Basin been argued forever about how the ultra thermal affected all yeah. these cultures and mm -hmm. on and on. And this gives a pretty simple, like, what's, mm -hmm. the thing is with the ultra thermal is we don't see it in the ice sheets. You only see it when you look at continental records, like this. That's why, I, by the way, just to get on, and I like a soapbox here. Ice cores are what we use to define like mid warm period, little ice age, but this is from ice and Greenland. Terrestrial systems respond differently to these kinds of pressures. 
That's what makes this type of work so important, because here we see what's happening in the Americas, locally, and what's affecting it. And we can see the shift of that rain belt south. And it's not hard to imagine why, if, st if the storm belt moves 500 miles to the south, how that could lead to things being drier in North America. Because remember, a lot of those rainstorms you get in the North Atlantic monsoon peel off the ITCZ and come up north, right? This would have been the weakening of the monsoon in America in, 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 uh, in the southwest. So, by the way, if, I, if you had to ask me, why is civilization like? It's sort of like you look at civilization in North America. It kind of feels like it's three thousand years behind everyone else. Like Chaco Canyon is a pretty good stand-in for the Neolithic. Why is it so late? I think because we basically just lost four thousand years. Right, it got too arid. We couldn't do agriculture here. Right? Even if you wanted to, you couldn't do it. It was too dry. We don't. It's not until the mid Holocene that the storm system migrates back north and spits off enough storms to make rainfall predictable enough to do agriculture. So this could be the constraint in the U.S. Southwest for why we see such late development of crops. If I had to guess, um, sure. I don't know for sure, but I've, I've often wondered that myself. I think this is a pretty important paper. Um, you're looking for Hogg et al. 2001. And I can send you a PDF if you want. That's the, that's the one, Hogg et al. 2001. It's you nature. Mean titanium and iron? Uh, titanium and iron is what they looked at. Like a ratio? No, to, uh, together. So just titanium was more instructive. Because, okay. and, and the reason they could do it just normally is because it was just calcium carbonate. They, there wasn't any need to, you only need to normalize when there's, because the problem is in the ceramic and the soil, there's so many different things all on top of each other, right? The key with, let see, uh, the key with, 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 with uh, calcium carbonate like this is that the environment is so simple we don't have the ratio anymore. We know exactly where the titanium comes from. That's, they have the benefit that you have. Okay. Yeah, the ratios are how to work around problems, basically. All right, so that's titanium. Here's another example of using titanium. Here's titanium in percent the same study. Here, they can actually get a sense of El Nino variation as well, using the titanium in that same uh, area. So when we actually, so when we look at it even more closely, we can see it. That's the little ice age that they saw earlier. And then this right here, that's the Lake Bronze Age collapse. I, as you can tell, I have very strong opinions about the Lake like Bronze Age collapse, but um, you do see a significant climatic movement that's happening around that time. All right. So, so, sorry, how, so that's obviously the data from like South America. Yeah. Um, how does that relate specifically to the, the Mediterranean? Yeah. I mean, like obviously, like I'm, I'm assuming you play wrong data flags, but from what I'm seeing here, yeah, 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 yeah. you like is the climate changes and you, you can't sort of produce the same crops and everything kind of shuts down. Yeah, so like what's the connection between the ITCC and what's happening in Greece? Yeah. yeah. I don't know for sure. I, uh, what, I, what, I, what, I, what I know for sure that the late Bronze Age collapse is directly related to water temperature in the Mediterranean. So you know how the Mediterranean it's hot and humid in the summer, summer that it rains in the winter? Yeah. What? Same as Calvary Bay area. What happens is, is in the summer, the water warms, and so you have a very warm ocean. But the air is also warm. Does precipitation happen in warm air? No. And it's colder. In the winter, the air chills. So what happens? That water falls out. Mm -hmm. And importantly, the water cools at a slower rate than the air, which means for this short period of time, the water is still warm, but the air is cool. Mm -hmm. So evaporation accelerates. So it's like you take your coffee cup and you put it in the freezer, you can watch the evaporation increase. Mm -hmm. So the evaporation increases, and then you have localized rainfall okay. right there. That's the Mediterranean climate in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. What happens if the water gets colder? Yeah, right, right, that seems like and we know the water gets colder at that time period. I think the water gets colder because the storm system moves south. And so you end up with less hot air bursts coming up north along the periphery of that. That's my idea. I haven't yeah. published it yet. But um, that's what I had to guess the connection. Basically, I would say what's happening in, in Greece can be understood in a global context. Mm -hmm. Which would make sense to an extent with this because in sort of the, the winter, you also get the, the Saharan rains. Yes. Exactly, and it's that connection to the African climate that adds it. Yeah. Anyway, so that's my idea, um, but don't quote me, and definitely don't publish me. Um, <laughs> so, next group of elements. 
we're talking about redox elements. So I'm using Metallica, really heavy, hard stuff. This, I think, what I'm going to talk about here, is what I think is absolutely essential to understanding ceramic sourcing and archaeology. If you're lucky enough to see this happen in a ceramic, that is a sourceable ceramic. <coughs> what happens is, is in an ocean basin, I start off with oxygenated blood, right? So I've got lots of oxygen in the water. Fish are happy, everyone's happy, and crucially, crucially, metals are soluble in oxygen. So molybdenum, chromium, all the elements we're going to talk about here are elements that float in water. Each of these reflect the oxygen that is present in the water. When oxygen drops out, these metals rain out. They are no longer soluble. So I'll end up with localized deposits of uranium, nickel, molybdenum, chromium, vanadium. I'll also see an increase in sulfur. And that tells me this is anoxic. It also leads to very fine place, right? So if I have an ocean basin, well actually, let me, let me show you an example of this from, uh, uh, from another context. So let's go to reports, core analysis, yeah, this is more. So here's an example. This is actual data from a core. This is calcium carbonate, and this is molybdenum in white percent. Now, what's happening here? What kind of rock would we call this? If it's like 30% calcium? Limestone. limestone. And limestone forms in the ocean. So what's happening is I've got all this healthy oxygenated water, there's all this plankton thriving, and then the plankton die and sink to the bottom of the ocean. In the bottom of the ocean, there's also oxygen. So what ends up happening is other organisms can come and feast on that detrital matter. So the carbon leaves the system, and the calcium shell is built up over eons and eons. And that's what happens here. And in that oxygenated water, I don't see metals like molybdenum at all. Then something happens. All the calcium drops out of the system. Now clays are forming, silicon, titanium, iron. And now molybdenum skyrockets up. What's happening? Well, if there's no oxygen, the calcium carbonate falls down and nothing can survive to eat the carbon. So the carbon stays in the environment. The shells dissolve in the acidic waters. So the calcium carbonate dissolves, so calcium leaves the system. And then clays are the only thing that can fill that void. And so I end up with a fine-grained clay with lots of heavy metals and a lot of carbon. So then an oil company comes along and they see, oh, look at all that molybdenum. That means the carbon wasn't recycled to the ecosystem that is where I can get natural gas, or oil, or whatever carbon deposit. And then the metal is telling you, if you see this in your ceramics, that tells you you have an anoxic ocean basin that is defined in time and space, just like a volcano. So the specific ratios of those heavy metals can be used to source. You don't always see them, but if you do see them, it's payday for ceramic sourcing, <laughs> because so, these are discrete. So this is a random question. Yeah. Um, do you normally then see like high quality clays in close association with like volcanic environments? No. Okay. No. It's it's two, two different processes. Okay. Okay. Two different processes. This is an entirely sedimentological process we're talking about. There's no igneous anything happening. Okay. And if there is, it's deep time. It's not anything that's relevant to the ceramics we grab. So we may think that the ceramics we grab are deep time, but most of them are formed only from the past 500 million years. So it's like the billion year stuff that you start to see that volcanic stuff play a bigger role. So in any case, and actually let's let's drill down a little bit. I want to talk about exactly what it is we're seeing. Because this is and this is very important, I think, for you to understand if you're going to do <coughs> geological research. Let's see if I can find the presentation. I think this is it, but I'm not sure. We'll see shortly. Uh, this is not one of my talks, this is from someone else, but let's take a look. Is this the same person that did that? The, the well, one book. Published. Yep. Exactly. Is he still in Arlington? No, he is uh, bought up by Pioneer. He's, uh, he's paying off student loans right now. <laughs> So let's let's stop here and talk a little bit about mineralogy. Hold on to your head and in your mind for about a little bit. Actually, I can. Well, we've got that idea fresh. I really need to focus in on it. So.
So let me, yeah, here it is. So here's what happens. So I've got molybdenum, and it's specifically molybdenum oxide, and it's two minus. Now molybdenum oxide, with all that oxygen, it's like having clouds attached to it. It's floating, it's hang gliding in the ocean waters. So our happy molybdenum is falling along, and then it falls into our anoxic basin if there's no oxygen. If there's no oxygen, that water is hyperreactive. So think about molybdenum, think about uh, baboons. Molybdenum is a male baboon, and these are the female baboons. And the female baboons are happy with their molybdenum. But when they get to the anoxic basin, there's many more attractive baboons in that water. And so the oxygen, that's organic rich. So then the oxygen exits molybdenum. Because they, who needs this baboon? We've got all these better ones. So now the baboon has to settle with older, uh, less attractive baboon mode, and that's the sulfur. And that weighs him down, and he sinks to the bottom of the ocean. And now that molybdenum starts to accumulate as a heavy metal in those sediments, because the oxygen leaves in an anoxic system. If any oxygen gets into that anoxic system, it is leaving and going for something else as fast as it can. So the molybdenum is stripped, but why does sulfur replace it? Do you remember the periodic table? It's just down, it's it's just down from oxygen. So sulfur <laughs> subs in for oxygen, <coughs> it sinks and precipitates out. And that's what leads to my heavy metal deposit. Now, what makes this important is, we come over here to this talk, these metals all do the same thing. They precipitate out, but they precipitate out based on the local chemistry. Oxygen is only one half of the equation. Acidity, other elements available, all that constrains the redox reactions that occur. So as a consequence, no two anoxic basins look identical to each other. They all look different. So that is why it's important for clay sources, because these basins produce clays that can be used in ceramics, and are used in ceramics. You will see these sediments show up in the archaeological record. The difference is, is you want to look for molybdenum and uranium. Those are your two most important elements you want to look for. Molybdenum and uranium. By the way, let's see how good you guys know your tracer. What filter would be the best for molybdenum and uranium? That green. Very good. The green filter. So that's why you want to calibrate to the green filter. This is why you don't want to take Brooker's calibration, because Brooker calibrates to the yellow filter for the Tracer 5i. That's why when, when Bruce, re, when I re, re ran those with Bruce, we had green, yellow, and yellow. Yeah. These I've had all the way from, you know, 3 to, you know, you got it. 30. Exactly. So molybdenum is the key. Molybdenum is the key. If you see molybdenum, you're, you're hitting the street. I, I can't guarantee you'll never see it. <laughs> you do see it. Yeah. You got eminently sourceable ceramics. Uranium is a good follow-up. Nickel and cop chromium are both very good too, but they tend to precipitate out in the lower waters. By the way, molybdenum, what we're talking about here is how we can tell when photosynthesis is starting on Earth without any fossils. Because the problem with bacteria is they don't form fossils very well at all. We think they do sometimes, but we usually just confuse ourselves. So how do we know? when photosynthesis began. Well, if I'm on early Earth, three billion years ago, what is in what is not in the water? So, molybdenum. There's no oxygen in the water. Very good. If there's no oxygen in the water, is there molybdenum in the water? No. So I'll see molybdenum in the sediments on the ground. Molybdenum can't stay suspended in the water. So if I look at the early history of Earth... So there's no oxygen, I mean, it's, there's a... Yeah. No, it's just brackish water. It's that really yeah, like gross swamp water, so right? The molybdenum can't be there because there's no oxygen yeah. to so, attach to it. So what happens is, is perversely speaking, if I analyze the sediment from that early on in Earth's history, I actually see lots of molybdenum because it wasn't in the water. If it's not in the water, it's still in the sand and the dirt. It's everywhere. When you add water with oxygen, the molybdenum floats up into it. So in my sediment core, when I see molybdenum, that tells me there's no oxygen. When molybdenum disappears, that tells me there's oxygen. So in the Earth, if we have a formation, let's say I had a, let's say the entire Earth was represented. The floor here is the creation, and the top is yesterday. And I measure right about here, in the middle of the wall, all of a sudden molybdenum shows up. And what does that tell me? 
There's oxygen. And what does the oxygen tell me? There's life. There's life, photosynthesis. So anyway, that's the that's the crux of it. But like oxygen is spelled by plants. Yeah, exactly. Well, well specifically cyanobacteria. But yeah. Plants, as we know them, don't show up until about 500 million years ago on, on, on the continent. But photosynthesis, the process of taking in light, splitting it out, carbon into the body, oxygen out, that's 2 billion years ago. 2.2 to be exact. And we can date that because of the molybdenum you know, that we see in the ocean in, 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 in ocean stratigraphy. So anyway, if you ever want to see, if you, if you think you have a rock, and you think this might be 3 billion years old, that's how you can tell. You, that's a nice marker for how old the rock is. But locally, in small pockets, you will get molybdenum showing up. Because, like, so for example, if I have the ocean current, and the ocean current changes direction, then I might have a little pool bay uh, that does not have oxygen circulating in anymore, and then it can turn brackish. And when that happens, it gets really nasty. By the way, almost every time you read about a shipwreck found in the Mediterranean, like the Carinia wreck, or the Uluru wreck, those are because of this. So I had to, I had this crazy trip where I went to Cyprus. And to get to Cyprus, I had to take a trade suit with the demilitarized zone uh, to get to the Carinia shipwreck. And when I looked at their coins, on all of the bronze coins found in the wooden wreck, they had uranium. Uranium was bonding with the copper in the coins. Why? Well, the same reason they knew they had a shipwreck. In the anoxic environment, the wood, the planks, didn't decay. And if you still look at pictures from those wrecks, you almost always see the wood come up, and then there's like a straight line that cleaves them. That's where the oxygen in the water is. Mm. And so every shipwreck in the Mediterranean we find is because of these elements. That's what tells us that. Oh, and that's how you find it? Well, yeah, because so what happens is, is if I'm scuba diving mm -hmm. in the ocean, and I see any organic matter that's old, like wood from a shipwreck, the only reason I can see the wood is because the anoxia of the water prevented other organisms from consuming and recycling that carbon into the biosphere. So yeah, absolutely. If I were to go in the Mediterranean, and if I had a probe that could tell me oxygen content in the water, I could use that to predict shipwrecks. Because it doesn't mean that that's going to be where the ship wrecked. That's going to be where I can where see could, the wood. Where it might still be there. Exactly. So you have shipwrecks everywhere. That's just that's the most visible. Place. Exactly. By the way, can I tell you something hilarious? I, the, the Institute of Nautical Archaeology, who does a lot of the Mediterranean shipwreck work, has two tracers: one in College Station, one in Bodrum, Turkey. And one of the big problems they needed the tracer for is to sort. If they find a ceramic, they want to know which shipwreck it comes from. And I was like, "You mean there's shipwrecks stacked on each other?" And they're like, "Yeah, they hit the same rock." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that happens all the time in the Mediterranean. Wow. There's the same big, like, shallow rock that they can't see, and they scrape the hull against it, and they drop on top of an existing shipwreck. Mm -hmm. So in one case, I had to sort bronze age uh, copper from bronze from a Roman shipwreck, and then brass from a medieval shipwreck, all sandwiched on top of each other from the same rock. Crazy. Isn't it hilarious? But in this case, the wood didn't preserve because it was oxic waters, because the rock, the waves, and all that agitated everything. The really rare wrecks are when they fall in the anoxic zone. But you've had coins and ceramics. Yeah. Yeah, you still see those. But those coins would not be loaded with uranium. When I measured this, it was, a, it was super cool. It was a brass Hellenistic coin, but it had like 0.25 weight percent uranium. I could, put a, I could have discovered this thing with a Geiger counter if I wanted to, because the uranium in that water was so thick because it was precipitating out. Yeah, so anyway, but that's why these elements can be important in ceramic sourcing, because they create these hyper-unique, it's sort of like, do you get uh, the first line from uh, Anna Karina, Leah Tolstoy's Anna Karina, is all happy families are the same, but each unhappy family isn't happy in its own way. In the same sense, oxic marine deposits are all the same, except for anoxic deposits, which are all anoxic in their own way. So the specific ratios of these can tell you about that. By the way, oil companies use that to predict how much oil they'll get. The ratios of these metals can help them predict how much carbon is present in those, in those deposition sequences. It's super cool, but it works out really well. I mean, like, and it's not a theoretical for them. They make a lot of money. They ride or die based on the molybdenum. Like how long it was anoxic or something can tell them about Yeah, how anoxic, the pH, and all that can tell them how much carbon could be sequestered in those deposits locally. Yeah, anyway, the chemistry gets super cool.
And here's an example of how you can use it. So here I, do you notice they're, what are they ratioing to? Aluminum. Aluminum, because it's not reactive. So here, vanadium to aluminum, what do they see? Boom, right there. Copper to aluminum, nickel to aluminum, molybdenum to aluminum. And that tells them the specific anoxic rates. Notice that the, the, that the nickel and the molybdenum tell different stories. What's that, the y-axis there? Y-axis is depth. Oh, depth. So this is a core. So think about this as a sediment core, the size of this wall. And this is where we're going down here. We can see these local zones of anoxia. That means in the history of the ocean, fish are happy, fish are happy, zone of depth, and then happy again. And then that zone of depth is going to have all the carbon. So yeah, but the thing is, if you have a ceramic source, this clay might make for a better ceramic than this clay. And you can even tell in the same pit where the clay is coming from, possibly. Um, but yeah, that's the idea. So that's why these elements are important. They're very reactive, very responsive. All the clays you have are coming from water environments. And this is true. By the way, salt water and fresh water both create these environments. It's not an either or. We can, uh, we can see these same processes happening in freshwater ecosystems. So yeah, but anyway, but that's the key, that's the key there. All right, the roots. These are your volcanic indicators. So when you have ash layers, if you are trying to find an ash layer, you can uh, find with these. So for example, let's say you're trying to find the Mazama eruption in a sediment sequence. You can use these elements to find that. And I know, because now I'm a grown up scientist, I actually am on a committee of a student, and that student has found the Mazama, uh, 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 Mazama eruption in sequences in that way proving in uh, Lake Bonneville using the tracer, using these elements in the ratios. I went to college in Missoula and we had Mazama and yeah. Ash way out there. Yeah, it, it, that was a heck of an eruption. Yeah. And it was 7,700 Cal years BP. It's a crater lake, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. But anyway, yeah, so that's Mazama. So these guys, you know about these ones here too, right? These two are also indicative of volcanoes. They're not as useful for sourcing obsidian, which is why you don't use them, but they can indicate volcanic activity. So if you're trying to find ash, and by the way, this can be important too. Do you know what they use for temper sometimes in ceramics? The uh, volcanic ash. So you know what you can do with that volcanic ash? Same rules as obsidian. You can oh, source the ash. Cool. One of my favorite examples of this, this is from Bruce, so Take it for what it's worth. You know he saw the data, but um, he saw he was with an archaeologist uh, in Guatemala, and they had uh, ceramics from two villages. And in one of those villages, they saw ash from Gishtepeque, and in the other ceramics, they didn't. And so in that case, they could identify the ash was moving to this village being brought over, um, not necessarily from the volcano itself, but they could tell <coughs> this ash is indicative of this particular volcano. So you can even source the components of the ceramic if you get this right. And by the way, the ash, the one, this is key, and this is important. The ash will have more rubidium and more yttrium. So if you find ash in a ceramic, do not use the strontium. Do not use the zirconium. Use the rubidium, yttrium, and niobium instead. Because these elements are not common in regular sediments. Um, but they're very common. They're, 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 they occur three to ten times more often in the, in the volcanic material. Do not use strontium and yttrium. No, no. Do not use strontium and zirconium. Do not use strontium and zirconium. If you're trying to do ash, use rubidium, yttrium, niobium. So, tell me again why? Because it doesn't turn Be, Because there's lots of strontium and zirconium in regular sediments. That's all. It's not that the, if you have obsidian, and I know it's volcanic, then strontium and zirconium are great. But if I have a regular sediment, like maybe it's 50% ash, 50% sediment. The signature from the strontium and the zirconium is going to be stronger from the sediment than it is in the, the, in the ash. But the ash will be stronger <coughs> than the nitrium and aeolium. That is why. Well, we run into that problem when we're sourcing artifacts from the Great Basin that are highly eroded and pitted. Yeah. And they have they have ash or sediment in the and, pit. Yeah, and then you get the strontium and the zirconium coming into the pit. Yeah. yeah, it was really, you know, it's like 30 ppm above yep. where it's exactly right. Exactly right. Usually here. So you can't, like, you can't, so it's soil in the pit, it's not the pit. Right? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. You can't, you can't scrub it out. Yeah, sediment is coming in. It's like little lowest mm -hmm. deposits there. 
you, you just need to, to try to not scan the pit. The other five eyes would be appropriate for that. You can shrink the pollinator in. The other option is drop strunning the zirconia into the pit. Yeah. The the option is drop strunning zirconia and use these guys, because those guys would be much more common in the obsidian than whatever sediment came in. Mm -hmm. You do not find more than 10 ppm intrium in a regular sediment. You just don't. Yeah, Unless it's, it's a rare earth mine, you don't see it. It's pretty predictable when we are looking at the distribution of, of obsidian. You can see if you just ignore strontium, you get mm -hmm. good clusters, and as soon as you introduce strontium, you have these outliers. Exactly. And then you look at the artifact, and you can predict how wet it is. Exactly. How much strontium is in there. Yep. Um, yep, that's it. So it's a solvable mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. But yeah, anyway, those are your volcanic elements. And this is an example of where they can do. Here's where you can find. When you, see, when, you do rate, when you do elements, just on their own ratios, you'll see those volcanic sections just spike out. Um, it's just finding the right combination of ratios to figure it out. The really good one we found, out of, or the most one my student found, is you add yttrium, niobium, and, uh, and zirconium, and then divide by rubidium. And that spikes out volcanic ash events in a core, for example. So, but they can be very thin horizons, right? You need to measure very, very, very consistently to be able to see them. All right. So let's come over here. These are your clay elements. These all correlate with each other. If you have a clay, there is a set ratio for each of these. This is, these will be important to teasing out different clays for you. Like the cool, anoxia may or may not happen. This will always happen. The ratios of these elements should be unique to specific clays. And I say should be. It's possible for two different clays to have similar ratios for a couple of these elements, but not for all of them. So do you ratio always, always to aluminum? I think that's a good starting point, but maybe the titanium potassium signature is more unique to this clay or that clay. So you might want to play with all of these. Though I would absolutely start with aluminum since it's the most inert. Because the problem is, so titanium, so aluminum is inert. Titanium is inert. Silicon is inert. Is iron inert? Uh-uh. Iron can be diagenetic, could be pyrite, could have other ways of coming in. Is potassium inert? Not necessarily. More biotic activity can be a different form of potassium present. Potassium can also be in an oxide or in a separate clay molecule too. So I would still, I would supply the ratio of these in different combos, but what you could do is build an index of all these ratios and combine that index as your clay signature and then compare it to others. I think, personally, most people like to do traces, try to do clay sourcing like they do obsidian sourcing. That is, look for rare elements like rubidium, yttrium, strontium, zirconium. I don't think that's the best way. I think you want to use the light elements because all of these you can measure at 15 keV and use these ratios and use all of them together to form a fingerprint for a clay and then compare that one across the board. That I think is a better strategy. I can't guarantee results, but I can guarantee that if results are to be found, they will be reflected in ratioing these guys. So an example of that here, uh, this is monsoon activity in India. Um, uh, uh, here where you can see for, for climatic reconstruction, the presence of clays can suggest a change in formation environment. So if I measure a geologic horizon, the clay change can tell me something about the river systems. But for your purpose, you're going off of the fact that it's highly unlikely that the aluminum silicon, potassium aluminum, iron titanium, and all these ratios are identical in the same group. That's, that's basically the idea. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I have an exact example of this from an archaeological so let's come over here to Documents, University of Chicago, Diagnostic Plots. There we go. Aluminum silicon. These are for different artifacts. And what I'd like to highlight here, just one thing. Do you see that artifact there? It has a different ratio. It's slope. It's different. Remember that when the slope was the important thing? So aluminum and silicon will always correlate each other. But each clay will have a different ratio between the two. So this guy 
breaks out consistently in three different measures. So you always want to measure multiple times in a ceramic, by the way. Obsidian, I can measure this guy once and be pretty confident. Ceramic, three to <laughs> five times. <coughs> parts. Right, front, back, Side play break, yeah. yeah. Try to get as many as possible. You go into the, into the profile. Yeah. yeah, you've got it. You want to do as many as possible. And if it's a lead glaze, you're not. If it's a lead glaze, you're kind of doing it, I, Because that lead is a substantive chemical change. If it's thick enough, you can get just the clay on the side, but that lead is going to throw you off all the time. Um, but I can starve the lead, right? I can take a spectrum that doesn't activate the lead and try to get around it that way. Do you notice things moving, like with gravity during that kiln or anything? I don't see that. Have you? Maybe with metals. Metals you definitely see. Let me show you with metals actually just how much it can happen. So let's come over here. I'm gonna use a I, when I was in I was in Yeah, I was in Taiwan last month and I saw something that shocked me. They had a, a Mycenaean sword in their collection. And so I asked them, they also have M6, which is like the tracer, but the spot size is 25 microns and it can map. And so I asked them to make a map of the entire sword. BMP, who uses BMP engineer? Rooker, that's it. Oh. <laughs> so this is the copper. Green is, oh I'm sorry, this doesn't have the labels. It's like a Windows 3. Here, <laughs> copper is green, wow. tin is red. Mm. Isn't that funky? So when I measure this of the tracer, 35% tin. When I measure this, 12% tin. So there's more tin on the blades than there is in the center. And I see this consistently. When I get when someone brings one of these Mycenaean swords up to me and asks me if it's real or fake, I take two measurements. If the tin varies, if the tin doubles on the blade, it's real. For what I don't and by the way, I don't know if this is a product of bad manufacturing, that the tin is sinking because it's heavier, or if it's on purpose, if right. there's a functional reason for doing this. I've been debating with this with the metallurgists. In Europe, in America, I cannot get a consensus on it at all. I want to write a paper on the Bronze Age that's about this very because, like, if I have 35% here and 10% here, that's technically not a bronze anymore. It's a bronze in the sense that there's carbon and tin, but it's not metallurgically bronze. So I want to write a paper that's called "I Can't Believe It's Not Bronze" <laughs> and go over all these heterogeneity issues in bronzes. But I see this all the time, where you have strong variation across the board. But is it? Usually like this, or is it very... I don't know yet. We've only been able to map one at 25 microns, right? Like, this is an N of one right now. Well, when it's out uh, to us, we have a crap ton of them. Do you have a lot of these? Yeah, we're, let's, uh, we're excavating a, like a cemetery. We have just a high of sorts. So I have a research project for you. It's okay. <laughs> this is not your specialty, but it's some low-hanging fruit. <laughs> Take the XRF next time you're in Greece and measure like this and see if you see that tin copper variation. Yeah. I guarantee you will. So when you're when you're doing this, you're literally just like going millimeter by millimeter across the entire. Oh, this is this is this is this yeah, is, how many is this is twenty five. Yeah. This is uh, this is close to a million okay. measurements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't have to do that. <laughs> you just need like yeah. five or six. Yeah, I would measure diagnostically here, here, here. Flip it over to the same. But you can see here the variation is huge. By the way, it's not just tin either. It's also lead. Lead tracks the tin. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what's happening is, is it's sinking. So when they pour the mold, they have a mold in like the dirt or something. And when they pour the alloy in, the lead drops straight to the bottom, whereas the copper tends to float to the top. And it starts to segregate. Oh, out. so maybe this is a horizontal yeah. thing and not. Exactly. Well, we, but the problem is we see the same it. relationship. There's still more tin and lead on the other side of this, too. Late Bronze Age? Yeah, Late Bronze Age. Yeah. So anyway. But I was talking to a metallurgist in the, the University of Vienna a week ago. By the way, my travel has been really tough lately. But um, we were talking about this, and he said, you're wrong. These are 10% tin, 90% copper. They could not afford to make them this way. And I'm like, I agree. Tin is coming from a very long distance away. So what I told him was, is here's the test. I can't do it, but you guys can do it if you have access to this. Whoever does it first, I will go up there with you, and we'll have a great publication. Measure it like this. If there is 35% tin in here, and it's not 10% tin, let's say they're not making their swords right, and there's a lot more tin there that's present, 
we should be able to measure the volume by putting it in sand or water, probably sand. <laughs> yeah. Put it in sand, measure the volume, and measure the weight. If it is truly a bronze, we should be able to calculate 90% copper, 10% tin if we know the volume too, right? But if there's more tin, and it is a difference in its composition, it'll weigh more, and we can test it out that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you have a week this summer? You want to come to Greece? If you, if you, can, if you can give me a plane ticket, I would love to come to Greece. Um, uh, yeah, but no, if we can do that test, we could identify whether or not this is intentional or next. I think it's intentional. The tin is on the cutting edge. So I think they're making different alloy properties in the edge and the center. But I could be wrong. The other colleague of mine in Europe had said, hey, hold on, this could be corrosion. Maybe the tin is corroding more readily than the copper. Really? And that's what you're seeing. Because you're only measuring the surface. You are able to like Exactly. Which is why the volume measurement is important. Because if we measure its volume, we can actually calculate if this is an anomaly or not. Very easily. If this is representative of the inside of the blade too, then this will weigh more for its volume. So this is an answerable question. We just can't XRF is only a part of it. We have got to have the other variables too. Yeah. So the resharpening or something, maybe, you know, maybe tin benefits. I, 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 <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. Is there like a metallic property of tin that would be better suited? But to... So let me tell you this, let me tell you this, and this is important. The reason I highlight this, so the guy who says corrosion could be it, right? But I've measured bronze all over the world in multiple cultures. The only time I see this are these guys. The only time. When I measure modern bronzes, I don't see this. So either this is a time reaction, in which case 10 is a proxy for age, which is a publishable paper, or they're using 10 in a different way, which is a publishable paper. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter what the cause is. If this is a case that older bronze objects, tint corrodes on the surface, and the reason the late bronze age shows this is because it's older than the medieval stuff, mm -hmm. using this as a chronological proxy would be huge, right? It would mean there's a chemical reaction that is a reliable indicator of chronology, and we can do it non-destructive. That's extraordinary. If, however, I'm right and it's compositionally different, these guys are not using bronze the way we understand it today. And that's important to know too. Either way, it's testable. But we need a lot of swords. So if you have if you have those swords. We have a lot of them. Yeah. Um, we also have other like we have like mirrors and other bronze objects that you could test against. Yeah. So like exactly. if, for example, if they're doing it, like if the if the bronze mirror shows up with a more uniform pattern. Whereas this shows up with a different pattern. Excellent. See that? He started the thing in a hypothesis <laughs> testing framework with XRF. That's very good. You need a unit. Um, yeah, um, but well, yeah. But is, I don't know if Kim and Jesse were working on it. Are they? I know they submitted it. They did. Okay. Our budget is meeting this year. Yeah. Next year. Okay. For better off. So all this, all the bronze came from Crete. Is that what Kim was saying? They're probably from Cyprus. From Cyprus. Yeah. I think the, the tin is probably more Anatolian. I don't know. I don't, know, I don't do metal so much. But I think the yeah. tin is mostly Anatolia. Yeah, no. The tin is Cornwall, England, or yeah. Afghanistan. There's no local tin sources in the country. There's tin in, oh, there's tin in, um, the Hittites have tin. They, they imported it, too. Oh, did, okay. I thought they were deposits. Here, just hold on. <laughs> I got a, uh, uh, give me a moment here. Let me find it. <laughs> and I can't remember its name, and it's going to drive me nuts. This is it. I can't remember where I did it in this talk, but I'm going to change it a, a lot. Uh, this is the Mediterranean stuff that I was talking about earlier. Oh, it was an agricultural conference, that's right. I actually talked to an agricultural conference with Lee Rondi. This was about agriculture. Here are ten sources, major and minor. So your major that sources... That's not that's, yeah, that's not what That's true. That's, that, the Afghanistan one is a modern finding. It postdates this publication. Because okay. after the United States invaded, scientists got a chance to look at some. Because we saw the news that they found all these economically valuable resources in the mountains of Afghanistan, and it was causing a problem. That's mm -hmm. the tin source. But it's not reflected here, but it is there, I promise. So it's like, so that's Germany? Is that 
Yeah, so Germany, Spain, England, Brittany, France. By the way, I bet you there's a ton under the ocean there too. So maybe that you know inspired some Roman Roman ventures to the north. Yeah. Maybe that's where the church, maybe that's why, uh, 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 what is it, Aeneas? Aeneas. Aeneas went over there, yeah. Aeneas. So, and then is that Laos or where? The... Yeah, no, that's Southeast Asia, that line right there. No, it's it's almost like you can see the bank, right? Thailand. Yeah, Thailand. Uh, this is Malaysia. Um, that would be Vietnam, Cambodia. Okay. Myanmar, actually, that's Myanmar. Awesome. Burma, Myanmar, yeah. And then you're coming up into Bangladesh and then into southern China. I don't think it was this stuff, though. That's too far. Um, so I think, realistically speaking, out here is where you're looking at. And they do have a shipwreck off the coast of England from the Lake Bronze Age that's carrying 10 ingots. So we do know these guys are contributing part of it. But this gets to why it's so weird to see all that tin in the sword, right? Because you don't want to be throwing that stuff around if it's coming away that long. That's a long way to transport it. So, yeah. Anyway, it's, it's super interesting. It's super interesting. Um, I got to analyze the Tim Ingots from the Uluru and Rep, by the way, yeah. when I was in Turkey. It was yeah. super cool. They are heavy as all get out. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So the, do they think that the Tim from the Uluru is also coming from England? Like, like, they don't know where it's coming from. Yeah. They have no idea, but I can tell you how they can find out. There's a trace of bismuth mm -hmm. in that tin. And we know that that tin is not recycled. Yeah. So wherever a leaves has, the has about 100 ppm bismuth, that's where you're going to find mm -hmm. that tin. But yeah, anyway, but that's the best I got. That's the best I got. I've not been in any of these mines. I don't know what's in them. Um, but I do know that uh, it wasn't Turkey. All these guys had to transport a huge distance away. And it almost certainly wasn't Rome either. Like, this is a mine deposit. It's, this is where you're getting that flux of tin. Which would make sense with the, the amber deposits that we have as well. Exactly right. Yeah. Because typically speaking, you don't just have one resource come in. Yeah. Unless it's Saudi Arabia, there's something else that they're bringing along for the ride and a little bit more money. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, but that's the, that's the tin paradox. So I have a question to get back to ceramics. Yes. Um, so you, you were saying you know, it's good to analyze a ceramic multiple times, as many times as possible. Yes. For this, for this reason, because... And so practically speaking, when you do that, yeah. Like, Holding the instrument on the object and taking multiple scans is, is easy. Mm -hmm. But then when you, you combine them and you create an average, it depends. So let's say you do the, you analyze them and you discover there's a residue on the inside that has phosphorus and sulfur that's localized. You throw that measurement out on the average of the rest. Let's say you measure the surface and you find out, oh, there's some kind of slip that was added. You throw that out and then you use the internal stuff. So, so this is what I'm, this is important to look yeah. at the spectrum mm -hmm. yes. before you process stuff so that you know how all those things are overlapping and relative to each other. Exactly right. And um, I'm working on a project in Israel where they did it beautifully. They measured the, in the, in the name, they had the ID of the sample, a code for the position, and then a measurement number sequentially. So then that way I could parse that information and throw in all the slips or even measure the slips separately, right? I could source the slips separate from the clay. Because if we know that aluminum is only coming from the top 20 micrometers, that's the slip measurement right there. What's a slip? It's where you have like a surface treatment. Yeah, so you have got a ceramic, and I dip it in a lighter ceramic, it's very fluid, and then that just kind of creates a coating of paint on the surface. It's still a, it's still a clay, but it's a surface treatment. Like if you see those Acoma pots from New Mexico, they're just beautiful. Those are almost always slipped. Like well, the red red line figure you're showing us, that's a mm -hmm. slip rather than glaze. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Right. Yep. All exactly. the pottery from Middle America, yeah. yeah, those are slips. And Whereas exactly. all glazes are silver based. Yes. Right. Yeah. Well, white glazes are a bit different. Well, yeah. 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 I mean, historically, yes. Yeah. Um, and then, by the way, the reason you multiple measurements <laughs> are for this ceramic here, I can see that it's different. So but here, you actually, so there are multiple points for Yeah, the exactly. Okay. So you look right here. This guy is NN0260. I say that they're clustering together and that they're separate from this, so that tells me this is from a different source. I need multiple measurements because there's noise. I need to see what the median falls, and that's what's important. I recommend plotting all together, not just the median, the, the means, because you kind of get a better sense of what the distribution is when they're all together like this. But I can see that the majority of these come from the same place, and that there's that one, there's that one, um, and then these two are obviously outliers that don't tell me much of anything. 
If I had just taken one measurement and I saw that, and I attribute it to a different source, what it clearly is. Because all but the that, other measurements are up here. I was going to say, but that, so that blue dot is along with the other blue dot. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you can see the axis right there, right? And you can see there, it's the slope. Not the actual value, the slope of the ratio. That's the most important, which is why you want more than one measurement. Because that will tell you the slope. A measurement of one doesn't have a slope. Yeah. So yeah. So that's that's the analysis you want to do for ceramic sourcing. But for all of those, like, you, I'm assuming it's better to do like the disc tape itself, because then you're taking out like you don't have the, the surface treatment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't yeah. Have the if, you, stuff. if you want, if it's the clay that's important to you, just do the clay. Yeah. In this project, we were looking at. Well, this project we're looking at our tablets, so we yeah. knew yeah. it was it wasn't slip. But absolutely, absolutely. But you could also do the same thing where you're like, I'm going to take like four or five along the clay break, yep. and then like four or five in the slip itself. You got it. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yep. Exactly. You've got the picture. So that's it's and just then, a lot of time. And so then and some for something like that, it's just like don't use any filters or any of the calibrations first. It's yeah. just good to just look at the spectrum and then once you've done that, you can apply the calibrations. You don't have to go back and shoot again with the calibration. That's okay. correct. Okay. That's correct. Okay. So let's say you measure all these and you measure with the with the parameter and you're like, oh shoot, that's not how I calibrate this object. Yeah. You can post calibrate after the fact. Okay. Post process the data if you want to, but you can't post filter because no. the filters are no. It, it, it's like photograph. I can't. Yeah. I, I can edit the photograph, but I can't yeah. go back in time and change what I yeah. photo was. Exactly right. Yep. You got it. The ceramics are getting there. <laughs> by the way, <laughs> this is why I disagree with Robert Schiefman <laughs> on his criticisms of ceramic sourcing because he's trying to do it like obsidian, and I agree with him. I wouldn't. I don't think obsidian is the best framework for doing that, but I think this is very insightful. Um, I think you can still find clusters that are different. Do I think I can find the pit where this comes from that's different? I don't know that I can do that, but I can still tell that it's from somewhere different than the other pieces. And if I have enough contextual information, I can piece out what's brought in and what's not, which is typically really what ceramic sourcing is about, mm -hmm. is figuring out local production versus imports. Yeah, right. right. So, yeah. So, the paper that he's written, um, the one that I just showed you earlier, mm -hmm. where he's critiquing the reliability of the Bruker uh, uh, mud rock standards mm -hmm. versus the ones that he's created. Mm -hmm. He's he's creating that new, those new standards to more to better to more, more similarly mimic obsidian sourcing. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and that's not really and that's not the right framework. I don't think Obidian strong in terms of and PPM is going to tell you anything about the source of the ceramic. I think maybe in some extreme cases. So, for example, the one time I would change that opinion is here. No, sorry, that's not it. Oh, darn, it's not on here. That's okay. It's here. Do you see these blue ones break out? And the green one? That's SUSE. Negative entry. The reason this is happening is because the strong team is 0.1%. And the strong team is by the yttrium and changing its, its calibration. So it's black firing in the calibration. But, but that's still something that you could pick up with the mud rock. Because yes. The, mud rock the, new mud the, rock, the new mud rock would not have this problem. The old mud rock has the problem. Okay. Exactly right. Yeah. But yeah, in any case, but obviously these I can source effortlessly. They're substantially different because of strong healing. Because of strong healing. Do blue and green are different, or blue and green are different from that? So the blue and green are all SUSE because okay. these are not these are just the artifact numbers. But I know from the data set this is all SUSE. SUSE is like in southern Iran, um, second oldest city on Earth. We don't tell them that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're very sensitive. Um, but yeah, um, these are the Elamites. After Chattanooga? No, after I mean true true city, not like gathering of, 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 of agriculturalists, like organized central redistributive economic church center. I think. Oh, what is the first? Susa is like the second. The first is in southern Iraq. It's not Ur. Ur is third. They're not Nimrud. No, it's not Nimrud. It's Ulubrud or something or something like that. Or um Baruch. Baruch. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, we got that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Samara is it is Samara. Yeah, it's like, like, like Ur. Ur. <laughs> Get it? Get yeah. it? Yeah, but anyway, um, but yeah, like I agree with them. Like here's the niobium. I don't see much of anything happening with niobium at all, right? But the aluminum silicon, 
which I would never use for obsidian, because what's the point, actually does break out groups. But it doesn't break them up in clusters, it breaks them out in different slopes. And that's what you want to use. It's not as easy, and you need to do a lot more legwork, because most archaeologists are not doing this, as far as I can tell. But this can be insightful. Anyway, does that make sense? I hope it's helpful. <coughs> All right, where is here? All right, so continuing on. If I have a couple really good buddies, that would be iron and manganese. The ratio of manganese to iron tells you how much oxygen is in the water. Manganese, Mn2+, precipitates out of oxygenated water, so it's the anti molybdenum So the more manganese relative to iron, or really the more manganese relative to titanium or aluminum, the only reason you manganese iron is because they're next to each other and they fluoresce, but that will tell you oxygenation of the water. So it's the opposite signal. So if you don't have a redox situation, you can use this ratio to tell you the relative oxygen amount in the water. And here's an example of this. So here, we have the manganese, the manganese and iron ratio. The manganese iron ratio pops up the more life is in the water column. Do you see that black dead zone? That's when I have less manganese relative to iron. So the manganese iron ratio is very much a good indicator for oxygen. There are other things that can cause magnesium to get there. I don't want to mislead you. But if you have to bet make a bet, manganese relative to iron is a very good proxy for oxygen. Yep. There. So now I've got older, crappier, <laughs> terrible versions. And this would tell me pyrite and low oxygen conditions. So iron and sulfur together. So manganese to iron is oxygen, iron to sulfur, iron and sulfur is low oxygen. And that would be the formation of pyrite. Now you may say I don't have fool's gold in my mycenaean ceramic. You would be wrong. There might be little flecks of pyrite, invisible to our eye, but nonetheless still indicative of an oceanic pr uh, process. And we do get it from egg eating pottery. <coughs> do you? You get, you get oh. little flecks of pyrite. So you can see them? Yeah. So you'll know, look for iron and sulfur. That tells you right away those ceramics might be diagnostic with DXRF, even if you can't see the flecks. By the way, I think it comes up on Crete, there's a source of ceramic that has a ton of an uh, the, the, this element B, it's right next to titanium. Don't know where it is, don't know what's up, but it's super unique on it. But Cretan ceramics can sometimes show up as being highly different too. Alright, so it's pyrite. Phosphorus indicates nutrient availability. So the more phosphorus you see, the more that indicates bionic light is present. That is just as true for ceramics as well. Sometimes that phosphorus is preserved in the heating cycle. So if that clay is present, that can indicate bioactivity. By the way, same deal in uh, archaeological sites, obviously, right? What do we use to identify human occupations? Of? Phosphorus. phosphorus. Same rules. Phosphorus actually really indicates any life is present. It's just humans concentrate in a place like deer don't. And so they're a little bit unique spatially compared to other mammals on uh, North America. What are the cr critiques for using phosphorus in the Maya area for um, intensive activity areas as they they haven't scanned all different activity areas to understand the variation in phosphorus That's fair. That's across fair. a cityscape. That's fair. So it's very fair. If markets are indicative of high phosphorus areas, then living spaces shouldn't have high phosphorus because they're not as active as markets, but yeah. nobody's really done it across yeah. That's a fair. landscape. That's fair. No, definitely worth looking at. Um, uh, I, I've been very sold in the phosphorus thing from the, from the data I've looked at in general, but I couldn't get to the specifics of habitation versus market or this activity or that activity. That's one, yeah. of, the, that's one of the things that's certain tar, right? Oh, very good. Uh, good luck. <laughs> I, hope you, I hope that works out. And I hope you get an extra rep too to do that, because that's because the resolution to get the extra rep is just fantastic. Did let me phosphorus? Like what? Let me, here, let me show you what I'm talking about. It's kind of low, isn't it? It is very low. But when you have specific activity, it's high. So, for example, this is from a room block in Shapokoyo, in Turkey. Here I've got the east and the north. And I can see highly localized phosphorus deposits. And the phosphorus, as you know, mineralogically is not common. It's very low. 
That's why we have to use fertilizer to grow plants because it's so low. But when you have human activity, cooking and cleaning and all that, phosphorus tends to deposit like hyper locally, like in a little 30 square centimeter area is where you can see those pockets. Um, in this case, we map with the tracer very slowly, but that gives you an idea of how it works. Wow. So what, like, what's our scale there? Uh, we did every 40 centimeters. But if you, like, paint to green, what's the Oh, change this, is zero, this is net counts in our caps. So this net isn't counts. quantitative. Okay. So this would be the photon intensity. So we went from zero counts to 900 counts per second. That's a lot. It is. It is. It's not nothing. It's quite a bit. Um, we did the same thing for chlorine, by the way, to see where the salt was coming. And here's a punctuated deposit, and here's where it filtered out. Have I ever told you the story about, uh, about chlorine in Chateaupoya? Mm -hmm. So when I was in Chateaupoya, they had this problem where salt was causing some erosion in the bulk walls. And like it was starting to degrade and crumble and all that. So basically, um, they wanted to use the tracer and figure out where it was coming from. Their best, uh, the, the thought process was that there was like some groundwater with salt that was coming up and causing the problem. So I went to Chateau and I went, uh, and I was with this brewing gal from Cardiff, I can't remember her name, um, and we were analyzing the, the, we went over it and we analyzed uh, the bulk wall, or the ground that has all the salt. And what we found was that there was a silicon peak and a chlorine peak. So we could see the salt just fine. Sodium would have been better, but chlorine is still pretty indicative. So I saw silicon and chlorine, and it was a sediment. So then we analyzed the mud brick wall. What's a mud brick wall made out of? Just dirt, right? Clay and dirt. So we measure that. I can't see silicon. I only see chlorine. Is that possible? No, it's a mud brick wall. Of course there's silicon in it. Why would I only see chlorine and not silicon? What would possibly cause silicon not to show up in the spectrum? If it was covered up, right? If something was on top of the silica. That told me the salt was in higher concentrations in the mud brick wall. It was layered on top than it was in the ground. That's not consistent with salt water. That's consistent with someone like pouring salt water on top of it. So that was like really confusing. So we could rule out groundwater right there. So then I said, well, we need a control measure. Because if it's groundwater, it should be outside the site, too. So we walked outside, because Ian Hodder had built these buildings around each of the sites. We walked outside, we analyzed the ground, no chlorine whatsoever. And I thought, the buildings. So we went in, and we measured every component that they used in the manufacture of the shelters. And in the far right corner, we found a vinyl window shade, mm -hmm. made of PVC, polyvinyl chloride. What was happening is in the winter, snow would build up outside this window, it would melt, water would come through the polyvinyl chloride, pull out chlorine anions, and then wash it over the site. And then that would react with the sodium oxide that was naturally in the soil, and then you have salt. So I told the gal, the, 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 the art conserv uh, conservation student this, and she went up to tell Ian Hodder, and I went back to go use the restroom, and then I realized, oh, I forgot my filter box over at the building. I got over there. There was a construction crew already taking the building, the, the building components down. Ian Hodder was like, that. Wow. I was wanting to it. I was shocked. So, anyway. Um, yeah, but that's what you see here. This is where the chlorine was dripping in on the floor, and you can see it wash over. So, yeah, anyway. By the way, don't use tarps if you can avoid it archaeology sites, because if they have PVC, and you get a couple winters, you're actually dropping a ton of chlorine at the site and chemically altering it. Mm -hmm. Just FYI, don't do not do that. You use the you get burlap sacks Test it, test it first. Measure the target and see if it's PVC or not. Okay. If it's not PVC, you're fine. If it is PVC, don't use it. I, str I can't strongly recommend this enough. Like, it, it has long-term consequences. That's if you're, like, leaving it on something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. If it's like an overnight thing, it's not. Like, <laughs> like, you just use like tarp for shade or something. Let me put it this way. If, it's gonna, if there's one winter that is going to pass, yeah. don't use it. Because then the water can have to get it in. This actually upset me because when I was at Chocolate Canyon, they used PVC pipes to create a water system. Yeah. And so they're actually creating localized damage there with that system, which is really frustrating. But yeah, don't use PVC in archaeology sites. This is this is what it is. It is not in there. Can we take a break? Yes, let's take a break. Sorry. It's already 2 o'clock. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so, just kidding. Uh, uh, I warned you. I'll keep talking. <laughs> you don't stop me. Kidding. How do you yeah. eat? Do you eat? Yeah. He lives on a gym. I do. That's all I do. Yeah. Um, he's got three three three. Analyzer. He's, he's got everything he needs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Turns out there's a class in here. Oh, okay. Um, 
Yeah. Well, it's definitely not long enough to take a lunch break. Um, I don't mind powering through. Okay. I might. I might. Yeah. Um, we can just hang here until three thirty and then exit out and call it a day. And I actually wanted to. Uh, there's a talk at three that I was going to video before. Okay. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. So let's. Yeah, let, we'll we'll start. I'm almost to the end of this geochemistry thing anyway. So yeah. Anyway, is it helpful at all? I don't know. This 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 is very good. Yeah. No, this is very good. Yeah, I mean, I've heard reference to these various ratios. The, the, it's always in passing. There's never like a, an explanation of what's right. going the, on. The, the yeah. logistics and the, and it incorporates the logistics of doing this too. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, that's why I was asking. Okay, if you're going to take 15 measurements. What do you do with those 15 measurements afterwards? Yeah, exactly. No, this is. I've seen people when I was at, at University of Florida, mm -hmm. and working in their curation. There were people coming over and analyzing ceramics um, from Florida archaeological sites, and they had a tracer, mm -hmm. and they were scanning. And I said, "Well, what do you do after this?" This is before I started really learning about it. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, well, we just average all of our signatures. Like, well, if you don't ever scan the inside of the vessel mm -hmm. at a cross section. You're only you only have exteriors. <laughs> it's just like yeah. you need all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there's, there's something that you're fundamentally missing yes. from the variation Absolutely. from that pottery. Absolutely. And they just kind of shook their head and they're like, no, we know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I said, mm -hmm. that's fair. Like, yeah. I'm not here to critique, but if I was going to create an average of anything, I'd want to analyze every side of it, yes. not just the bias inside Absolutely. outside. Exactly right. Exactly Even if right. the vessel isn't split. Exactly right. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Because the surface changes different than the middle changes mm -hmm. in the firing process. Yep. You got it. So yeah, no, I, I, I recommend to try to take, like, I like to measure like a cube, six measurements all around mm -hmm. as best as I can. If I can't. If I can't, I can't. But yeah, yeah that'd be my recommendation. Like, four sophomore. Mm -hmm. Like a cube, all the faces of the cube. Treat the ceramic like a cube and measure all of it. So that would be the best, I think. So those kind of things are are, uh, are good just logistically because I have I've read about ceramic sourcing, but I've never read about anybody saying this is where we took them. This is how long we think we scanned them. Yeah, it just gives you the geochemistry and says here's our clusters, and it's like, well, I know you're, you're missing telling me how you actually like pick it up and do something. Exactly, like, well, exactly. It, it, that's not included in the writing. Yeah, yeah and also the inclusions are different. Different. You can't you get pretty big differences in okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's actually one of the reasons why an extra rep can be a negative, and why you might want to use EDS for smaller shards mm -hmm. to measure them, because then you can target one specific area. Yeah, we, we actually had a, a little workshop on the EDS component. Yeah. It was partial because it wasn't calibrated yet, it couldn't really show us. It has a firewire plug that was loose. Oh, yeah. So you could get us another XP laptop that's all over the Gotcha. But anyway, uh, they were warning us that you can zoom into whatever, 20,000x or something, because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an SEM. Mm -hmm. But the EDS isn't that, isn't, can't go in that far. But you're actually, it's, a, it's, not, you know, it's, it's much more pinpoint than XRF, but not yeah. as much as the optical or the SEM. That makes sense. Uh, zoom. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. The, um, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. So, yeah, what they say, yeah. I, so if I can ask about Gabriel's question, how are their workshops? Are they, are they entertaining? Are they fun? Anyway, um, so, gotcha. so real quick, Gabby, we realized we've got to close at 3 o'clock. Um, just so 3 30. 3 30 ish. Three three but well, you need to videotape something at 3 oh, right? Yeah, well, I have to turn take the camera at 3. Yeah, so. Got so four, gotcha, that works. So, what we'll do is we'll aim to close around 3, and then, because I know you guys are hungry, um, maybe do like an early dinner if you're okay with that. Sure. Um, or like a mixed dinner, lunch. I don't know if that works for you. Um, you um, that works. <laughs> yeah, no, good call. Good After call. Well, oh, I'm good. I, I, I've got a dairy allergy, so I, I'm good. Um, but no, I usually don't eat lunch, though. I, I, I just eat a really good, you guys saw, I eat a phenomenally large like, dinner. Right? That's my meal of the day. Yeah, go ahead and grab some snacks, and I'll keep going. Sorry about the schedule thing. I didn't even realize it was already 2 o'clock. I don't know either. <laughs> yeah, no, I. I, I have, I've had some really embarrassing times where I just keep talking and talking and people are just too shy to do <laughs> anything and, yeah, anyway. So I thought it was going to be new. <laughs> so. Yeah, that works, that works.
No. Lot, it's very information dense, this part. And it's very advanced. Like, you know, we're, we weren't kidding when we advertised a more advanced discussion. So, um, I kind of feel like when the information density hits a certain point, your brain just starts to slow down. Right. And, yeah. You know, yeah. And if you want, I can create an edited version of this presentation and give it to you if that's helpful, because yeah, sure. I need to take out all the stuff that uh, is relevant to an NDA or something. I don't know why they had me sign an NDA. It's not like, I guess it is in the military base. But anyway, um, but yeah. Well, but it, it, it would be helpful. I mean, I know we have a video of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, having it to review and all that. <laughs> but yeah, the, the key takeaway I hope you're getting at is that understanding the context of formation for the clay is the central to understanding the ability to source. That's where I think guys like uh, speak. Not that I disagree with speaking too much on much. Uh, we agree on the dynamics of things, but I do think he's unduly critical of ceramic sourcing because he's using obsidian stuff. He's thinking like geospatial. Yeah, I, th I think there's a lot you can do, but I think the difference is, is you need to accept that it's not going to be sourcing to a specific deposit so much sure, as more like a region. yeah, clearly being able to divide out and identify yeah these areas. And I think in your case, when you have long distance transport across an ocean, it's a lot easier. I think if you're looking at a cluster of sites outside Chicago, yeah. then it's a lot tougher. Um, but if you're dealing with two disparate cultures separated by a sea, you know, it's an easier job. Yeah, though I also think there's a lot of other interesting questions that you can ask yeah. with the X-ray. I, I think the I cannot believe it's not bronze aspect. I was just like, I really want to do that. Like, I know. <laughs> Actually, if I can give advice uh, as someone to someone who went through grad school to someone who's going through grad school, when I was in school, paleoclimate was all I lived and breathed. I was just fascinated with it. I only did this dumb XRF thing because a friend asked me to and he really needed help. Mm -hmm. And that ended up giving me a whole career. You don't know what's going to be important. Yeah. And so don't box yourself in too much. Explore a lot of different things in grad school. Mm -hmm. It is your time to explore. Oh, yeah. As Lucas and Kathy and Nico can tell you, once you're done through that process and you're focused on something, you don't have the same freedom to break away and do yeah. other things. Like, you're kind of boxed in. <laughs> I'm doing this Monday, Tuesday, and then tomorrow I'm going to a Hearst to do some photogrammetry on their Egyptology collection. Oh, nice. To create a 3D printed photo coll or collection of things that they can use in the exhibit that's coming up. Nice. Mm -hmm. so, that's a great week to have all this happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, then tonight is the main night, so I have to go and quick run and help. Let's, let's, let's I really enjoy that. You should, actually, yeah, you're around, so um, you could come and see pictures of our bronze. So yeah, yeah. every day, every year, we do. It's mostly aimed for the donors, but it's mm -hmm. May and night, where the idea is, is we like we have a night where we have a little reception beforehand, so you can have some nice May and wine. It's really mm -hmm. great. You guys should come to if you want. Um, and then we have like basically an hour long presentation where my advisor walks mm -hmm. through all the stuff that we did from last season. Oh, cool. Um, and so this, she was on sabbatical last year, so this is actually two years of excavation, oh, all right. um, which includes you know one big tomb. Um, 104. That mm -hmm. is, we had a lot of bronzes. Oh, um, cool. Specifically, we had where, where's work. the site? Cydonia, it's just to the west of the Maya. Okay, cool. Yeah. It's just north of my scene. Yeah. Oh, is it? Nazis yeah. had a long standing project there. You're going back to the 150s? Yeah, so we, so Berkeley has owned the, the rights for Nemea for a long time. I yeah. Mean, it's something like the 50s. Steve Miller. Back. Yeah, Steve Miller started there. Mm -hmm. So that's, we, we work there as well. We haven't been digging. Mm -hmm. uh, we live there too. And then my advisor, Kim Shelton, um, she's basically been working at Mycenae for like over, I don't know, like 15 years, something like that. And that's a, a ceramic production center, which mm -hmm. is the reason why I'm interested because the, the, the ceramics that are being produced there, I think, are actually from that specific workshop we're showing up in Egypt, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is interesting. Gotcha. Um, but then just in the last four or five years, we've started working at Ivonia, which is very close to the Maya, all of our materials in the museum at the Maya, so just walk into work, uh, work on it. But it's, it's a Bronze Age chamber tomb cemetery. We've dug, we, we've got to, we've done four tombs now. Um, two of, one has been almost completely looted, one has been partially looted, yeah. uh, and the two of them have not been looted at all. Mm -hmm. And in those two, we've got a lot of bronze materials. Uh, so we've got a lot of, a lot of gold, some amber, yeah. stuff like that. Awesome. Um, so if you if you are free and you want to come tonight, well, I, mean, I, I I wish my flight leaves at seven, so oh, I'm guessing yeah. it's not gonna yeah, work yeah. out. But I wouldn't know what to book that book it tomorrow. But that's all right. Um, but yeah. But anyway, um, what were we talking about before? We're talking about the my brain is short. Yeah, I was gonna say it's like ceramic, bronze. I mean, I guess the key point is do the do the bronze thing too. Just, right. I definitely want to. Yeah, take yeah. it take it and own it. Yeah. I will tell you right now. Give up the equipment. You own it. 
I will email you about this. You can yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, so, the one that you showed, is that the only sword that you've done that on? The only one. Okay, and you said it was from Taiwan. Because it was at the Chimay Museum, so it was part of someone's art collection. So the okay. very negative, that very well could be looted. Right? It's an art, it's a billionaire who donated it to an art museum. Yeah. So we it's just, I knew what it was, and I yeah. thought, we've got this, like, there's like 10 of these that exist on Earth. Yeah. We have the interest. Let's do it right okay, now. we've got like 10 of them from our site. But I'll tell you right now, if you can send those to Taiwan, they would be interested. Because, like, the gal who did this is interested in that archaeology wants to publish on it. She's a yeah. scientist in Taiwan. But she's, like, her specialization is art conservation. She's just got an academic interest in this. Yeah. So if there is an ability to do this analysis, you do have a partner I can hook you up with yeah. to do this fine level work. Mm -hmm. um, we just, they can't leave the country. They're not allowed to leave the museum. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. So. Is, it, um, is it possible there was surface treatment that affected your measurement? It's very possible, but if it's affecting my measurement there, it's affected my measurement the entire time I've ever looked at anything from the stage. Right. And I just have a hard time believing that that's what's so happening. The, the, story, yeah. the only one because of the equipment. They, they, it's the only one I've looked at with a quarter, you know, oh. quarter million dollar micro XRF. Yeah, I've looked at probably 50 of these things with a handheld. And I, like, remember that Sparta site that was uh, in the news? Uh, there was like a, uh, a late Bronze Age. Oh, well, the new palace. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I, was, I was invited by the Greek Ministry of Culture to look at that sword cluster. It's like this, it's like the size of half this table, and it's just like 30 of the things all yeah. stuck together. And I just sequentially boom, 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 and I showed them. The 20, 30 percent tin that was on those guys too. Just on the, but again, just on the edges. I can only measure the blade on that one because most of them, the blade was the only thing stuck out. And the one on the top, I was able to show the difference where the middle had lower tin. Now, again, maybe this is an age-dependent corrosion thing. In which case, maybe there's a way to date these things based yeah. on the corrosion of tin. Um, I don't know, but I, but my, I suspect my instinct is, is that this is related to corrosion because I don't see the same thing in Asia when I look at Asian bronzes. Just me. But it is or is not related to corrosion? I don't think it's related to corrosion. You don't? Okay. I don't think it's related. I hope it is. Yeah. I think it'd be cool. I hope that criticism is right. I don't think it's corrosion. Yeah. I think it's composition. But again, that's why we test. The thing is, because we can only measure the surface, we need to be able to test the weight. If it really is 30 to 10 percent tin, that means its average is around 20 percent, which means it should be measurably heavier for its volume, heavier, more dense than it would be if it was just copper. So we need to use Archimedes uh, on the assist to figure it out. Yeah. Because again, the extra is surface method. Or we drill through the center, which I do not want to do. Especially not to the extent we need to test heterogeneity. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. That'd be, that'd be fun. Um, if for whatever reason, um, if you can work it out, um, if you can give me a plane ticket, I can bring this and figure that out. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I can just toss it to someone. Or yeah, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Um, but that'd be fun to do. Is there a way to like rent these? <laughs> Like, not really. Yeah. Uh, not at least from. I guess I can rent this one, but I wouldn't feel right doing it. No, this one is calibrated. The bronzes, though, so yeah. it can be done. But, um, but anyway, um, typically speaking, no one rents them because the, the the risk is too high. Um, they'd be like fifty thousand dollar piece. Like imagine, I I, I was gonna say rent a car if we were that the time. That's because there's a huge market for it. Like if something goes wrong, is that your fault or is the person who rented it to you's fault? Yeah. That's the really reason why you have. Why you don't see too many. Anyway, but the, yeah. Oh, sorry, can you finish your thought? Oh, I was just going to say, the instrument I was using, though, to measure that Spartan collection was his 1878. <laughs> <laughs> just going to bring that up again. That was yeah. my European <laughs> instrument. <laughs> you can hire Far Western to uh, analyze bronzes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was that, would new, that would be a new market for us. There you go. Yeah. All together. Um, that might be a serious option. Right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. sample. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What were you going to ask, Kathy? Um, how, like, so you have these profiles from different kinds of ceramic. How yeah. discrete are these geologically and how homogenous? Like, like, do you have this basin and you've got your clay? It, so, right, in three dimensions, if it's a basin, it's going to look like a cereal bowl. That's maybe, it could be the size of two footballs, it could be the size of a city, right? It could scale up to incredible dimensions. Um, it's, it's totally random. But it's typically a soup bowl shaped thing where you've got a, a center and then it kind of wings out at the edges. So, chemically though, like how consistent are these um, profiles, these element profiles? Depends on where you are and how much oxygen is in the system, right? So, like, it's not like the ocean is not binary. It's not like there's a cube of anoxia 
I mean, right. everything outside okay. is good. So it's going to be a gradient depending on where oh, you are. Oh, okay. Yeah, see. absolutely. That's true for almost all formations, though. Like, no formation is pure throughout. There's always changes within that. So, yeah. And by the way, the other thing that will mess people up is you can have stratigraphic horizons of volcanic eruptions that are millions of years old show up in them, too. For example, I can show this data. Um, let me see if I can find it, though. So, desktop, projects, Dakota Pond map, analysis. So this, oh yeah, there it is. So this, I don't know if you've ever driven by Denver. Let me bring up photos up, hopefully there's nothing embarrassing here. to the Rocky Mountains, this is the entire age of the dinosaurs from getting to end in one hillside. Uh, and it's, it's the Rocky Mountain uplift just tilted all those mountains. Okay. So when you find down here about a dinosaur found in, in, in Colorado, it's usually along here, but it stretches from New Mexico to Wyoming. This is like a lens of dinosaurs, a straight line. Anyway, I thought, you know would be fun? Let's take a tracer and let's measure every 40 centimeters across the whole darn thing. So that way I'm doing a whole formation analysis by hand. So I can see how different is this one, how different is this one, how different is this one. Okay, you're doing core analysis on the side of the hill. Exactly right, exactly right. And here is my result for yttrium. This is a PPM, by the way. These are volcanic eruptions. And this, that ash layer, 300 PPM yttrium. Well, Have you ever seen that? No. no. This is a unique volcanic system that existed somewhere on Earth. I have no idea why. I'm not the first to see this. But you can use these clays to make ceramics. What happens if you grab here versus here? You have a totally different elemental signature for the same geologic formation. So, yes, the geologic formation. This is another reason why clay sourcing is so hard. I don't think you can ever truly get to the pit that this ceramic comes from. I don't think you can do it. But can you tell differences to answer archaeological questions? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. No question. But that would be the scenario. But that's an example of how much variation you can have in a single formation. Wow. It's huge. It's absolutely huge. By the way, there are other ratios we can do here that can do climate. Do I have... I hope I have it here. By the way, this is the zirconium to rubidium ratio. So I can see sediment size there. Oh, so you can do rubidium instead of well, let's see. No. Zirconium rubidium is the it's that's zirconium rubidium that's the sediment size. <coughs> higher higher ZR to RB means higher particle size. Let me see if I can find it here. The mm -hmm. really exciting one is NB to rubidium. In what in what geology geology? Is that that's in the marine layers or? Uh, this. No, I mean, this is marine. Medium. This is marine. That's uh, terrestrial. But the answer to your question is in both. In both marine and terrestrial, zirconium and rubidium should be part of the size. Basically, the bigger the sediment, the more likely it is to have zircon crystals, is what's going on. Mm -hmm. and the smaller it is, the less likely. Because zircon crystals have a certain size, so if you shrink down below, there's just not enough space to hold them anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the part of the size effect works. Do you think it's possible there's a relationship with the Fact that they're coming into higher energy and you have to get deeper with the earth, sorry? Could be. Um, it very well could be. I don't know for sure whether uh, whether or not that would be the case. Um, I, my understanding was zircon crystals, but I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or maybe they're harder to measure if they're in small particles. Cause but the X, the, I mean, the X-ray should the, the particle size shouldn't matter. It shouldn't be air gaps or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is just it, it, it is really honestly as embarrassingly simple as. You see more um, uh, uh, more zirconium. By the way, here's an example for this. So we've got two formations. This is the Cretaceous. This gray stuff is the Jurassic. Here, if I do zirconium to rubidium and potassium to titanium, I can almost perfectly pull the two out from each other. So this would be an example of formation clustering. 
rather than within the formation of those fragments. Mm -hmm. And here, that volcanic ash doesn't, you can see the volcanic ash spike there, but it's not as big of a deal. So you can absolutely pick out different signatures. Where is that, Dakota? Dakota, uh, Dakota is the name of the geologic formation, and then Morrison is the other formation. Uh, Mor Colorado? Yeah, they're both in Mo they're both in Co Morrison, Colorado is a town. That's Red Rocks, right? Um, Morrison is also the name of the formation where you find all the dinosaurs that you see in museums, like Allosaurus, Diplodocid, Stegosaurus. Mm -hmm. They all come from not just that formation, but near the town, too. Mm -hmm. But here's another one that works particularly well. So you can source formations mm -hmm. this way, too. But there's a difference between sourcing between formations and within a formation, right? And you'll need to do both for ceramics. Anyway, um, that's just proof of concept stuff. I just had a lot of fun doing this, but yeah, it was a good, it was a good couple days. But it, it, it was a ton of work because it took us two whole days of just slowly walking half a meter, and you can get a sense of how big of an area that is from the cuts. But yeah, it was a lot of work, but it was cool. We need to publish it at some point because I think there's some cool information about the. Uh, uh, fluid dynamics. How long was your assay time? Uh, we did 30 seconds. And then we did. We had two tracers. One person did light, one person did trace. Oh, cool. So we had the guy doing trace with a 5i, and then I was coming back with a 3SB with the vacuum and measuring right behind him. So yeah, it was good times. Mm -hmm. I also got, I think, the best single action shot of any human using a tracer. Because uh, you're right on that formation boundary there. Mm -hmm. Bright student, luckily went to college. We were worried. He's from a real poor family, couldn't afford it, but we thought it was worth <coughs> it. Um, let's go back over here. Here it is. So, anyway, we were on phosphorus, and I increased the nutrients, and you can see. When phosphorus peaks up, where you get a biotically active zone. Same is true for your ceramics. If for whatever reason you've got a super productive ocean, you're more likely to find phosphorus in that. But be careful, that could also be organic residues from use wear too. So that's why you want to measure multiple parts. If it's use wear, it won't be on the outside, but it will be on the inside, right? So you see a localized deposit. And as a bonus, you can use that, send it off for analysis, and figure out what proteins are there. And you can actually maybe identify what they're eating. All right. Next up. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys. Bromine. So bromine likely indicates biologic activity as well, but you will see it on the trace scheme. It's not the only way you see bromine, but you can see bromine as a trace. It's a little awkward to use, but yeah. And here's an example where we've got total, total organic content and then bromine. And you can see the alignment right there. So bromine can indicate organic content as well. So I don't know why. This one's truly mysterious to me. But I know when, when I've worked in settings where we know a lake in an archaeological context has basically gone dead and brackish, the bromine drops. So bromine is definitely tracing biotic activity, um, but I don't know the direct connection between why. What does the TOC stand for? Total Organic Content, TOC. Uh, inorganic would be TIC, TikTok. TikTok. Yeah, I got it. So bromine on its own, no ratio. Here's a separate paper, right? Bromine, and this is just the extra counts and total organic content per center. It's a pretty sharp relationship. So bromine can be a sourcer too. And it, what's nice about it is phosphorus can be recycled back into the ecosystem, right? Like, that's the problem with using it as a biological indicator. Bromine is not really useful, so it stays. So bromine can be a nice passive indicator of biotic activity. So if you have a Mycenaean ceramic with a lot of bromine, Mycenaean, and then you've got an Egyptian ceramic with less, and you see bromine is trending, that tells you the Mycenaean clay source had more biologic activity, and now you can focus in on that. It's and what the reason I bring this up is it's not a dumb correlation. You know how to tell the difference between random chance and this is an environmental indicator, and that's why it's important. All right. Chlorine. Chlorine is probably primarily a problem, but it usually indicates a problem with data collection, of course. 
So for example, what happens is, if I take a core from an ocean and I set it on the ground, what happens to the water inside that core? It evaporates. And as it evaporates, it carries chlorine to the top and deposits it. So for people trying to do environmental reconstruction, chlorine is a massive problem. It will be for you too. Like use wear, site use, that can cause chlorine too. So I don't recommend making any arguments on chlorine. <laughs> Right, like it's almost certainly not going to be from the clay. It's going to be something else that's added in after the fact, or an object of preservation. So do not use chlorine. Do not make insects from it. All that jazz. Um, I, I avoid it as much as we can. It doesn't mean chlorine, in principle, can't be used scientifically. But for either sourcing or for um, environmental reconstruction, it's more of a distraction, which is why I use the azalea. <laughs> I can tell you when <coughs> tarps are contaminating your site. Oh yeah, that's a that's a negative one. All right, so let's go over. This is again a new climate discussion, but the same principles are true for your ceramics, just in a different context. Calcium is typically a relative, not an absolute indicator, because there's always calcium, <coughs> but its relative changes to something else can tell you something about the environment it's in. Clay. <coughs> to do clay, you need to clay fractions. You want to use correlations between alumina, silicon, potassium, titanium, iron, and A if you can see it. That's also typically a clay. Uh, um, um, and that will tell you the clay fraction. Um, so we use that in pores because if I use the correlation between silicon and potassium, for example, if I get an R squared of 70, that can sometimes tell me about 70% is clay. It sounds weird, but that correlation actually is a good proxy for the total content of clays. Because that tells me 30% of the iron is not found in clay, potassium, thus there's a non-clay component. For organics, you want to check for vanadium, chromium, nickel, molybdenum, and uranium. Also, boromine can indicate activity as well. Um, typically speaking, these guys, the redox elements, vanadium, chromium, nickel, molybdenum, and uranium, they tell you about dead stuff. Bromine tells you about living stuff. If you see bromine, everything was living there. If you see chromium, nickel, molybdenum, they died there, and the body stayed. That's basically the difference. Um, and then, of course, that can be useful to tell where the clay comes from in a more localized sense. <coughs> and then finally, nutrients, which is, this is stuff you probably want to avoid in ceramics, um, since it can be uh, a use. Pr uh, phosphorus, sulfur, and potassium. Those typically can be uh, different. But that said, there's one big exception I need to add here. When I was doing ceramics, working with someone to do ceramic sourcing in Okinawa in Japan, there were two islands. They were trying to figure out which ceramic came from which. We found that sulfur was half a weight percent of one island's sediment and non existent in the other. So in this case, sulfur was the sourcer for that. So I, I wouldn't rule out sulfur entirely, but just be cautious if you see it. All right, and that's the extent of my geochemistry <laughs> on all that. I hope it's helpful, but, uh, but that gives you a rough idea of the elements you can use. In general, I would put create three bins. The clay bin, and that's aluminum, potassium, titanium, iron, and silicon. I would put the redox bin, and that's molybdenum, vanadium, chromium, uranium, and nickel. And then I would have the biotic bin, and that's phosphorus, sulfur, Bromine. And those three give you clusters of elements to infer from. So, <coughs> any questions about all of that environmental reconstruction stuff? Well, could you, can you go back to your slide that had calcium? Yeah. Okay. This one? Yes. Very well, okay. Yeah. Yeah, basically, calcium does a lot of stuff. Um, there's a lot of different contexts, but its use relative is great. Its use in absolute terms, in terms of weight percent, actually doesn't tell you much at all. It's almost always a reference point for something else. By the way, out of curiosity, have you guys seen those red beds? Like if you drive into the west and you see these stark red soils, you know what I'm talking about? Like cliff sides that are bright red? Mm -hmm. Do you know what those are from? They're related to calcium. So I had, let me show you an example of a ceramic. 
Um, by the way, this will teach you about uh, what's in ceramics too in a useful way. Uh, workshop six reports tomboy ceramics. <coughs> so this is a set of ceramics. They're blue clays and there are red clays. Ooh, that is ugly on the screen. <laughs> so they're blue clays and red clays. What would you guess makes a red clay? What what element oxidizes red? Iron. So most people say red clay has iron. Just like those red beds have iron. If you've been to chocolate candy, that orange soil has iron. But here's the catch. The Catawba with ceramics actually don't have any changes in iron. It's calcium. More calcium means less red. Less calcium means more red. I can have iron 4% in two ceramics. If iron has, if there's Four, uh, if there's four percent calcium, four percent iron, it's gonna look like a brown. If there's twelve percent calcium, four percent iron, it's gonna look blue. If I have zero calcium and four percent iron, it's gonna be bright red. Calcium is white; it dilutes and scatters the light. Less calcium actually. So when you see something and you see it looks more red, that doesn't tell you about its iron content. It only tells you about the lack of calcium. Important point, um, and that's a relative, right? It's the calcium relative to the iron. That actually predicts the color and the properties. So this table of ceramic, they were asking what clay sources were they using? The answer was the same one. The iron, everything was the same. It was only calcium that was changing. And I can see that here. The blue clays have lots of calcium, red clays have less. Elements like potassium didn't change at all. Were they adding the calcium as a temper, or? Could be. Could be. We, could be. we couldn't see the molecular structure. We didn't know if the calcium was geologic or if they were crushing up seashell and mixing it in. We don't know. What was it different across the, like the types of pots? No, it was just the, the, the color of the pot, the color of the clay corresponded to the calcium, to the cognitive of the calcium. That's basically... So like it wasn't something like, oh, all of the blue ones are used for cooking. Yeah. Makes sense with the calcium template. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, nothing like that. It was, it was stylistic as far as we can tell. It was purely stylus, nothing functional. Anyway, the reason I bring this up is those bright red beds that you see, those red cliffs that you sometimes see in the West, those come from the Permian-Triassic extinction. That's the one where 96% of life died. What we know happened then is that the ocean temperatures reached a boiling point. Um, the hurricane, by the way, so it was super hot. Um, hurricanes benefit from warm water, right? Like the warmer the water, the bigger the hurricane. How big do the hurricanes get, do you think, when you've got a... Uh, Boiling oceans. Boiling water. <laughs> the answer is it's called a hypercane, yeah. and it's about the size of a continent. So, and their maximum wind speed on the interior of the cone is about 600 miles per hour. And those hurricanes were wiping over North America regularly. And we know that because we can find the ocean salt as far inland as Wyoming. So it was a crazy time. Crazy, crazy, crazy time. Those red beds are that way because that high acidity extreme environment meant calcium dissolved almost immediately. So calcium didn't get deposited, which left that stark red. Interestingly enough, those red bed formations tend to follow mass extinctions. There's a red bed layer that follows the KT extinction of the dinosaurs too, in some, in some areas. So no one knows fully what the connection is, but whenever you see a red cliffside, that tells you there's a mass extinction happening, either just before or during. And we don't quite know exactly the relationship, but it means no calcium thing to So, yeah, anyway, fun times, fun. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but that's one thing we noticed as well. Um, anyway, so I've gone through, hopefully that all helps the clay. Um, we've got about half an hour before we've got a close-up shot. Um, what questions do you have that you'd like us to cover as a group that would be helpful for your x-ray work? Can be anything, not necessarily ceramics, obsidian, chemistratigraphy, yeah, yeah. calibrations. I'm, what's the latest on on magnetite and color of obsidian? I was I remember oh. learning that you couldn't really differentiate just because it's red and it looks kind of the same, but it seems like there should be something measurable. Well, it's it's the oxygen, isn't it? If it's red, it means it's oxidized iron, not reduced, right? And that's why you can't measure a place for that. Yeah, because it's still iron. Mm -hmm. So if you look at here, by the way, look close. I don't know, can you see the black banding. line on that guy? Yeah. That banding, my understanding is that those are local lights deposits of reduced iron on the sky. Mm. But let's test it, right? Okay. Uh, is there something that is magnetite? So, and magnetite refers to the specific oxidization or lack of oxygen, right? 
right? Uh, Is my understanding correct? <laughs> That's how I always interpret it anyway. Right. So some other method might determine that. Well, let's see. I would recommend for your transform in for, well, no, I wouldn't. So, funny story, I tried to use lids on Obsidian, because I thought, well, let's do it, it'll be fun. I couldn't get a spectrum on Obsidian. Do you know why? Glass is transparent, it, the light just goes through. You don't, you don't create a plasma ball. You only create a cla plasma ball where there's reflectance. By the way, that's another problem with IC. Have you ever heard of laser induced uh, ICP? Uh, 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 the reason it's got a problem, they use a laser. The color of the sample changes what dissolves in the laser. So you get color changes, which is a huge problem in that field. Um, that's one of the reasons why they call it some quantitative. Destructive. Or yeah. Color it also changes. No, the color of the sample, the color of the sample changes what elements fluoresce. Black absorbs more of the laser, so uh, things don't fluoresce as well. White mm -hmm. overheats it, and you get a ton of feedback. So you get different results with the lasers, the laser approaches. Yeah, it's been a huge problem. Um, I got to meet a guy. Um, uh, he worked with uh, on the he worked with someone who's on the Manhattan Project, mm -hmm. and he's like this famous laser scientist. And he described to me he had this fun project. Um, this is kind of an aside, where uh, the Russian government asked him, "Could we make laser cutting icebreakers?" The idea is I make a ship that shoots a laser from the bow, and then it just tunnels through the ice, and then the stern can just crunch through and separate the icebergs. Because mm -hmm. Russia's got tons of ice water, right? <coughs> and he, this is important for them. So he created a laser, and he fired it into a block of ice. And anyway, so he's firing into this ice, and nothing happens. No laser comes out. And so he opens it up, and he's looking, and you can just see this high-powered laser, enough to kill to hurt someone, shooting through this ice, and then the ice is just absorbing it all, and it's not melting. And so he's like, what's going on? So he bends down to look closer, and then the laser breaks up the side of the ice. The crystalline structure had caused it to arc and turn, oh, yeah. and his hand was there. And so he it was the first person to actually do a Star Wars laser blast to himself. <laughs> do you know what happens when a laser hits you? So if you see a Star Wars, the laser blaster hits him, physically, what happens when a laser hits you? Well, it only does one thing, it evaporates water. So where the laser hit, his skin, all the water, immediately evaporated from his thumb, and the skin bound to the bone like a monkey. Just right, but it's in a circle. Oh just boom. God. And so it left a permanent scar, hurt like like the Jesus for a month. Jesus. <laughs> That's what a laser does to you. Uh, as it goes, uh, the Russian government decided not to pursue the idea further. <laughs> <laughs> well, climate change is opening up this. Yeah, right. Now. Yeah, they, they'll, they'll, they'll have uh, plenty of time now, right? Right. Let's see if I can connect. Nope. Oh, maybe. Yeah, all right, awesome. We're on. So, I'm going to do a measurement method. We're going to do this with the yellow filter because we're interested in seeing the higher. Well, yeah, what are the settings that you're doing there? Oh, well, I'll pull you through all these. Let's use the obsidian as an example. Is there a new version? Or? There is. That connects to the Tracer 5 I, I can send you a Dropbox link. Or give USB, I can throw it on. Okay. Um, it's, um, uh, uh, it, and it installs a lot easier. So I recommend yeah. using it. And, it. and it's perfectly compatible with old data. So you can use it now if you want to. You don't need a new Tracer to enjoy the benefits. All right, so measurement method. We're doing 40 keV, 10 microamps, no filter. And let's turn it away from me. EasyCal doesn't quite work. You, you, you don't want to use it. That's when Cal process is better. I think anyway. It's not, is it, they're still working on it or? No, it's, um, uh. Is that's, one, that's the one that's in Excel 2010? Yeah, exactly. I, I can send you a copy of Excel 2010 if you need it, but I recommend using, because it's Cloud Cal. I recommend Cloud Cal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, what, what are we even talking about? Yeah. That's, use that for your old traces. It can read it in PDZs now anyway, so you're good to go. Um, yeah. Anyway, so here is 
no filter data. What do you notice about this? There's a lot of backscatter here, right? Remember the iceberg analogy from yesterday? Most of these peaks are under here. So we're gonna come over here. Oh, I see what you mean, I missed that. Okay, the, the backscatter is obscuring. Yeah, exactly. Like this yeah. so here. The filter just takes the backscatter down. It doesn't do anything, else, anything with the other peaks. Exactly right. So we're going to use 25 microns titanium here. That's the yellow filter. Okay. That's the yellow filter. The filters are the same, but you know what? The names, the color names, don't work as well when it's inside the instrument. <laughs> <laughs> they help me. They help me, but uh, yeah, they're, no. they're not really helpful for, for the newer user. No, they aren't. I will never not think of it as the yellow or green filter, <laughs> but yeah. So, here in red is no filter, and green is with the yellow filter. What happened? You're getting rid of a lot of that noise. What happened to my light elements? Oh, they, they came down. They were bad. They're gone. Yeah. I destroyed them. So, the benefits, but over here, like here, I don't know if this is noise or not. Here, I can see that right there. Well, that's zinc. That right there, that's gallium. I can see them clearly here, whereas here, there's too much going on. So this is why I uh, uh, this is why I use a filter. I get benefits here, but I lose my elements over here because I'm not sending in anything to excite them. Now, so, sorry, this is the green filter. This is the yellow filter. The 25, yellow? Uh, 25 microns titanium, 300 microns aluminum. So what does that mean? It's the metal. It's the thickness. Okay. It's, yeah, it's metals. So it's aluminum metal and titanium metal. For an analysis of bronzes. And yeah, right. exactly. This is what we typically use for metals, by the way. So if you're analyzing bronzes, this is the filter you'd want to use. Okay. So yeah. So this along here, and what, what's happening here, an element like here, I see so clearly because this excites it, right? But if I'm studying these elements over here, I'm losing a lot of signature, right? So anyway, um, so we can't. So that's the problem there. Okay. If I come over here to measurement method, we're going to up this to forty, and we're going to use the hundred micron copper. And we'll do this for thirty is, seconds. Is this the red one? This is the green. The green. Okay. AKA the obsidian filter. The obsidian filter. It was <laughs> developed by Robert Speakman in, in the Smithsonian when he was at the Smithsonian. Bruce flew out to him. Uh, this is before Bruce knew what obsidian what, what, what why obsidian was important. And Speakman sat down with him and showed him how to do it. So yeah, that's uh, this was developed for obsidian. It's been used for a lot of other things, um, but that's main use is obsidian. All right, so this is with the, uh, the obsidian filter. So you didn't produce those at Murrah, or was it was at Smithsonian? I think so, yeah. Jeff, yeah. Mm -hmm. When was Jeff at Murrah? Mid two thousands. Yeah. And then the Smithsonian, my recollection is their budgets were slashed. Like he lost his travel budget and everything. Oh, like yeah. Georgia. Gotcha. That would be things like nothing short and finished his doctorate. I see. Maybe while he was at Smithsonian. So what's different about the pink? It's nice and flat. Right here. Mm -hmm. That's why you use that for your obsidian, right? Mm -hmm. That's why it's better than the yellow. By the way, you remember how yesterday you were telling me the manganese and iron is better? What do you think? It's an identical match. Unless you're sampling small source samples. Yeah. So what I, what I was telling you yesterday is normalized there, right next to it, and then I think you'll get a better ratio. But you have to ex you have to be able to export the counts after normalizing. Yeah. You would be able, and you need to use something other than Brooker software to do that, right? That spreadsheet's not going to cut it, right? So I recommend Cloud Gal personally, but you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm biased. Um, but anyway, that's the deal. And you can see here, the peaks are of a similar size. Like, look right there. All we've done is we've changed that background scatter. How, how do you, what's your strategy with the normal? <coughs> I usually aim for rhodium. Okay. But it changes the results, right? Mm -hmm. So you notice how the green filter looks really fat back here compared to these guys? That's actually an illusion. If I come over here and normalize back here, you can see what's going on. This is unaffected by the filter, and then you can see the filter, that's the slope, right there. That's the slope, right there, and the mist doesn't have a slope without the filter. So each filter creates a <coughs> ski slope, and what you're aiming for is you're aiming for the elements at the bottom of the ski slope. So here the ski slope leads to these guys. So the way that, can you unnormalize for a minute, Lee? Yeah, we're gonna do options counts per second. 
So this is unnormalized. So what Bruce was explaining to me was you basically have three different areas. You've got mm -hmm. this area, this area, and then this area. Yeah. I would, I would agree with that. I would qualify it a little more. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So for the green filter, they, they, all, they stop and start at particular elements where it's yeah. overlap. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the green filter optimizes between about 13 and 16 keV. Yeah. And that's where rubidium, strontium, uranium, all those guys, fullerets that are great for obsidian. The yellow filter, or the 25 micron titanium filter, yttrium. Uranium, well, both. Uranium fluoresce is next to between the video and strontium. So, yeah, it's, it's a both. Uh, the, the traditional yellow filter, now 25 micron titanium, uh, 200 micron aluminum, that is for between 10 and 6 keV. That's its window. The red filter, or the 75 micron copper, fills the gap between the two. It does 10 to 13. So it depends on what element you're looking at mm -hmm. as to which one you want to use. And what do you usually use red for? Uh, usually it's used for toxic things like lead, arsenic. It's usually used in safety contexts. So if someone is trying to see if lead is in the drinking water, okay. they'll use the red filter. That's why it's called red. Yeah, <laughs> has it, right? I, the, joke I, the joke I used to make is gold also shows up really good with the red filter. So my go-to is you're either dead or you're rich. <laughs> <laughs> that's, your, that's, your, that's your goal. Um, and then for pottery? So for pottery, I mean, here's the problem, right? What is what do you use to source pottery? You use a whole bunch of different well, everything. Yeah. That's why you calibrate it for all of it. Right. So that way he doesn't have to choose. He can choose on the spot what's the element for this project, and it's already optimized. It's already calibrated. Mm -hmm. The problem you have is that Brooker charges two thousand dollars for calibration, mm -hmm. and each of those phases is a calibration. So if I made, I would have four different calibrations, which would be eight thousand dollars. For sure. Um, so that's why it's better to do it yourself. Right? Or you put mud, mud so, rock. Mud rock. Mud rock is still only, you still have to choose which, how you take the data from mud rock though, right? Do I do mud rock with this filter or this filter? Same object, but I get different results. Oh, wow. Well, so, so now you're looking at you know, $4,000. Well, it's two calibrations. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. Like from and, and so, and, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, right. And, and then you have to scan, you have to use four different calibrations, mm -hmm. scanning them six or eight times on each object. Yep. So yeah, so, sir, so how does that work if you're if, if you if you're flying to, to have you know to do the, the mud stone or whatever, but okay. mud rock. Mud rock. <laughs> if you're flying like how do you actually do that with this device? Like what what does that mean that you're doing the calibration? Like you've got so a, I've got my standards, I measure my standard with the same parameters, I measure all those standards, I build a calibration from those spectrum. And then I apply it to this to my new samples. Okay. But you have to think about it. Time is your enemy. If you only, how much time do you have in the field when you go up there? I mean, we're in the we're usually there for like three months. So, okay, so you've got so you can you've got the time to sit in the lab and crank through hundreds of ceramics that you're in a season, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's time is going to be your enemy with this guy. So for something like that, if you wanted to build your own calibration, say based on my and ceramics, it's just you you go through a crap ton of pottery, so you have a huge data set. And then you use that to calibrate. Do you have or? ceramics that have known concentrations? What do you mean by known concentrations? In other words, you know how much calcium iron. Oh, that's what I know. Of, at least then no. you can't use those. Okay. Um, Ted Pena has been working with aluminum pottery with with myrrh. Oh yeah. So those are presumably known concentrations. Yeah. You can is, is he here in the department? Yeah, he's in. I would ask him. Do you have those ceramic shards that have known values? And then you can calibrate those to this. And you can build a, a Roman calibration. It might be covered, cover what you need to do. Mm -hmm. The thing to remember, by the way, with calibrations, let me hop over to CloudCal for this bit. So I need CloudCal. So if I come over here to Spectrum, uh, I so this is the, the uh, this is the Obsidian calibration. This is a, is all the Spectrum together. The red represents the minimum and the maximum, and the dotted line represents the mean. Uh, if you want to see all the Spectrum together, I just take out variance. So this is all the spectrum. My goal with the calibration is to get from the minimum and the maximum for every element. That's the only objective for a calibration. Do I have the minimum and the maximum and I'm in the same material type? That's it. So if those ceramics cover the minimum and maximum that you're going to see, they're great. If they don't, it's not worth your time. Then mud rock is bad. The reason mud rock is good is because we got every single geologic formation, we've got 
about the biggest range you would expect to ever see in ceramics. Almost every archaeological ceramic should fit within the minimum and maximum of this. That's the idea. How many um, samples are part of the Mudrock Mudrock uh, Mud Rock 1 was 26, Mudrock 2 is 42. I want to add the two together, because then you've got what I said. They're not overlapping, they're not overlapping, they're totally separate, yeah. The reason, they, so the reason they had to do it is they ran out of Mudrock 1. A lot of the geologic formations went extinct, they couldn't drill again. So whatever exists is all that exists, that's it, end of story. That's why they didn't use the Mudrock 2. Brooker still has Mudrock 1, so Brooker could add them together and make a complete sweep. But it'd be hyper unique. I think they'd be great to do, but they don't, they're not as interested in the science of it. They're much more interested in me making money part of it. So yeah, so then if I have my calibration, I choose the elements that I want to calibrate for, and then I add my concentration, so my weight percents here. So that's what I mean. If you know what's in the samples, then you can build a calibration. If you don't, you can't. And then the goal is, is to make the calibration curves. Now, this is my calibration curve for sodium. And it's not bad, right? By the way, uh, one thing you'll notice with machine learning cows, do you see how the regression line falls off? Are these dotted points closer to the regression or closer to the true value? The dotted line the is the regression slope. Yeah, so this calibration is actually great. Even though the, regre the regression slope is driven by this guy, these guys are still doing great. So um, that's the trick with the machine learning stuff, is you want to look at where it falls relative to the dotted line. Because the, me the me mechanics get a lot more different than Lucas 2. But anyway, the point here is, if I have a value between 5.5 and 2.5, can I can we use this calibration to quantify it? Yes. If it's less than 2.5 or more than 5.5, can I use it? can, but it's, 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 not it's increasing. The error, the error is increasing. And you see that here. The error on this extreme end is getting really high. Yeah, it so looks like it pulled your line out. Quite it, it did. It did. If I take this guy out, that should shrink out. That's exactly right. So would, wouldn't you take that out? Well, in a Lucas tooth, I would. Watch what happens in the machine learning cap. I take it out. How did you take it out? Right to that I just clicked it. Yeah, Cloud Cal, you can just click on the graph to take out points. That's all. Guess what happened? These guys split out. So taking that out actually <coughs> hurt the calibration. It didn't help them. <laughs> Having the outlayer in made it better. What do you mean it's split out? It's less, it's the, are these the guys farther or far away from the dotted line now? Uh, yeah, so if I click this. So, so what's happening is, is outliers are not as bad in machine learning. I still have a problem with that point, but it helps me understand these guys better, right? It's sort of like knowing David Bowie exists. He's an outlier, but I learned something about humanity from him. <laughs> so that's the way to think of it. The machine learning, the rules are a lot different. Um, what you want is actually to have points here to fill it out and constrain it. That's the answer, is add more samples. So, yeah. So actually the best thing you could do is you've got these Roman ceramics, measure the mud rock, and then measure the Roman ceramics the same way, that would combine. Right? There's nothing, the more, the better. That's why it's uh, taken off with big data. <laughs> the more data we have, the better we get. That's exactly right. Um, and I think the same is true for XRF. The re do you know why we limited to the sample sizes? Because Excel started to work get funny if we had to sit more than 60. Uh, that's it. That's it. It was Excel. It, was, it wasn't the math. Yeah. It wasn't the math. The math, the more samples is still better. It was the limitations of Excel that constrained those calibrations. We don't operate under those, those constraints anymore. So yeah, the more the merrier. And you're welcome to use my CloudCal software. You're welcome to use the S1 Cal process spreadsheet. You can try with EasyCal, but EasyCal you'll find. If you have a Tracer 5i, it's worth it, because then I'm going to put it on here, and then I'm cool. But if I can't put it on here, then you have to go on a computer anyway. CloudCal is actually easier to use than uh, that So EasyCal runs on, on Windows CE? No, it, the, the files produced from EasyCal operate on Windows CE, mm -hmm. yes. So when I make a calibration, with this guy right here, if I look at that unit, and I, let's bring up Windows. Whereas CloudCal doesn't produce those files. No, it does not. So let's go file, disconnect. Yeah, I cannot put CloudCal files on the tracer. Is it a proprietary format? 
Uh, not really. Um, it's just the models, the line definitions, everything are too different. I, I could maybe if I spent six months and mimicked it, I could force it to happen. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Oh, that's right, that's right. All right, go ahead and go ahead and run. Um, are you going to be back, Nico?